I was born 87 years ago. For 65 years, I've ruled as Tamriel's emperor. But for all these years, I've never been the ruler of my own dreams. I have spent an unhealthy amount of time with the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. My relationship with it can best be summarized as such. Flying, flying in the sky. Cliff racer flies so high. Flying. It's a messy mix of nostalgia-induced fervor, unbreakable habits, and genuine appreciation for an incredibly unique game. To say Oblivion is flawed is to say I'm autistic for making a multi-part video series on a game from 2006. That is, you're pointing out the painfully obvious. From weird design choices, to cookie-cutter dungeons, and plenty of bugs and flat quests in between, the faults of Oblivion are numerous, and I'll get to covering as many as I can. But make no mistake, I think this game is fantastic, possibly a masterpiece even, because it's what it gets right that gave me an itch that no game has since come close to scratching. Beneath the flaws, some of which I just find endearing at this point, is an incredible sandbox exploration game that, when everything is going right, or at least not horribly wrong, can be quite immersive and engaging. It's the go-anywhere-and-do-anything approach Bethesda took with every aspect of the game's design that it's both its greatest strength and its greatest weakness. In some regards, this was a liberating approach that opened up so many ways of playing Oblivion. And in other ways, it utterly ensures certain parts of the game cannot be enjoyable. Fortunately, the former often outweighs the latter, and with the passage of time, I can forgive certain flaws and give credit as in certain respects, even Bethesda has yet to match its high points. You got red juice, blue juice, and green juice, which correlate to health, magicka, and fatigue respectively. Combat is intended to be a balance between these resources. There are a multitude of ways to manage your juice levels while depleting it in your enemies. You got a bunch of different weapons, spells, and whatnot to hurt your enemies, and you got access to different spells and potions to keep yourself topped off on your preferred juices. In theory, these juices are supposed to be treated with close to equal regard, but in reality, they are anything but. Health is your most important resource to be kept as high as possible, unless you like to live dangerously. And with the amount of potions you'll be given, there's really no excuse not to be at your max at all times, because you never know when an ogre might come and take you for half your health in one smack. Magicka, if you're a mage, and in all honesty even if you aren't, is your second most important resource, and any spell cast comes at the cost of it. Like health, there's plenty of potions to keep it full, but unlike it, you regenerate it over time. But his regen speed is dictated by many factors, mostly a willpower attribute, so chugging potions is your best bet. Fortunately, since you'll be depleting magic all the time, get used to having none and waiting for it to regen a lot. Finally, we have fatigue, and it's completely useless. You can just ignore it. Okay, maybe that isn't 100% accurate, but it's close enough to the truth to be the truth. The fact is, your base recharge rate is 10 points a second, which is usually more than enough to keep you from ever having to resort to chugging potions or using spells to refill it. The damage penalties from ignoring it just aren't enough to justify worrying about it, and the most noticeable effect of having low fatigue is not being able to perform power attacks, which just means you have to back off of swinging for a few seconds as you recover. Take it from me, don't worry about the green juice levels. To the end of making things dead, you have a wide range of options to choose from. You have melee, which lets you smack things, bows that lets you shoot things, and magic, which lets you shoot things with colorful balls of light. And all three can be augmented by stealth for an added bonus, though stealth synergizes particularly well with bows. Melee characters are given a slew of swinging options to choose from that fall into two camps, blade and blunt. Blade slashes, blunt crushes. There's also using your fists, which has its own skill but this is just not advised for any but the most devout masochists. Blade lets you use daggers, short swords, long swords, and two-handed claymore-type weapons. Blunt lets you use small axes, maces, two-handed war axes, and two-handed war hammers. The difference between these is attack speed and the ability to use a shield. Because you can cast spells at any time regardless of what's in your hands, magic as a secondary form of damage is always an option too. 
But despite all this, the option only boils down to what model you wish to see occupying the screen space as you smash the attack buttons. Because the difference in playstyles is little to none thanks to the lack of depth in your repertoire of moves and way more A than I in the NPC's AI. They'll tear What's right that? through your armor too. Oh. He was here a second ago. You're pathetic. Bows and arrows suffer even less depth, sad to say, because there's only one type of bow, which is the longbow. You don't get access to any other ranged weapons, and aside from the occasional enchanted arrow that only spawn later in the game and aren't available to be made or purchased, you don't really have much of a choice between the arrows that don't boil down to picking the stack of arrows that do the most damage. Stealth plays to your advantage here because when sneaking you get a 3 times damage multiplier from your sneak attacks. But the only variation in combat from this is just positioning yourself more carefully and moving through dungeons even slower as you stare into the murky ambient light looking for shapes of enemies ahead. It really doesn't add much to the experience, I have to admit. It's more engaging than melee for sure, and when your enemies spot you it will require some finesse to maintain your positional advantage, but with the limitations of the movement system, what you end up doing to keep that advantage often feels like a cheesing tactic more than anything else and the AI rarely knows how to compensate, and will start to just bug out as a result, adding to this cheese factor. Then we come to magic, which is by far my favorite of the three. Like I said earlier, you can cast spells regardless of what's in your hands, it's just a simple button tap to fire off a spell. So you can keep an axe or a sword or a bow in your hand, a shield in the other, and still pop off spells, making it so that you really don't have to choose between magic and other damage types. What does limit you is your magicka pool and your magicka recharge rate, and when your higher damage spells start to burn a ton of magicka, it will slowly relegate your spells to little more than a cheap form of spitball damage or a quick heal in time for you to reposition and recover. Unless, that is, if you go all in for magic and try to specialize and build for it. Oblivion has a surprisingly unique and varied magic system, considering the other two systems are dull and even duller. Your main modes of damage are fire, frost, and electric elements. And aside from some characters that have very high resistances to certain forms of damage, there's no need to overthink this. Damage types do not synergize. You can't stack two effects to make them more potent or anything. It just boils down to, does the game tell you this enemy is immune to this damage type? No? Okay, fire it will. You're also given two types of attack mode, target and touch. Target lets you fire off from a distance, at the expense of more expensive to cast spells. Touch requires you to get up close and personal, but the spells cost less, so you could afford more damaging spells. This compromise is great for melee characters who will be in their enemy's face anyway, making the sting of not being able to specialize in magic hurt less by letting them make better use of their limited magic pool. Neat. You're also given a third fact to consider, and that's range. No, not that range. This range. You can get spells, or make them yourself, that does damage over a large distance, allowing you to fire off a spell that will hit multiple targets or a whole room. Very nice, very effective, and very fucking expensive. Usually not advised, but it's great to have options. And finally you have Duration, which as the name might suggest allows you to make damage over time spells. Duration plays more of a prominent role with utility spells, but it works with damage spells too. And that leads into the different types of magical effects, because magic has so much more going for it than the other two. We aren't even scratching the surface yet. Effect types fall into three categories, Drain, Damage, and Absorb. Drain will only temporarily lower the affected juice attribute or skill. So a damage intelligence spell will lower the target's intelligence attribute down, say, 10 points, making it 40 instead of 50. Once the duration of the spell, say 20 seconds, elapses, the target's intelligence goes back to 50. If it's health, then it drops to 40, and once the spell is done, the health will go back up 10 points. So if you did 10 points of damage during the duration of the spell, the target's health goes back up to 40, not 50. Damage health is fine if you can kill the target in the time window, otherwise it's sort of a waste. But it's also the cheapest of the three types of spells to cast, so it has its benefits. The second effect type, damage, is what we know a lot more intrinsically. You hit the enemy with the effect, and the only way to undo the effect is with a restorative effect of equal magnitude. You hit an enemy with damage health 10 points, they gotta chug a potion to heal those 10 points back. If that effect has a duration, it will do that damage multiplied by the duration. So 10 damage over 5 seconds comes out to 50 points of damage. Very nice. This is more expensive than Drain, but it's a one and done deal, no worrying about it being reversed at the end of the spell. Third is Absorb, which is like damage, but transfers those points to you instead. 
Absorb health 10 points takes 10 health from your target and heals you 10 points. Simple but costly and falls under the school of restoration rather than the other two damage types which are destruction. So you need to pay more in magic and specialize in another school of magic too. Then we get into elements, weaknesses, and resistances, and all this other shit that doesn't really end up mattering a whole lot. Like I said earlier, as long as your enemy isn't totally immune to the damage type you're dealing, you're probably okay. Unless you're playing on a very high difficulty or doing a very autistic challenge run, in which case a lot of what I'm saying is obvious or inapplicable. You can also damage enemy attributes and skills, which I don't know if it even really has an effect. I've never even seen enemies run out of magicka. I mean, they probably do, but the problem is, is that the AI doesn't account for any of this, and their behavior thus doesn't change as a result. If you deplete a mage's magicka, they just whip out a dagger and charge at you like a total psychopath, and your response is the same as before, splash him with more spells until dead. Unless you're doing a special sort of run where you limit your offensive measures, the most effective move 99.9% .9 of the time is just hit him until he's dead. It's a shame this is the case, because Bethesda built a very interesting system of skills and attributes, and it would be awesome to exploit that system and really tear apart your enemies, but the dummy AI just makes that more trouble than it's worth. This leads into utility spells that can manipulate enemy behavior like Turn Undead, Frenzy, Calm, and Fear spells, but their utility is limited and only prolongs the inevitable of having to whack, burn, or shoot them to death. Paralyze and Silence are fun and useful blights you can inflict upon your foes, but other than that, trying to make use of any of the other utility spells yields middling results at best, and at worst wastes precious magicka that could be used instead to make your enemies dead. Making enemy dead is most important in a fight. Believe it or not, I've only covered three of the magic skills thus far, Destruction, Restoration, and Illusion. There are six, although mysticism is a little, uh, special. Conjuration can summon enemies to kill your enemies for you and act as aggro magnets while you sit in the corner dealing damage against distracted foes. It also lets you summon weapons and armor which is, uh, okay? It feels like an afterthought, but it's there I guess. Alteration lets you cast spells that protect you from damage and elements, which can be useful against certain enemies. Alteration is fine if you want to sit and prepare and really think about an encounter, but it's sort of pointless when, once again, the best way to approach a fight is stacking as much damage in as possible. Mysticism lets you dispel drain effects, see living creatures in the dark, trap souls for enchanting, and use telekinesis to move certain objects. Dispel can come in handy when you get hit with something like drained strength, which will suddenly make all that sweet loot in your bag too heavy to carry, leaving it glued in place. Detecting life is useful for stealth characters because you can see enemies through walls, but once your sneak level is high enough, the risk of detention are so low that you can literally walk into enemies and be fine. Soul trapping is essential for enchanting, but you can slap that on a weapon via an enchantment. Telekinesis is just utterly useless. Mysticism ends up being a grab bag of spells that ultimately are never essential and winds up leaving the school feeling a little bit pointless. With that, I think it's safe to say we finished discussing magic, which has a ton of things for you to design very unique builds with some insane amounts of variation, and because you can mix and match things to your liking, the options are almost limitless. What ends up playing against you as a magic character is not your options or your imagination, but the AI itself, which just takes a lot of the fun out of all the experimentation. I've always wanted to do some crazy magic builds, but just never did it because the cardboard AI is always quicker to dispatch for some basic fireball spells than anything else. It's like spending your whole life training to be a martial arts master only to get shot in the head by some kid with a gun because bullet beats fist. It's nice though that the game doesn't punish you for mixing magic in with melee and bows because it's such a fun system to tinker with. To further spread the joy, you also have alchemy and enchanting to open up more options. This had better be good. Oh my goodness. Hey, excuse me, are you alright? Ah, run away! What's the matter? Ah, getting tired! Alchemy lets you use a lot of the magic system in bottle form. You can apply poisons to weapons to utilize offensive effects, or you can harness the positive effects in potions. There's a ton of ingredients to collect that can be mixed up to create very unique, sometimes questionable effects. This is a system I always feel guilty not interacting with more, even though I slap it onto just about every character I make. The problem is it's just a cumbersome affair, and carrying a lot of potions is a huge burden and means you don't get to carry nearly as much gear and loot. And once again, like with magic, a lot of the strategy goes out the window and you just can easily carry around a modest stack of health potions and stand there swinging at your enemy as you chug them while waiting for your enemy to fall over first. It removes the need to experiment, because of that I never really do. Enchanting, like alchemy, allows non-magic characters to tinker with magic or to add even more synergy to mages. You can add effects to weapons that will consume charges each time the weapon deals damage, and for a lot of builds, this will be your main way to scale up your damage output as you gain higher levels. You can find enchanted weapons as dungeon loot, so you don't actually have to enchant them yourself. 
or you can get them from quests, or you can make them with sigil stones from oblivion gates, making the harvesting of sigil stones really one of the only reasons to close gates. Some of those stones are no joke and can make more powerful enchantments than the alternative way permits. In order to recharge a weapon, you need to either consume soul gems of Arla Stone or bring it to a vendor who will, for a modest sum of gold, charge it for you. You can also apply enchantments to equipment which will grant buffs or debuffs if that's your thing, and won't need to be recharged either. Very cool. Enchanting costs gold, requires knowledge of the spell, and a certain skill level in the appropriate school of magic in order to apply it to the item. The level of the soul gem dictates the potency of the enchantment, and for weapons it will dictate the number of charges. You can stack the effects on weapons, but this will come at the cost of fewer total charges, while items can only have one effect applied. It's a cool system and I love using and abusing it to its full potential. I do have a personal gripe with the limited number of charges being way too low in the vanilla game, so I do use a mod that boosts it up a little bit, so I'm not recharging it every time I clear a single dungeon. To round things off, there's also enchanted staffs that behave like spells, but use weapon charges instead of magicka. They're a nice backup for mages who aren't using a weapon, but because staves are two-handed and won't allow you to equip anything else with them, their utility is limited for a lot of characters. There's also spell scrolls that allow one-time casting of the respective spell they are tied to. The problem with both staves and scrolls is that they aren't craftable or customizable, you just find them as loot, and as such, they always feel like a secondary thing and not something that can be relied upon as a primary means of dealing damage. But now I think we can leave magic totally behind, and offensive combat mechanics entirely and go into defenses. Because while your main goal is to make things dead, your second goal in combat is to keep yourself from being made dead. To that end, you got a bunch of armors to choose from, classified as either heavy or light. Heavy armor protects more, but weighs more and slows you down more. While light offers less protection, but weighs less and slows you down less. But don't worry, you will eventually unlock perks that let you negate the downsides of each armor class. Heavy armor becomes weightless, and light armor becomes 50% more effective, making it so that you're really only picking the armor based on aesthetics at this point. If you're a mage, you can wear armor too, but be warned, your spells will be less effective. This can be mitigated by leveling up your skill in the respective armor class, but it will always be there. If you want the most bang for your magic of buck, then you have to go with wearing all cloth, which has no spell penalty. The loss of armor can be made up by wearing something with a shield enchantment on it, and it won't impact your spell effectiveness. I really like how this encourages glass cannon builds that can be a lot of fun to play. In order to augment your defense, you can also equip a shield, which is also classified under the respective armor classes. This allows you to block more effectively, increase your armor rating, and have another piece of equipment to enchant. And that more or less covers defensive options, aside from my favorite, which is running and jumping around like a total spaz so enemies can't hit you. But now it's time to criticize. Despite all the options and variety to choose from, it all ends up feeling the same. The bulk of your time in Oblivion's combat will be spent wagging a sword and smacking a straw dummy, or slinging a bolt of elemental damage at a dummy, or shooting an arrow at a dummy. Regardless of your preferences for a particular mode of damage, it all ends up feeling the same because combat lacks any sort of weight or feedback. This is probably being a little more harsh than Bolivian deserves, especially considering how much of the combat changed from Arwen, which relied upon dice rolls in a real-time combat system that only resulted in combat feeling extremely awkward, bordering on broken. In Oblivion, Bethesda managed to push it to just feeling awkward, which is an accomplishment I have to give them credit for. A real limiting factor in this regard is that you can take a hammer and smash a goblin in the face and it will react exactly the same as if you slashed it with a dagger. Which is to say, he won't react at all. He won't flinch, he won't dodge, and unless you're using a power attack, he won't stagger. His options are either run at you swinging wildly, run at you blocking, or some compromise between those two states. And aside from having the option to strafe yourself or block to force him to recoil, your own combat options aren't very broad and result in you just standing there whacking at your enemy until its HP hits zero and it crumbles to the floor suddenly dead. There's no weakened or unconscious states, very rarely do enemies attempt to flee or act with any sort of regard for their own life, it's just fight and dead. In the beginning stages of the game, combat is a drag because your options are so limited. As you gain levels, you unlock more of your build's potential and things start to get fun. But that almost always tapers off as the world continues to level up and you crest the curve of your combat effectiveness. You don't face smarter enemies, you just start fighting enemies whose health and damage output values are a few points higher, meanwhile your own damage output gains are stagnant. But this is all starting to lead into a different discussion, so it's probably about time we switch gears to discuss leveling. I was coming from the background of RuneScape Attic when I got this game in 2006. This is important because RuneScape is all about the dopamine drip feed from constant progression, and Oblivion has, well, an interesting take on progression. Not so much a drip feed, and more like starvation for a few hours, and then a diesel spiked injection of progression crack that has you going from wearing chainmail to glass in one game session. I don't know how I didn't ruin the game for myself back then, because I was still at the stage where I thought doing shit like this was the best way to level up.
Let's just say my problem solving skills were still in development. I was used to job simulators that had more grinding than gameplay, and bringing that into oblivion isn't advised. Fortunately, I spent most of my time running around the world and crawling through dungeons, so I managed to accidentally save the experience before I overleveled my character and destroyed the game. Before I explain how you can manage to overlevel in a game where leveling and character progression are one of the pillars of its design, I need to introduce character creation and leveling mechanics. The beginning of Oblivion has you learning the mechanics of the game in a surprisingly engaging sequence of sewer crawling. During this sequence, you build up your familiarity with a lot of what the game has to offer before finally settling on what your character will be. Or you just make a save a few steps from the sewer exit so you can skip the whole thing when you inevitably make 30 more characters after. Everything is up to you to choose. The game will make a suggestion based off your style of play during the tutorial, but you can tell Boris he doesn't know shit and make your own class, or choose from one of the other pre-made ones. Now, a character build works like this. You got three specializations, Comet, Magic, and Stealth. These influence starting skills, skill leveling speed, and starting attributes. Then you select two of the seven major attributes, ideally ones that synergize with your main skills because you want to focus on leveling the main skills you'll be using the most. Then you pick your seven major skills, once again you'll want to pick what will synergize with your attributes, because when you level up those seven major skills you get points to your actual character level up. The minor skills will not contribute to your character skill progression, but they can still be leveled up, albeit more slowly. But that doesn't make leveling them useless, and here's why. Minor skills still contribute to your attribute leveling progress. Okay, I'm sure more than a few of you watching this have played the game, because who else cares about it at this point? But I'm going to pretend you didn't, or more likely, didn't know this because it's never actually explained and isn't obvious in the slightest. When you level up and sleep in a bed, you get to pick three attributes to level up. Ideally, you pick three that will complement your build the most and contribute to its combat effectiveness. Each attribute does something different. Strength increases melee damage and carry weight. Intelligence increases your mana pool, and so on and so forth. The only one I level on every character is speed, because doing so enables you to achieve land speed record-breaking sprints, and even more game-breaking jump distances. But you see those little numbers next to each attribute? That's how much it will increase by when you select it, so you want to prioritize the higher numbers if you can help it. How do you get more pluses? Level up skills in those attributes, even if they are minor skills. So really if you want to be the most optimized, you'll level up a ton of minor skills governed by your preferred attributes to get maximum plus 5 every level up. But if you're min-maxing this hard in Oblivion Sun, you got problems and 3 plus 5s ain't gonna fix them. To recap, we picked our specialization, our attributes, and our major skills. Oh, did I mention your race and gender also impact your stats? Because they do, which is why I almost always go with the Swiss Army Knife Dark Elves. They kinda can do anything and their bonuses are all in useful skills, so there's no wasted potential here. But don't despair, those stats are washed out rather quickly once you've leveled up some, so don't feel bad about making an Orc Mage. Oh, and don't forget to pick your birth sign. There's very little reason to go for something that isn't the Thief, Mage, or Warrior since all three just apply useful skill bonuses. But there's a couple in there that are useful, I suppose, and the chat astronaut can be very, very special to play. But wait, I hear you asking. You still haven't explained how leveling can be a bad thing in Oblivion. And to answer that, I gotta introduce what quite a few people, or at least a very vocal group, consider to be the main antagonist of Oblivion. Global level scaling. So when you level up, not only do you get incrementally more powerful, so do your enemies. Enemies get just a little more powerful, gain a bit more health, and you'll face scarier variants after certain thresholds are crossed. Trolls are replaced by ogres, minotaurs are replaced by minotaur lords, scamps are replaced by the masters of stunlock and clan fears, along with many other cast changes. Also, bandits will begin equipping higher level gear, and you'll find better gear in higher level potions, scrolls, soul gems, and ingredients in dungeon chests. The theory for this design choice was that it removed limitations on players, because that is, in my humble opinion, the truly defining feature of Oblivion. Bethesda didn't want to tell the players no. Want to walk all the way to Anvil on the other side of the map once you leave the tutorial sewers? Enjoy the walk. Want to go and join one of the guilds? Sure. Want to do what I usually do and go straight to the arena to level up a few times to make the beginning hours of the game less of a drag and get enough money to buy the starter shack on the waterfront? Go right ahead. Things like level scaling were only the symptoms of the actual problem hurting this game. Player freedom is, in fact, the cause. The symptoms were the price we paid for all this freedom, all this glorious power, and I intend on covering all those symptoms. Just remember, they aren't the real problem. But let's start investigating level scaling. See, in a lot of other RPGs, the world is not level scaled. Certain regions are harder than others, while other places become so easy there's no reason to revisit them. It's a different approach, but Bethesda didn't want to say no. They want to maximize player freedom, and that freedom, first and foremost, begins with freedom of navigation. And I'm personally glad they went this route, I would have not sucked nearly as many hours into this game otherwise. 
I guess this makes me one of those filthy casuals that a lot of people blame for ruining the franchise. Look, I get bored easily because I got a scattered form of attention and that makes me very intolerant to having to do the exact same thing over and over. When I start up a game like Mass Effect or Dragon Age, the opening few hours are almost identical each time. Eventually the game opens up, but it takes a few hours, and sometimes those few hours are enough to turn me away and towards a game like Oblivion where I'll be up and running in a few minutes if I have that handy save just before the sewer exit. What ends up happening is we pay that back over the long run. Because if everything's scaling, then challenge remains constant, well, in theory. In practice, the difficulty curve can either slope down or slope up, depending on the build you make, and that's not an obvious thing unless you've sunk the ungodly amount of time that I have into this game. I know stealth characters get progressively easier to play until they literally break the game because they can completely ignore combat. How close can I actually get by? Oh, okay. And I know melee characters are pretty much doomed because melee damage is capped by things like skills, attributes, gear, and enchantments, which are all finite thanks to caps. Magic characters land somewhere in the middle, but a pure mage will generally find the game gets a little easier, especially when they start stacking spell absorption and willpower buffing gear that will make mana regen a non-issue. But you can pretty much expect the difficulty to remain relatively static unless you start fucking with the difficulty slider, which there's no shame in doing if it gives you a few more hours of enjoyment. This means that in terms of gameplay, a lot of it starts to feel the same, especially when your builds start doing what you were designing them to do. In essence, Oblivion begins to break itself if you play it intelligently. Unless we do something that would violate every sensibility a seasoned and novice RPG player alike would possess. Ignore leveling up. This is the thing I realized in recording this video when I was doing the main quest and had to run through a dozen Oblivion gates. If you don't want more challenging danger to spawn, just don't level up. You can keep collecting gear and leveling up skills still provide some bonuses, but if you're not leveling up, then the world isn't leveling up. We could take this a step further, which is what big brain problem solver me back in 2007 accidentally did. If you don't make your combat skills your major skills, then you will never level up from combat. This will let you control your leveling to such a degree that you can maximize those attribute points too. Rather than doing a smart build like I did for this character, go with things you'll never actually use, like speechcraft, mysticism, and armor. The problem with this approach is twofold. First off, the skills you really need and want will be leveling up slower. Especially painful for your slower leveling combat skills like Blade, Destruction, and Marksman. That's going to hurt you in the early game, but hey, if the enemies aren't leveling up and you're still managing to get by with better gear and superior tactics, then you're probably okay. The second problem is, this is fucking boring. I don't want to make a build that is a literal inverse of my playstyle. Fortunately, you don't actually have to do this because we have a difficulty slider. The difficulty slider, which can be changed at any time, can be used to tweak down or crank up the difficulty. That's probably the best way to handle the level scaling in Oblivion. It really is a mess, and I didn't realize just how bad it was until I played this character, which is all stealth. I almost always play mages, which, like I said earlier, can have a very easy time or a not so easy time depending on the circumstances, so I never quite noticed all the issues Oblivion has played with thanks to his level scaling. What the difficulty slider doesn't compensate for is loot spawning. And that I think is the worst aspect of Oblivion's level scaling. The difficulty can be tweaked to your liking, but the fact that the game goes from starving you of gear, gold, and potions to drowning you in all of it once you hit level 15 is something that nothing except the most exceptional metagaming and mods can fix. And this ruined the experience for me pretty quickly this time around. This was also one of the strangest obsessions of mine when I first got the game. Coming off of RuneScape, which is all about inflating your bank account to then sink millions of GP into bling and houses, I guess it makes sense why I came into Oblivion thinking making gold was the most important thing for me to spend my time doing after getting bored grinding levels for no reason. So I'd clear out loot heavy dungeons and then make a dozen fast travel trips to strip all the gear out and sell it at the market district. I did this for every dungeon I hit and considering I spent most of my time clearing dungeons, it starts to paint a sad and troubling picture. But I did get the bling in the houses. Of course, making money, especially at higher levels, is laughably trivial because lowly bandits at remote camps would be geared with enough high leveled armor to buy half the player owned houses in the game. And aside for buying houses, which is pretty much useless because the waterfront shack gives you all the perks any of the base game houses will give you, which is a bed to sleep in and a chest to store your shit, there aren't any money sinks in the game. Maybe repairing armor and recharging magic weapons are two other sinks, but they barely count. Barring the Blade of Woe, which was a woe on my coin purse thanks to a mod that boosts enchanted weapons as number of charges, 
Recharging that gold thirsty dagger cost more than the skin grad house, and I didn't realize until I was flat broke. So I ditched the gold sucker for something else and started stripping dungeons for an hour until I was the richest man in Breville. The easy loot never bothered me when I was younger, but this recent playthrough I found it almost killed my interest entirely. I don't really know why. Maybe I used to really enjoy the progression of this game and I just happened to make a character that really cheats the hell out of the game too much. Maybe because I just finally noticed how absurd it is. Maybe because the older I get the more I appreciate scarcity of experiences as opposed to constant indulgence. And I mean, that philosophy can be applied to just about anything, not just games. We value things that are scarce, whether it be loot and oblivion, money in our bank accounts, sex or drugs. We need to understand the plight of being without in order to appreciate having those things. And we need constant reminders of how great having those things are, otherwise we lose that appreciation over time. With all that said, do I hate level scaling and wish it gone? No, not really. I wish it was toned down some, but I still appreciate the freedom it enables me to have in this game even if it creates some ugly and weird contrivances as a result. Really what I think would make this game better was if the level scaling was more subtle. There's a soft level cap around level 50, but the best gear starts spawning in the world by level 20, with everything being out there by 25. And it doesn't take long to reach 25. You can easily hit 60 hours in the base game if you're blasting through all of its content and doing some exploration on the side. By 60 hours you'll be near level 40, 45 just by organically leveling, which is why level grinding is just so stupid. That means you haven't seen any new gear or enemies in 20 to 30 levels, or 20 to 30 hours because each level is about an hour by that point. But I think that's enough harping on level scaling. The fact is, Bethesda has made three more games since Oblivion, and all of them have had level scaling playing a central role of their design. And I think, especially in Fallout 4, Bethesda managed to strike a balance where it seems are not so apparent. It's here to stay, and I'm fine with that if it lets me continue to play these games with as much freedom as the design can permit. I'd like to take a moment to look over all 21 skills in Oblivion, as there are some notes for certain skills I'd like to make. Honestly, I could make a 40 minute long video on just the skills in this game, because it's a very broad subject and there's such a gradient of quality in these skills that makes some of them almost universally essential, and others universally useless. But let's just compress that down to a few minutes and call it a day. In total there are 21 skills in Oblivion, 7 for each of the major 3 specializations. For combat skills we have Blade, Blunt, Hand-to-Hand, -hand, Armor, Block, Heavy Armor, and Athletics. For Stealth we have Acrobatics, Light Armor, Security, Sneak, Marksman, Mercantile, and Speechcraft. And then for Magic there are the 6 schools of Magic, Illusion, Conjuration, Mysticism, Alteration, and Destruction, and then we have Alchemy to make the 7. Because I think I've covered enough Magic for one video, I'm going to omit those entirely. So that leaves Combat, which is a misleading name since all 3 are combat related, and Stealth, which is more aptly named but still doesn't quite match up. Blade and Blunt, like I said earlier, are on the surface quite distinct, but when you get down to it, they end up playing almost the same as there's little to differentiate them later in the game. It boils down to choice aesthetics and little else. Hand to hand is nothing but the butt end of every Oblivion joke. You can never really hope to make up the damage output surrendered for not taking a weapon, and even though you unlock some knockback and paralyzing attacks, so too does your weapon wielding counterparts. Armor is something strange for me. I get what Bethesda was aiming for by making your armor and weapons degrade with use, requiring you to get them fixed from time to time, but their decay rates are pretty absurd, and I'd argue the system only detracts from the game. Armor allows you to use repair hammers to maintain your equipment, which is a tremendous pain in the ass when you have a lower level in the skill, as you'll be constantly breaking hammers. This means you need to devote 20% of your carry weight to just carrying hammers in the early game, when your carry weight is already low and your armor is weighing you down even more. Armor offers little reward aside from giving you some cheap points for your endurance attribute because leveling armor is very easy and very fast. Other than fixing your gear in the field and those endurance points, it's a worthless skill to have, because you could just as easily get your stuff repaired when you go to town to sell your loot, and the money you make off your sales will almost always be more than your repair bills. So why bother? The same can be said for recharging enchantments on weapons, which ordinarily calls for you to micromanage filling soul gems, when you could just spend a few coins and get it recharged by a vendor. Bethesda swept out the likes beneath these two mechanics by having vendors do it more easily and for a bargain price. Because honestly, what are you using that gold for anyway? Well, let's assume vendors couldn't repair items, or they could but their prices were much less reasonable. What fun is there in such a system? It adds to the immersion, I suppose. But considering the game has a million beds and even more food items but never makes you eat or sleep is more jarring. Or the fact that it can stand in one spot and wait for several days with zero consequences. They chose not to implement that though because it would inhibit player freedom. 
There are plenty of players who want those features, but from what we've already discussed so far, it looks like Bethesda wasn't trying to appeal to those players, so why did Armorer make the cut? My guess is they needed something to round out the skills of combat to act as a 7, so they made equipment durability management a skill. What this would have ended up doing is forcing almost every player who wants to use weapons or armor to have armor as a skill. And having a skill that every player really must pick in order to have an ideal experience is a contradiction of the design philosophy of Oblivion. So they let vendors do it for you, nullifying the skill in the process. Armorer really underlines the slippery slope Bethesda stumbled down when it came to making Oblivion more accessible. Once they set down that path, there were other concessions that had to be met in order to make an experience true to that paradigm. And before we know it, we have a skill that was rendered inert before we even hit the end of the sewers. It's no wonder they dropped it for blacksmithing in Skyrim, which, well, that's a whole different story for a whole different video, I suppose. Athletics is another skill that I suspect exists just because they needed something to round out the 7 skill requirements they set for themselves. The only thing that more levels in athletics lets you do is recover more points of fatigue as you're running, which as I said earlier about green juice isn't really a factor at all and can be safely ignored. So having a skill whose sole purpose is to help with that makes the skill completely useless. Acrobatics on the other hand has more to offer in that you'll be able to jump higher and eventually unlock abilities like dodge roll and defy Newtonian physics by being able to jump off of the surface of water. Still not a skill even worth considering specializing in, but if you bunny hop all the time while playing, you don't need to select it anyway. Doing so with any character will let you level up your speed attribute, which makes you run faster. Make no mistake, that is indispensable for any character you play. Light armor I already went into, and as I've already said, your choice between light and heavy armor really comes down to preference, and aligning your build to as few attributes as possible so you can focus on maxing them out more. Security is another skill I've always had major gripes with. At the risk of getting into a much bigger argument about the unnecessarily rigid structure a lot of RPG leveling mechanics are, I want to say I don't like skills whose sole focus is to unlock optional things. Be it lockpicking, hacking, or speech skills, I hate them because when I see them I'm led to think either the game is going to have an abundance of content I won't get access to unless I pick these skills, or that content will have other ways to access it because the developers realize that punishing players who don't want to sacrifice combat effectiveness for exploration isn't a fair thing to do. Like I said, this is an argument well beyond the scope of this video, so I'm forced to oversimplify it a lot. But I feel the security skill adds nothing to the game. And what's worse is that the mini game that's attached to it is so obtuse and tedious that I just get as many lockpicks as I can, sometimes resorting to cheating to get them, just so I can smash the auto attempt button until I'm through. The fact that they added the skeleton key, which is an unbreakable lockpick you get from a very easy quest at level 10, leads me to believe that Bethesda was aware of this issue too, or at least were willing to compromise. If security tied into other gameplay elements, I'd be more willing to cut it some slack. But it doesn't, so I don't. Ban it, get it out of here, give me my skeleton key. I love this sound, don't you? Next is Sneak. Sneak is a great concept held back by 2006 Bethesda AI and a healthy heap of dumbing down to boot. Once again, this is a subject that can easily be stretched into a video, but to make a long point short, the stealth mechanics of Oblivion leave a lot to be desired. NPCs are either telepathic in how they can sense the disturbances you cause in the psychosphere when you enter a room, Where are you? Huh? Ah, well, whatever it was, it's gone now. Huh? Hello, who's there? Or are legally blind, all depending on your skill and sneak. There was never really a middle ground in my playthrough as a sneak character where it felt fair and challenging, but how absurdly game-breaking it gets at the high end of the level spectrum leads me to prefer the lower level sneak experience. There's also the problem with guards who can detect a bad deed being done from across town, which is a shockingly harsh response in a game that is in every other aspect trying to be super forgiving. Oblivion is just riddled with poor design choices, bad balancing, and even worse AI that makes Sneak a difficult gameplay path to recommend. Though sneaking through boring quest dungeons was a godsend for making this video, so maybe it's not all bad. Marksman I already discussed, there's not much left to say. It needs more weapons to flesh it out, and while sniping enemies is insanely gratifying, micromanaging tiny stacks of a billion arrows is not. Leveling your skill lets you do more damage with them and unlocks some nifty skills like being able to inexplicably zoom with some magical ADS wizardry. It's fun, I highly recommend it. This just leaves Mercantile and Speechcraft, saving the worst for last, I suppose. Mercantile is intended to get you better deals from vendors, while Speechcraft is intended to be used to persuade NPCs to do things for you. 
The underlying problem with mercantile is there's hardly any use for gold in the game aside from buying houses, repairing or recharging equipment, making custom spells and enchantments, and the occasional bribe for NPCs. It's just what I wanted. See, was that hard? The economy of the game is just entirely unbalanced, mostly due to the fact that doing dungeon crawls, particularly dungeons filled with human enemies, is just absurdly lucrative. Who cares about getting a couple hundred extra gold on the enchanted dagger when you manage to get three off of the vampires in a single dungeon? You'll almost never be wanting for cash after the first few hours of the game. And mercantile isn't going to be what pulls you out of poverty. It's a shame because it's not a half bad skill otherwise. As it comes with some nice perks like being able to invest in a shop so that they have more cash to buy your loot, and being able to sell any item to any shop. Speechcraft on the other hand is a terrible skill with terrible perks attached to the worst minigame in any game I've ever played. The whole skill is built around a minigame that has you picking one of four options with varying degrees of effectiveness based on the NPC. You get an idea how they will react based on their awkward facial expressions when hovering over the option. What makes this absurd minigame even more fallacious is the fact that you must exhaust all four options every time. Every time an option is selected, the effectiveness meter rotates clockwise, so you want the meter to land on the thing they like the most to maximize the points earned. So you stand there cycling between joking, boasting, flattering, and threatening your target until you get what you want. And again, judging by some of the NPC conversations in this game, this really might be how they approach discourse in Cyrodiil. Last night, I heard someone scream from inside. Bell and Benarus will never solve that death trap. Take care. Bye. Hail. What is it now? Heard any news from the other provinces? Nothing I'd like to talk about. Bye. There's more plaguing the speech system in this game than just a laughably uncanny minigame though. The main problem is that character's disposition towards the player is rarely an obstacle, unless you need a certain threshold to progress in a quest. It's just so arbitrary that it will pop up like a drunk driving checkpoint on the 4th of July weekend just to remind you it exists. That's when you ignore the minigame entirely and just like in real life, bribe the shit out of the person until they give you what you want. I don't know if Bethesda intended on making some sort of social commentary with this shortcut, but I like to pretend so. And bribing is only a last resort, because the better alternative is to use charm spells that can boost an NPC's disposition temporarily. You can make a custom charm spell that will boost their disposition by a staggering amount, and make it last one second because conversations freeze time. And then just never worry about speechcraft again. And don't worry, you won't be missing anything. We understand each other perfectly. Oh, well, that's just the thing. I appreciate the gesture. Every little bit helps. And that's all I have to say about leveling in skills that can fit comfortably in a coherent video. The systems running under the hood of Oblivion are a lot deeper than I think a number of its fans and critics actually give Bethesda credit for. The problem is not the depth, but the effectiveness and meaning of these systems. The game wants to encourage you to make playstyle choices, but it never actually forces you to commit, and offers a ton of ways to get just about anything done, running a lot of your choices sort of meaningless. And even when you do make choices and do commit, the game fails to give satisfying feedback a lot of the time. And PCAI doesn't necessitate or even encourage experimenting with these systems to make dynamic builds, and as such your best course of action in combat is laying on maximum damage, as opposed to coming up with tactics to outsmart and exploit your opponents. Many skills fall prey to the game rendering them redundant, either through making easier alternatives to investing in the skills, or letting you throw money around like a Gilded Age political boss. And failing all of that, Eventually you just get too good with certain skills, or the reverse happens, and you are eventually overtaken by the constantly leveling world that renders your power advantages less and less relevant. This video is so much longer than I originally had planned. I wanted to insert exploration into this, but then I realized I never discussed the skills and I had to go back and edit it in and well, now it looks like I'll just have to add another video into the queue. This is a series though, and I plan on covering every aspect of the game. Exploration, presentation, world building, all the guilds, shrines, main story, the DLC, and maybe a few other topics shoehorned in where I can fit them. It's going to be a wild ride, and if you're interested in watching this madness ensue, consider subscribing. I've been working on this project for almost two months as of writing this script. This is the fifth script I've written, hitting a total of 40,000 words across all the versions, every script written from scratch. It's been an exhausting gauntlet as I searched for the right balance of tone and content. I hope I finally found something that actually works. If you like this, please consider dropping a comment or a like or sharing it with people or making a sacrifice to Sithis. The support would go a long way to helping me come to terms with what my life has been these past two months. 
and give me steam to press on to finish this thing. I expect by the end of this I will write close to another 40,000 words, which would actually mean I would have written enough words to encompass a whole adult fiction novel across all my scripts. Anyway, have a good one, and I'll see you in the next. The world of Oblivion is its greatest asset, its greatest strength. When Bethesda is able to leverage the world they had created to drive the gameplay experience, the game hits its true stride. When they sacrifice the world or sideline it for something else, relying on the gameplay mechanics to pick up the slack, the player experience ends up suffering. If you think I was too harsh and nitpicky with my previous video, then you'll find this time around I'm more forgiving, because we're going to be looking at what I think Oblivion does quite well for the most part. Like anything else when discussing Oblivion, there's examples of brilliance and examples of sheer boneheaded design, sloppy compromise, or things that just didn't mesh with the final product very well. Fortunately, a lot of Oblivion's game world falls into the positive column, though. The world did a lot to captivate me as a young lad, and I will admit it was more effective because I didn't really know any better and hadn't quite experienced anything like it before. But to give credit where credit is due, it's an immense world handcrafted by a team of about 30 people, and the fact that what they created still holds up pretty well by 2020 standards is a testament to the skill Bethesda possesses when it comes to creating worlds. But enough stalling, let's get into this thing. When Oblivion first launched, it was technically considered a launch title for the Xbox 360, and when compared to other games at that time, Oblivion actually looked really good. When compared to games from the previous generation, it was a radical leap forward. When compared to today's standards, eh, in certain regards it has aged gracefully, but in others, oh, oh no. Playing on the PC, we have the benefit of a much higher resolution, which helps the game to some extent, but textures are very muddy by modern standards. Some of the interior texture sets, especially the dungeons, hold up pretty well, though they are being helped out by being shrouded in darkness. Parallax mapping lends them some extra fidelity, but certain stone textures take it way too far, shattering the illusion. Environmental textures in the cities and the overworld can look good from a distance, but up close they start to show their age. Weapons, armors, and items all range from okay to not good, depending on the items in question, and if you're using a third or first person perspective. A lot of the items lack luster and make the items seem to be made of plastic, and some of the details on the textures are just way too much for the low resolution and look like a noisy mess as a result. And distant landscapes look like oil paintings rather than real terrain, which in a way actually helps the game look more stylized, but we'll get back to that in a moment. Lighting, like textures, ranges in quality, but the limited number of shadows, particularly shadows cast by characters and items, really hampers the illusion of realism. In general, interiors have better lighting because you won't run into the limited number of dynamic sources and shadows as often, but it's still not great, and the omnipresent ambient lighting and fog really ruins the dungeon experience. You'll frequently find inexplicable pools of light from non-existent sources that are just there to keep the place looking bright. And I don't know why this is such a problem for the developers when we have so many ways of seeing in the dark. Oblivion has a dynamic weather system that helps add some liveliness to exterior locations. The rain and snow effects feel dated as the storms feel like monsoons the characters don't react to, and the snow? Well, just, just look at it. It looks like a Snapchat photo filter. The flat fog effects are no bargain either. On occasion though, with the right stuff in the foreground at the right times of the day, inclement weather can do the trick. But it's the sunny weather, especially at sunrise and sunset, where the game really sparkles. This has to do with the saturated, more fantasy-like color palette they used, and this is on display when the sun is at more extreme angles in the sky. This is when the game feels picturesque, almost like you're living in a painting. This is where the things like muddy distant landscapes can almost feel like it adds to that impression. Fortunately, the disappearance of distant trees and rocks and, well, everything else not part of the landscape geometry disrupts that impression to some extent. But the powerful colors and the heavy use of bloom does make this game look more stylized than I actually remembered it being. I'd be remiss though if I didn't mention the absolute worst part of Oblivion's graphics. NPCs. 
Monsters and creatures still look good, aside from maybe ghosts because they look like Scooby-Doo characters as opposed to something more grounded and freaky. But the wraiths make up for that missing horror element, and seeing as they replace ghosts after a certain level, it's almost a non-issue. NPCs that you interact with, though, they all look like they share genetic material with garden variety vegetables. They all look lumpy and disfigured, like their skin is actually a hard plastic shell pressed over another person, but the shell's not the right size. It looks like these people had terrible skin conditions that someone tried airbrushing away. Their facial animations just convey no genuine human emotion despite being so emotive. It's uncanny and more often than not, hilarious and unsettling. The problem can't be ignored either because the camera makes a really uncomfortable locked in zoom on their face that freezes time, making it seem like they're some alien creature that has you ensnared in some evil spell and isn't aware that the illusion of normalcy is failing to convince you. I'm probably making a bigger deal about this than I should be, but when a lot of your time is spent staring at these abused canvases of human flesh, it just, it just can't be ignored. I think a lot of the blame lands with the character creator. The parameter of the sliders can be put to way too extreme of variables that no human could possibly exhibit under normal circumstances. I imagine this is the same tool the developers use to make NPCs, so when the tools make it easier to produce unnatural looking faces as opposed to natural ones, it explains why so many NPCs look like they just shouldn't exist. It's funny and amusing at times, but completely immersion breaking otherwise. All in all, as long as you aren't talking to an NPC, I say the game looks pretty good still. Looking deep reveals the flaws, but at face value when you're just wandering the land wagging your sword at some baddies, it holds up pretty well. The audio department of Oblivion is, like the graphics department, a mix of quality. Sound leaves a lot to be desired, while the soundtrack is nothing short of magnificent. But let's cover sounds first before I devolve into a drooling fanboy geeking out over the music. Sounds are... meh. Most of them are fine. Swords hitting things are clangy enough. Armor affects the sound of footsteps. Weather effects are pretty decent, but not too overwhelming to the point of drowning out all other sounds. And you'll sometimes hear birds chirping in the forest when you're wandering around. Some sounds, though, aren't the best. Magic effects seem to have more than a few that either don't match up with what I would expect a spell to sound like, or it's obnoxious, or it's both. Like NPC faces, it wouldn't even be worth mentioning if I didn't hear these sound effects constantly as a spellcaster. But moving on from perhaps my worst nitpick thus far, let's get into something less nitty. Voice acting. Oblivion has got a very bad rap for its voice acting, and some of it's deserved and some of it isn't. I really can't sit here and say there's a bad voice actor in the cast, especially considering the sheer number of characters and lines these people had to voice. I think their work goes largely unappreciated. No, the problem isn't the actors or their performances, it's just the fact that there's only like a couple dozen of them. A couple dozen people voice acting a cast that borders close to a thousand individual NPCs that all have something to say. I'll get to the content of these conversations later in the video, but for now, I just want to discuss the quality of the acting and recording. It's good. We got a few A-list actors who fill in some of the key characters, including Patrick Stewart, whose voice is like Velvet, Sean Bean, who is Sean fucking Bean, and Terrence Stamp, whose performance of Mankar Cameron is the only saving quality of the main baddie of the main story. So, the cat's paw of the Septims arrives at last. You didn't think you could take me unawares, here of all places, in the paradise that I created, Look now upon my paradise. Gaia Alata in the old tongue, a vision of the past and the future. One thing to complain about when it comes to the voice acting is the battle banter. When NPCs are engaged in combat, they will begin screaming random lines, and for some of the races, these lines are just maybe a tiny bit over the top. Oh, what's the matter? Is the baby gonna cry? <sighs> Now, you will know pain! The Imperial Guards in particular have some pent-up bloodlust they unleash when they are let off their leashes. Then pay with your blood! Fear pay the fine! I've fought mud traps more fearsome than you! I'm just warning the you! Pathetic That's the best worm. you can do! Die! <laughs> For the Empire! Ha! 
but all the races are played by a few takes that developers probably should have left out of the game files. But then we wouldn't have some of the best Oblivion memes, so who's to say? Yes, we must kill that foul Nord before he slits our throats. Aye! So many people... Oblivion's original soundtrack is an hour-long composition by Jeremy Soule, encompassing 25 tracks. These songs are played in three distinct sections of gameplay, exploration, dungeon crawling, and combat with the game's theme only being played at the main menu. By far, my favorite tracks are all the exploration ones. They are a perfect mix of woodwinds, brass strings, and light harmonic hymns that are all carefully balanced to prevent any set becoming too overpowering, fatigue, or boring. It's your usual fanfare when it comes to instruments, but it's how Soul uses these components to create tracks that are at both times emotionally evocative but emotionally neutral that is a really impressive feat. These songs all carry emotional elements that generally make the listener feel something, but it never tries telling the listener what to be feeling. Many of the songs can elicit from me feelings of peace, joy, and happiness, or they can make me feel wistful, forlorn, lonely, and sometimes just downright depressed. It's very difficult to make music that does that consistently, and the fact that every single one of the exploration tracks does this is a credit to Soul's skills as a composer. Of course, the soundtrack now strikes with me a lot of nostalgia, but that does wear off after a few hours in game, leaving me with nothing but a great appreciation for what the music was intended to do. The dungeon tracks are more ambient in nature and less neutral in tone, provoking feelings of general unease. While combat music is meant to signal you're in danger and provide a break from the peaceful exploration tracks to avoid dissonance from what you're hearing and what you're seeing. There's less to say about them, but they aren't bad, and they don't detract from the real GOAT tracks. The only problem I can say the soundtrack has, has nothing to do with Soul's work, and rather how the game engine handles playing the tracks. You'll be wandering the lands listening to some peaceful song when all of a sudden the horns of war start blaring, signaling you're under attack. So you'll stop in your tracks, spinning in circles, looking for a troll to come barreling through the trees only to see it's a mud crab inching its way towards you in the least menacing way imaginable. So you just pop it with a fireball and the peaceful music comes back. It's really silly and it makes it so that you end up gaming the music as a signal for anything that might be keeping you from fast traveling. Another problem will arise in the dungeon tracks, where brief stints of combat will cause the background ambient music to reset rapidly enough to show the seams of the tracks. It would have been better if the ambient tracks eased back in after like 30 seconds of silence following combat, just so it wouldn't be so obvious. But these are both only tiny complaints that Bethesda actually addresses in later games. I just needed something to complain about to restore the balance of this video's humors. For a lot of games, controls would fall under gameplay, which was my previous video. But I feel like the controls of Oblivion influenced less of its gameplay and more of its presentation, and that plays an important role in the verisimilitude of Oblivion to increase the immersion and believability of its world and... Okay. I really didn't think to address this until the gameplay video was edited, so I'm just putting it in here. But I'm not totally full of shit, I promise. Just give me a chance to explain. So Oblivion is played in almost exclusively a first-person perspective, and while you can technically play it in third person, doing just about anything in that perspective is very challenging. And the janky character animations that do not match up with the precise player movement responses makes for some really unpleasant immersion-breaking things to start happening on screen. Third person is primarily for appreciating your patchwork of mismatched gear that has been chosen purely for their enchantments and not at all for their aesthetic qualities. The game was originally designed for controller use and it shows with the interface and hotkeys. The buttons are big, everything is sorted in tabs, and you are forced to do a ton of scrolling. There's no hotkeys for navigating the interface, which is nothing short of maddening for someone like me who prefers navigating everything with keyboard shortcuts whenever possible. The interface is an exercise of patience, particularly when you're managing your inventory, moving things in and out of storage containers and selling things to vendors. Navigating the map has me accidentally clicking map markers when I'm trying to pan the map because of course I can't use keys to pan the map. Certain actions, like dropping items or putting custom map markers, aren't even described in the keyboard shortcuts menu and you either have to go looking them up online and hope you didn't rebind a key that makes those shortcuts wrong, or sit there testing key combinations until it works. Fortunately, when playing in the intended first person perspective, wandering the world and engaging in combat with the mouse and keyboard is probably superior to using a controller. It's one of the most responsive ports I've ever played on PC, the movement being incredibly precise. Unless you try jumping, 
in which case you run the risk of either breaking gravity and ending up in orbit, or being locked in place as you pathetically hop up and down. Sometimes you can strafe in midair, and sometimes you can't. I don't really know what determines when you strafe and when you can't. I know it's not random, but after thousands of hours in this game, I've yet to really deduce it. I think it has something to do with your third person animations, but that's just a guess based on other games with this engine. But aside from jumping, snapping your camera with the mouse is very satisfying, especially gratifying for mages using targeted spells and marksmen using bows. It's exactly what I want for my mouse input. And being someone who plays with stupid high DPI settings, the game doesn't break or stutter. Although menus can feel slightly sluggish compared to player camera movement, it's not too bad though. But I want to focus on talking about that first person perspective. There were quite a few subtle design choices Bethesda made with Oblivion, or rather with all their games in general. And the emphasis on first person gameplay is an example of one of those choices. Bethesda has on occasion described the games as fantasy simulators rather than actual role playing games. And while I was completely unaware of it at the time when I first played Oblivion in 2007, I can see where this line of reasoning comes from. Now, this could just be an argument of semantics. Maybe it's just an excuse Bethesda likes to pull to justify their weaker RPG mechanics while they build systems like Radiant AI and applying havoc physics to all the items in their games. But I'd like to investigate this idea anyhow. The first person camera gives you as grounded of a perspective as possible in Oblivion, allowing you to experience the world as just another person in that world. This is where that immersion factor so many players start chasing begins. Everything feels more visceral, from conversations and combat to strolling through town and being caught in a storm. Bethesda's level designers make a dedicated effort to populating the world with tons of clutter items like plates, food, bowls, weights, and scales. Everything is handcrafted to maintain that illusion of you being a part of this world. And aside from furniture and fixtures, these items can all be interacted with using a dedicated grab button, explosive magic, weapons, other objects are running into them. The payoff is worth the effort in my opinion. If I played an Elder Scrolls game where I couldn't grieve shopkeepers, it just wouldn't feel the same. It would feel a lot faker. And that immersion I need in order to buy into the world would take a hit. Now, there are plenty of things in Oblivion that shatter immersion, but I'm going to make an audacious claim here. Bethesda games are some of the most immersive games ever made. There, I said it. It's because they put so much time into these systems, and while some of them don't work right off the bat, and I will definitely be getting into those later in this video, I still appreciate Bethesda tried something that other developers would shy away from or just say isn't necessary. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Maybe there's cheaper and or more effective ways to fudge the realism and immersion, but I like Bethesda's approach. I think it's a lot of these unique, sometimes quirky systems that give Bethesda games such a distinct identity. They feel like a Bethesda game, jank and bugs notwithstanding. It gives these games a very unique form of realism, something analogous to art style. I don't know, stylized immersion perhaps? But I've gone on long enough about something I didn't even intend on including in this series until I realized it was missing in my first video. So let's move on to what discussion of immersion and realism naturally leads into. The World of Oblivion. Before man came to rule Tamriel, and before the chronicles of the historians recorded the affairs of the rulers of Tamriel, the events of our world are known only through myths and legends, and through the divinely inspired teachings of the Nine Divines. For convenience, historians divide the distant ages of prehistory into two broad periods of time, the Dawn Era and the Merthic Era. The Dawn Era is that period before the beginning of mortal time, when the feats of the gods take place. The Dawn Era ends with the exodus of the gods and magic from the world. The cosmos formed from the Orbis, chaos or totality, by Anu and Patami. Akatosh formed and time began. The gods. At Ada formed, Lokren convinced or tricked the gods into creating the mortal plane, Nern, an excerpt from before the ages of men. The world Oblivion takes place in is a fascinating place, filled with a vast and rich background of history told through in-game books such as the one I just read an excerpt from. It's through a mix of these books, in-game dialogue, and story events that we are given access to it. While I feel the game could do a better job utilizing this lore more, it's not completely lost either. And I'd like to touch on some of it just to give some context for the actual game world we find ourselves lost in. Oblivion, as with all Elder Scrolls games, takes place on the planet Nern, sometimes referred to as Mundus, 
which is a physical dimension in the planes of oblivion, sort of primordial nothingness that all things are constituted in. Nur Normundus was created by the gods for mortals to live within, and now act as some sort of arena where the gods and the Daedra compete. Nern is a magically charged realm, though a lot more tame than it had been during the time of the gods where time itself was unstable. Tamriel is a continent on this planet and is where all the games have taken place. Oblivion specifically takes place in the province of Cyrodiil, the metropolitan heartland of the empire that governs the entire continent. Cyrodiil is a temperate province with miles of coastline, lush forests deeper in its interior, snowy mountains in the north, and marshlands to the south. Not only is the province the governing center of the empire, it's also the physical center of it, and as such, it's a major crossroads for travelers and traders. Once home to the now extinct elven race known as the Aeliads, the province is now the home of a human race known as Imperials. The province is well developed with nine distinct cities dotting its landscape, connected by a series of roads with a smattering of smaller towns, settlements, and farms throughout the countryside. Along with these civilized areas are numerous ruins of alien cities, old imperial forts, caves, and mines that are usually inhabited by dangerous creatures or criminals. There's also many structures and shrines belonging to the gods, daedric princes, alien magical wells, and various nondescript ruins and abandoned structures. The history of the province is rich and varied, marked by a lot of violence and tension. I won't go too deep into it, but the general premise is that the Aeliads once claimed ownership of the province and had a very distinct and advanced society that eclipsed all other cultures on the continent, especially the newly arrived humans in the northern regions. Wars between men and elves, also known as Myrrh, resulted in a lot of hostility and the Aeliads enslaving men in their empire. A slave uprising led to the toppling of the elven empire and the establishment of the human-led empire we see in the game itself. The imperial city is taken as the capital for this new empire with the Aeliad White Gold Tower being converted to the Imperial Palace for the Empress and her descendants. The worship of the Eight Divines is established, and the worship of the Daedra, the dominant religion of the hated Aeliads, is outlawed. Over the centuries, the Aeliads disappear from Tamriel, and the rule of the Emperor is, while turbulent and violent, endures and eventually takes hold of the entire continent. The chronicling of history itself is dated in regards to the different dynasties that have ruled the Empire since its founding. This ends up creating three distinct eras, dubbed the First, Second, and Third Era, with which the events of the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion mark the end of. The Emperors are partially divine, and exclusively wield certain powers that protect the realms of men and myrrh from subversive elements such as the Daedra. Basically, the Emperors are a really big deal, and the deaths of them can provoke serious crises if successors are not named. Which is exactly what happens 40 minutes into the opening of Oblivion, and kicks off the Oblivion invasion of Tamriel, which we'll get into later. Cyrodiil is only one of nine provinces of the Empire. Each province is home to physiologically and culturally distinct races that are classified as either men, elves, or beast folk. These provinces range from the swamps of Black Marsh in the southeast, to the forests of Valen Wood in the west, to the snowy mountains of Skyrim in the north, and the rugged, temperate region of High Rock to the northwest. All of these provinces, their denizens, and their unique cultures all have an influence in Cyrodiil and is reflected in its architecture, culture, laws, customs, religion, and social norms. With that winded detour, I think it's safe to say I've given enough background to take a deeper dive into the components that Bethesda used to create the game world of Oblivion. I didn't pay much attention to any of this when I first started playing Oblivion, and the game plays well enough without any of that context. But it's there to be exploited, and I think it breathes some more life into this world if the player understands the foundations it's built upon. Like I said earlier, Cyrodiil is populated by many different races, all of whom you can play as when you're creating your character. They influence some starting stats and favorite skills. Elves are more of magic, beast folk tend to be stealthy, humans are typically fighters, but it's not the end of the world making a high elf barbarian warrior. The Imperials I covered to some extent already. They are the primary inhabitants of Cyrodiil and are considered skilled merchants and diplomats, but also well balanced for combat and magic. They may be considered the uh, dominant race of Tamriel and Oblivion as they sit on the Imperial throne and it's their politics, culture, and military that dominates the continent. Continuing with the human races, we next have the Nords, who primarily live in the snowy region of Skyrim to the north. They typically make excellent warriors, favoring melee weapons and armor, and are very tolerant to cold temperatures. They are known to be proud and independent-minded, and are very loyal to their homeland and their religion. To the west of Skyrim is Hammerfell, the ancestral homeland of the Redguards. Redguards tend to make great warriors favoring swords. 
The Red Guards are considered relative newcomers to Tamriel, having emigrated when their homeland literally sunk into the sea, and they were forced to sail east until they landed in Hammerfell, where they carried out a series of attacks on the coast to establish their own settlements. Northwest of Hammerfell is High Rock, home of the Bretons. Bretons are a human elf mix that leaves them looking like humans, though smaller in build and much more magically tuned. They make great defensive mages thanks to their many resistances to magical effects. Their homeland is diverse and split into many competing factions, but regardless, they're culturally homogenous. The Bossomer, or Wood Elves, are, as the name suggests, an elven race. The quick, nimble, and intelligent elves, while small in stature, make some of the finest archers and sneaks in the Empire. Hailing from their homeland of Valen Wood in the southwest, Wood Elves are known for their love of nature and forests, and in Valen Wood, the forests are sacred and protected, leading to some very strange customs by the standards of other races. Valenwood is technically not even part of the Empire during the events of Oblivion, though they aren't actively fighting against the Empire either. The province is in turmoil, and a stable central political power is non-existent there as many broke off into simple reclusive tribes instead. Off the southern coast of Tamriel is the island of Somerset, where the Ultimer or High Elves live. These elves, like all other elves, can live twice or three times as long as humans, and have a natural affinity for magic. They consider themselves culturally superior to all other races on the continent, and the culture has had a profound impact across Tamriel. Being naturally gifted with magic, they typically make excellent mages, though they also have a natural weakness to magic as well. They are the descendants of the Aldemar, making them the oldest races on Tamriel. The Dark Elves, or Dunmer, are the final elven race inhabiting Tamriel. They are noted for their dark skin and red eyes, and are distrustful of others to a fault, making them very factious and ensuring that they don't gain much clout in the Empire. This has led to several incidents of violence between Dunmer factions, and between their homeland of Morrowind and the surrounding provinces. Dark Elves, like all Elves, are naturally gifted with magic, but they also possess great martial skills, making them very well balanced with magic, sword, and bow. This just leaves the Beast Races, which tend to be the favorites of the Elder Scrolls fans, and for good reason. They're just plain cool. Orcs are the only race not to actually have their own province, though not for lack of trying. Originally from the Rothgarian Mountains in High Rock, they have moved their capital of Orsinia many times as the city has been sacked by other races. Initially feared and hated by the other races, they have grown to become at least somewhat respected and tolerated as they have proven quite loyal to the Empire. Regardless, they are still looked down upon and treated with mistrust. They are known to be excellent warriors gifted with incredible speed, strength, endurance, and stamina, as well as making gifted smiths. The Khajiit, a race of bipedal cat-like people, occupies the province of elsewhere in the south. They are intelligent and quick on their feet, making them great at stealth. They also possess some strength, making them competent with swords too. The Khajiit tend to be split into two distinct groups in their homeland, the nomadic people of the northern deserts and the culturally affluent city dwellers of the jungles in the south. Regardless of their group, Khajiit have a taste for moon sugar, an addictive mind-altering substance that they consume regularly. This has led to the development of a black market and a less than favorable reputation among the other races of Tamriel. And finally, we have the Argonians, a bipedal race of amphibious reptiles. Argonians call the swampy woods of Black Marsh home and are notoriously secretive, with little being known about their homeland. Their extreme defense of their homeland has earned them possibly the worst reputation of the other races in Tamriel, although they possess a very rich culture. Still, their ties with the Empire are tenuous at best. With all attempts to colonize or fully subjugate the province ending in total failure, the Argonians are given a certain degree of autonomy, although slave trade is rife in the province as well. Argonians are known for their ability to breathe underwater and resistances to all poisons and diseases. They are nimble and stealthy, making great thieves and assassins. And that just about covers each of the ten races of Oblivion, at least in a brief and superficial way. Oblivion definitely plays into the more typical fantasy tropes of applying broad characteristics to the different races in its world. And on the surface it does seem pretty generic, but when players start digging into the lore, they can find a wealth of canon that fleshes out these characters more. Just as the continent of Tamriel is divided into provinces, the province of Cyrodiil is also subdivided into distinct and varied regions or climates. The Nibine Basin is a vast, hilly, and forested region in the east part of the province, known for its many rivers and farms. The Heartlands is, as the name might suggest, at the center of the province, dominated by the Imperial City and the Great Bay surrounding it, making it a perfect natural harbor for trading, travel, and fishing. The Great Forest is, like the Nibine Basin, 
a vast forest to the west of the Imperial City. It's flatter, allowing for more farms and settlements as compared to the Nibine Basin. The Colovian Highlands is a wooded mountainous region in the northwest corner of the province. Its sparser trees and wide grasslands make for great hunting grounds. The west weald on the central southern border of Cyrodiil is a wooded countryside with many vineyards and farms. The Gold Coast is the coastal region on the far western shores of the province, dotted with imperial forts and harbors. The Jarrow Mountains in the extreme north of the province is a harsh, rugged, and cold environment that forms a natural border with the province of Skyrim. Like the Jarrow Mountains, the Valis Mountains in the extreme east form another natural border with the province of Marwyn, but unlike the Jarrows, the Valis aren't snow-capped. Finally, there is Blackwood, a swampy region that straddles between the borders of Elsewhere and Black Marsh and creates a narrow waterway between the Nibbin Bay and the Topol Bay. Because Bethesda seems to have a love for the number 9, Nine provinces, nine gods, nine regions of Cyrodiil. There are nine cities in Cyrodiil. Although, one is a smoking ruin when you find it. The cities are spread across the map, occupying unique locations, all of them sporting a distinct style of architecture and general vibe. For the sake of injecting some of my opinion back into this video, I'm going to introduce them in the order of my least favorite to my most favorite. Kavach is first and worst on this list, and there's truly not much to say about it as the city is destroyed the moment you come across it. In all honesty, it earns this spot by default, as it just has absolutely nothing in it aside from a couple of story-related quests and nothing else. When going through the city during the Siege of Kavach quest, you get hints at what the city once was, and it must have been a really big city as it even had its own arena, something only the Imperial City has. It's a shame we never get the city intact during the game because I get the feeling it would have been a lot higher on my list if it hadn't been, but eh, there's no sense in crying over that. Breville is a poor, filthy slum on the banks of the Nibbin Bay. A collection of shanties are placed in a somewhat disorganized manner, encircled by walls familiar to all cities in Cyrodiil. Overlooking it is a castle, separated from the town by a small river. Dominating the northwest corner of the town is the Great Chapel of Mara, and a bit further from that is the only unique characteristic of Breville, the lucky old lady statue. There's not a whole lot to say about the town, but if you want to roleplay a degenerate thief or a skooma addict, it definitely would complement that lifestyle. It's got only one quest that I would say is interesting, leaving very little reason to visit the city that much. Bruma comes in at number 7 on this list. Bruma is a mostly Nord town in the northern regions of the Gerald Mountains. Its buildings are mostly made of thick logs and stone half buried in the ground to retain heat. Having been built on a mountain, the city is structured on tiers of elevations like steps leading up to the castle. It's a cool layout, but there's very little reason to visit Bruma aside from the occasional Guild of Story quests. I've always found Nords obnoxious, and a whole city to them makes it one of the most personally unappealing places in Oblivion. Next up is Coral at number 6. Coral isn't a bad city, but it's definitely bland. The city is ensconced in the Great Forest, west of the Imperial City, laid out on a flat piece of land with many trees surrounding it. The city is split into three avenues from the main gate. The left avenue heading west towards the chapel in the residential district, the north avenue heading towards the roundabout where the guild halls are, and their eastern avenue heading towards the castle. The city holds two notable landmarks, the first being a statue of a woman holding a fallen warrior, and the second being the great oak that is the town sigil. Coral has an interesting architecture with particularly nice interiors. It's also the de facto home of the Fighters Guild, as the main hall is located here. Coral also has some decent side quests, justifying visiting it quite often. Its simple layout, although a little dull, does make it extremely easy to navigate. Shaden Hall lands at number 5, and this is where I think the cities start to get interesting. Shaden Hall is located in the northeast part of Cyrodiil, resting on the foothills of the Valis Mountains close to the Marwyn border. As a result, Shaden Hall has a large population of Dunmer. The city is split in two by the Corbola River, and linked together by three bridges, creating two distinct districts on the east and west banks, with the castle dominating the north side of town. The architecture of Shaden Hall is absolutely its greatest strength, making the city one of the most visually appealing in the game. It's very distinct and suits the environment perfectly, creating this sense of beauty that's meant to hide something more sinister. And this is absolutely the case, as the Dark Brotherhood's main sanctuary is located here, and the Mage Guild is headed by a necromancer. The interiors are equally as wonderful, with their vaulted ceilings and small footprints that lead to intricate layering of floors. I wish there was more content in this city, as its quest content is really sparse, but I love visiting Shaden Hall regardless. At the southernmost tip of Cyrodiil is Leowin, where the Nibbin River exits into the Topol Bay. Unlike its nearby neighbor, Breville, Leowin is a relatively prosperous town, and it's also pretty big. The city hosts a large population of Argonians and Khajiit, automatically making it a pretty cool place to be. 
The city is laid out in a grid pattern that actually makes it more confusing to navigate than any of the other cities, because each corner looks very similar, and it's easy to get turned around if there are no landmarks within sight. The architecture of the city I find to be very pleasing. The large, colorful plaster buildings in the middle of this dense swamp reminds me of New Orleans, and grants the city an incredible character. There's admittedly little to do in the city and not much brings you here, but the charm of its layout and buildings makes wandering it so nice that it earned the number 4 spot largely off that merit alone. Anvil places at number 3. Located on the Gold Coast at the extreme western edge of Cyrodiil, Anvil is a harbor town through and through. It's one of the smallest cities, possibly the smallest, as it only consists of like 8 houses and 2 guild halls. But that said, it's also one of the most distinctive in appearance, and the city is spread between a couple of loaded zones, with the main city behind the walls and the harbor district outside. This makes the town feel much larger and let the designers make each district feel very unique with numerous landmarks. I absolutely love the architecture of the city, which feels very nautical, with the interiors feeling like you're actually inside the hull of a ship as opposed to being on land. It's a great city with a definite theme loaded with fantastic quests. The castle doesn't feel out of place as it does in many other cities. And the city even has a lighthouse. It's surrounded by some of the prettiest landscapes in the game and I absolutely love visiting it. This isn't a Top X video so I'm not going to beat around the bush for number 2. It's Skingrad. Let me tell you about Skingrad. The city falls halfway between the Imperial City and Anvil along the Gold Road in the Colovian region. In terms of geography, it's probably the most boring of all the cities, but it makes up for that with its surrounding vineyards that makes it feel like an actual city. You don't even need to enter the city to tell it's different from the rest. The large gothic spires that are the hallmark of the city's architecture lines the city walls themselves, and inside the city you get the sense this place is absurdly rich and more than a little bit dark, twisted, and dangerous. And let me tell you how dark, twisted, and dangerous. First off, the Count is a fucking vampire. In a gothic-styled city known for its wines and wealth, it's probably a bit cliche that this is going to be a vampire city, but I don't fucking care. Just look at the castle looming over the city like a menacing cloud. And with all sorts of rumors coming out of the place, it definitely looms in the minds of the Skingrad residents too. Like Anvil, the castle isn't actually attached to the city but separate with a large stone bridge lined by torches and built atop these arches that would absolutely intimidate anyone who had to cross it. Skingrad means business, and I love that it's reflected so perfectly in the architecture. But going back down to the city itself, it's a very wealthy commercial town, split in half by the Gold Road itself, which provides a lot of its income as all trade along the road flows right through the city. The northern part of the city is mostly commercial, with the guild halls also being situated there, while the southern half is residential with the Great Chapel of Julianos overlooking a collection of mansions. The city is easy to navigate, but laid out well enough to make it feel quite large, and the massive buildings pressing against the narrow streets instill a sense that this is a very well-developed town and space within the walls is at a premium. There's plenty of landmarks to keep you situated so you're never lost and they help reinforce the character of the city. Then we get into quests, which are mostly related to the guilds or the purchasable manor. But there is one that is standalone, and well, there's a reason a lot of people consider it the best side quest in the entire game. Paranoia fits perfectly with the rest of the city and is a one of a kind quest in Oblivion. I'll pay you gold. You like gold, don't you? Lots of gold. The city also has a resident necrophile who has an intriguing backstory and some great dialogue. Let's assume... no. That's nothing compared to Morrowind, thanks! Rose Thorn Manor is the biggest and most expensive house in the game, and it's probably the only other house I buy in the game after getting the Waterfront Shack because using it as a base of operations isn't a total chore like many of the other houses. It's at the center of town, close to the shops, and only a few feet from the fast travel point. It's nice and big, making you feel like you've actually accomplished something in the game. It's time to leave Skingrad behind and talk the Imperial City, which is obviously number one thanks to the process of elimination. I didn't want to rank the Imperial City as the best in the game, as it feels like the city has an unfair advantage since each district feels like a city itself. But if I'm going off of objective metrics like time spent in a city, then the Imperial City takes it in a landslide. The amount of time I spend here is easily more than every other city combined, and that's because it really just has it all. The Imperial City sits at the center of Cyrodiil, making it pretty much the physical center of the Empire as well. Its Romanesque architecture also bears heavy fantasy elven tones that are meant to highlight the history of the city itself. At its center lies the White Gold Tower which can be seen from miles away in many parts of the province. 
It's an imposing symbol of the Empire's power, although it was in fact built by the aliens. But the Empress Alicia jacked it during her uprising, and it's been the home of the Imperial family ever since. The rest of the city is built around the tower in concentric rings in a manner that is distinctly not human. When viewed from above, the symmetry of the city's design only further alludes to a style that is not in line with the very imperfect empire the city governs. Within the main walls are seven distinct districts, while three other districts jut off of it like spokes of a wheel. Green Ember Away is the district surrounding the Imperial Palace. Aside from the tower itself, a ring of gardens, tombs, and graves runs along the entire perimeter, with gates leading to every other district of the city. It gives a sense of being at the center of the universe while recognizing the cost it took for that to be. The Market District, which is the main commercial hub of the city, is pretty much my home every time I play this game. I'm here all the time, selling things, managing equipment, leveling up, and planning what to do next, and sometimes just jumping around wasting time. The Arena District houses the Colosseum-inspired arena where many of my characters get their start. The Arbitium is a nice garden with statues dedicated to the gods. No reason to visit, but it adds some character to the city for sure. The Temple Plaza District is where the Temple of the One is located where Emperors light the dragon fires as part of their coronation. There's plenty of houses to break into if you're a thief and a few quests to take you to this district, but that's about it. The Talos Plaza District is where the rich people of the Imperial City live. Tons of swanky houses you can rob as a thief, and a rather large and luxurious hotel in the center overlooking the dragon statue. It's a cool location I like visiting on occasion there's almost no reason to come here aside from a couple of quests and sightseeing. This is really where the most expensive house in the game ought to have been. The Elven Garden District is the main residential district of the city. There's really nothing remarkable here as barely any quests ever steer you in its direction. It's just a place a lot of Imperial City residents go to sleep at night. The Arcane University hosts a lot of very useful magical services, and aside from the Market District is my second most visited place in the Imperial City. It's a beautiful location that blends seamlessly with the rest of the city's vibe, although a little muted in its magical qualities. The Imperial Prison is where you go if you're caught committing crimes in the Imperial City. It's supposed to be an inescapable fortress, but we as the players slip in and out of it more often than a lusty Argonian maid, so it can't be that impregnable. The Waterfront District is the port of the city, and doubles as a slum where the city's poor live in wooden shacks on the banks of Lake Rumer. Seeing as I prefer the convenience of having my house close to my shops, this makes the shack on the waterfront my preferred player-owned dwelling, even if it's a rundown piece of shit. While technically not a district of the city, I like to consider the Dragon Bridge and the collection of inns and houses at its end to be a part of the city. There's a couple of quests here, and it's a neat little place that makes the city feel like a part of the world and not just this isolated patch of civilization in the middle of a lake. It keeps the city from feeling completely artificial, even though it's hard to shake that feeling entirely given its flawless geography. There's also a massive network of sewers beneath the city that you can get lost in for hours, and I guess I could count as a district if you want an even 12 districts. And that there is a description of every notable location in the city, some of them being almost as big and detailed as the smaller cities in the game. Added together, the city is an absolute juggernaut that must have taken as much time to create as all the other cities combined. Going through all the quests and content that intersects with the city is a fool's errand because it's the main city of the game for a reason. It would be exceedingly difficult to do a playthrough where you never set foot in the city, and even if you managed to pull it off, you'd have a very incomplete experience of the game. Because of that, I gotta say it's my favorite city in the game, and probably my favorite city of any game. It's just too damn difficult to try and top the Imperial City. But there's one last piece of the city experience I gotta cover. Talked about their art styles, their design, their utility, their shops, their quests, their points of interest, but I haven't yet discussed their people. Okay. There's this thing in Oblivion called Radiant AI. For the uninformed, this is a system Bethesda developed for their NPCs. They are programmed behavior packages that tell NPCs to do things like eat, sleep, go to work, socialize, or walk halfway across the world because a certain flag isn't set correctly. Rather than having NPCs that stand in the same spot day in and day out, rain or shine, Bethesda set out to give these characters lives of their own by building this system and having as much tie into it as possible. I gotta give them credit for trying something so ambitious, and continuing to refine it with each release since Oblivion. It's a pretty cool system, but it was perhaps a little undercooked when it came time to ship Oblivion, and it yielded some interesting consequences. A typical Oblivion NPC's day goes something like this. Wake up in their assigned bed in their own house, eat something they might have picked up from their cupboard, table, or from what they had in their inventory, then it's off to work at their shop across town which they will walk to. 
There, they will stand and conduct business with the player because the player is the only entity in the world capable of actually performing monetary transactions. If the player doesn't come by, then they are just going to stand there staring ahead for several hours. If the shopkeep has other shopkeeps they run the store with, then they might fill the time with discussing the goings-ons of the world. Then it's time to close up shop and head out to get something to eat from the nearby inn. There, they might strike up conversations with other NPCs, or they might chat with someone on the street as they walk home. At home, it's free time, which can be spent reading or staring at a wall for a couple of hours, because I know I like to stare at walls for fun. Then bedtime. Repeat until the end of time. It's impressive that Bethesda managed to get all this running for almost a thousand NPCs in all the cities and settlements across the game world, even if it's only an approximation of a life being lived. You can absolutely stalk NPCs to see what they're doing, but doing so is going to expose their empty robotic lives for what they truly are. An illusion for the player's egocentricity. Unfortunately, you don't have to stalk NPCs for the flaws in the systems to really begin to show. You'll constantly hear NPCs having conversations that sound like two search engines attempting human discourse. You'll see NPCs standing around lifeless because something interrupted their programmed ritual and a refresh tick hasn't passed yet to reorientate them. You'll see NPCs pathfind in strange and inexplicable ways. You'll see NPCs get stuck and just disappear from the game entirely until you find and unstuck them. You'll see all sorts of quirky behavior constantly. And even if everything is running perfectly, the illusion is so paper thin that it fails to convince and in fact only reminds me I'm playing a game from 2006 and these are not real people. The cities feel so dead and the feeling is amplified by the largest cities. The Imperial City is supposed to be a bustling mega city, but it's got as many people walking its streets as Breville, which is a squalid backwater. Nobody is coming and going in the cities aside from a very few NPCs some of whom actually are suffering from malfunctioning radiant AI routines. How they go about fulfilling their pre-programmed needs might deviate somewhat from picking food from their kitchen table to picking food from an outdoor container on the street. But that's not something that's going to intrigue me. I'd be more interested if I saw an NPC from Anvil suddenly in the Imperial City doing some shopping because the shops in her city don't carry the goods she is looking for. It would be interesting if I saw a group of NPCs, all friends with each other, meeting up at the pub for some ale on the weekend. Shit. We don't even have weekends in Cyrodiil. I mean, like, what if we had festivals and holidays like Stardew Valley? That'd be cool. Most of these generic NPCs won't have anything new to discuss whether you are an hour into your playthrough or 100 hours in. They might just blurt out a different generic line that you heard from 10 other people already. They gain no insight from their uniquely programmed lives, and if they aren't changing, then their lives are nothing but purgatory stasis. Radiant AI, which is intended to make the cities feel more alive, oftentimes have the reverse effect. It reminds me that I'm the only one with self-awareness in this world, and once I start to realize that, I stop seeing these characters as people. And then when they do, very, very rarely, express opinions, I don't care in the slightest because the illusion was lost, and I'm left with nothing more but to cast Touch of Rage and make them murder each other for my own sick amusement. Please, let's just get out of the cities. I, I don't like it here anymore. Now it's time for all these disparate pieces of Oblivion's world building I've been rambling on about for a half hour come together to create an experience. This experience is a gameplay loop built upon many layers of interconnecting systems that offers a large degree of player autonomy. It could be said that Bethesda doesn't create games but instead creates worlds that then have gameplay mechanics layered on top of them, and then some quests and objectives sprinkled in. It's this layered series of systems that each player is dropped into and told to do what they want. This is why I think it's not inaccurate when Bethesda says that these are fantasy simulators more than role-playing games. The funny thing is, is that in isolation there really isn't a single component in Oblivion that is spectacular. Well, barring one exception. L let me explain. Starting with the lore and history, there's a ton of lore and backstory that you can get lost in on the wiki. In game, the vast majority of this is crammed into little books that are scattered all over the world. Most of it is very easy to miss and regardless, a lot of it goes unutilized. Knowing it definitely gives some greater context for the world and why it is the way it is, but Bethesda is not above just retconning things if it doesn't work for the game. For example, Cyrodiil was actually described in previous games' lore as being a lush jungle, but obviously in Oblivion it's a temperate climate. They worked some retconning to explain why it is, but eh, it's kinda lame. If the authors of the lore aren't going to respect the lore and the rules of their own universe, why should I care about learning it in the first place? Okay, maybe that's a nihilistic perspective, and Cyrodiil not being a jungle doesn't keep me from reading up on Elder Scrolls lore, but you get my point. 
Unless the game is going to make good use of what is written in these books, the information contained within does a little more than act as some food for thought as I'm wading through monotonous dungeons. And don't worry, I'm going to be getting to the dungeons soon enough. First, let's discuss the races again. The races are all very interesting, with their own unique cultures that Bethesda allows to poke through on very rare occasions. But for the vast majority of your time spent in Cyrodo, you don't really notice the difference between the races aside from their appearance and a few lines of generic dialogue. Nords like to mention wind, Argonians speak of water a lot, and Khajiits like to talk of sand. That's really all it ends up boiling down to, and that's a damn shame. Cyrodiil is meant to be the cosmopolitan heart of the Empire, a great melting pot of cultures, religions, languages, and histories. It's meant to be a cultural and economic crossroad for a continent-spanning empire, but you just never get that sense when playing Oblivion. Melting pot countries tend to be very dynamic, very diverse, and most importantly, very contentious societies. None of these hold true for Cyrodiil. Members of different races rarely make mention of their cultures, and you aren't able to probe them for even the most basic information. And none of it is reflective in their domiciles, businesses, places of respite, and places of worship. It's just the same bland, homogenous imperial decor that leads you to believe that even the free-spirited Khajiits have had the love of their culture pressed out of them by the mechanisms of empire. And you know what? That would actually be an incredible starting point for some cultural conflict in these cities. Maybe the Khajiit and Argonians in Leowin, which had been ceded to the Empire, chafe under the Imperial norms and complain how things are done in town. That gives you the potential to interact with the lore, learn more in an organic and more engaging way than just reading books, and have some interesting quest content that breathes more life into a world that feels oppressively static. While we're on the subject of cities, let's criticize the cities. While I appreciate the unique art styles of each city, and aside from a couple, don't really have a problem with the sizes or layouts, they just don't have much going on for them. In terms of straight gameplay, nothing beats the Imperial City, and even for the Imperial City, you won't venture beyond the Market District as it has the most wealthiest vendors by magnitudes. They are all in a perfect, easy to understand grid layout, and can be done unloading your loot from dungeons and quests, have all your gear repaired and recharged, and loaded back up with potions and empty soul gems in a matter of minutes. No other city can compete with that sort of convenience, and because of that, and the fact that there aren't many quests in the other cities, especially when you disqualify the guild quests, there are some cities you simply will never set foot in unless you make a concerted effort to do so. It is probably the worst of Bethesda's missed opportunities, because these cities have such incredible atmosphere that could naturally lend each of them to their very own unique quest chains that could all be memorable affairs. Really, the missed opportunities of these cities hurt me the most. Seeing as I'm in the complaining mood now, I guess it's time to discuss the dungeons. Oh no, not the dungeons. For better or for worse, Oblivion has over 200 different dungeons open to be explored, not counting all the camps and unmocked things to find in the overworld. Or the Oblivion Gates if you think that's content worth counting. We can't talk about exploration in the game without talking about the dungeon crawls, which by Todd Howard's own admission, was a big focus of Oblivion. The results of which are, like anything else in this game, a mixed bag of good and not so. There's no doubt that when it came to the dungeons, Bethesda went with a quantity over quality approach, and while it didn't help make a lot of them feel unique, it did help make the world feel less empty, so I understand why they did it. The dungeons are, in fact, handcrafted, not generated like some people believe. It only feels like they were generated because the designers used pre-made dungeon pieces that would then snap together like an Ikea cabinet. They can mix and match different pieces, but ultimately there's only so many ways you can make a cave from a handful of parts. This leads to a lot of the dungeons visually blending together, leading almost none of them to feeling unique or memorable. There are mainly four types of dungeons. Caves, mines, imperial forts, and my personal favorite, alien ruins. Technically, there's five if you count Oblivion Gates, but they are just so bad and are only open during a certain stretch of the main quest, so I'm just going to ignore them. Okay? Okay. Caves are incredibly dull, with the least amount of variation in their design. Very monotonous art styles, and the layouts almost always lead to getting lost and looking for a random hidden offshoot you missed three times, leading you to backtrack and double backtrack. Mines are caves, but with rocks you can loot for ore. Usually shorter, but are also guilty of having even more branching paths that are incredibly easy to miss if you're going too fast or get sucked into a fight. Imperial Forts is where it starts to get interesting for me. They are more visually stimulating, usually involving some traps to keep you on the lookout, and have more straightforward layouts that keep you from getting hopelessly lost. Sometimes they just come to an abrupt end, and you're forced to turn around and backtrack for five minutes to the exit. All in all, they aren't terrible, and I'll usually explore every inch of them and mostly enjoy my brief time in them. Coming to Alien Ruins, which, like I said, are my favorite of the four types. 
right off the bat their exteriors are usually quite distinct and interesting. It's satisfying to be tromping through the forest and suddenly coming across the crumbling stained ruins of one of these ancient cities. They really add to the wonder of exploring the overworld and I can't help but feel that old familiar itch in my nucleus accumbens when I imagine what fatty loot is stored within. So I usually take the plunge and head inside. The interiors are like the exteriors unlike anything else you'll find in Oblivion. The white stone walls stretch up to the pitch dark ceilings and while some of the archways have a uh, questionably familiar shape to them. The architecture feels quite alien and elfin, which makes sense, these places were built by elves. I might start thinking about how these places might have once looked centuries ago when they were used as cities for the elves, but that's more an exercise in futility because there's no way these spaces could have been utilized for sophisticated living quarters. Bethesda designed them to be combat arenas, not to represent actual cities. They feel more like enigmatic temples or something, as opposed to cities, but whatever, I guess that's just me being pedantic. The ruins are laid out in a series of interconnected chambers that twist and turn and lie on top of each other, branch off into different loaded zones, and can sometimes lead back to their beginning or just end abruptly, necessitating more backtracking. Their layouts can be horribly confusing, and even with the map I find myself easily getting lost in some of the bigger ones. It's not too bad though because unlike all the other dungeons, the interior scenery is incredibly varied with enigmatic pieces of architecture and magical technology that keeps each room feeling fresh. Although you will see repeats of chambers the more ruins you do explore. These chambers are riddled with traps that will more often than not just scare the ever-living fuck out of you as opposed to killing you outright because you'll be walking along and suddenly your character will break the dead silence with an ear-splitting yelp as a trap blade whooshes behind you. The dungeons wind up putting stress on some of the weakest parts of Oblivion as exploring these repetitive spaces yields very little reward in terms of lore, knowledge, story, or even interesting and unique scenery. That would be all fine and dandy if combat was particularly fun and challenging, but it's not, resulting in dungeons feeling bland and repetitive if experienced for an extended period of time. The only thing that prolongs the experience for me and what kept me grinding through them when I was much younger is the behavioral conditioning I experienced from the Skinner box design of the loot system. You kill things and get some loot. Kill more things, get more loot. Level up and get better loot. Sometimes that loot is enchanted and that's when we got a real party going. Hit chests, get bonus loot. Hit bigger chests, get bigger loot. Find a coffin, loot that bitch too. Pick magical stones off their pedestals and sell them. Loot everything. Chug feather potions, don gear you enchanted with only strength buffs, cast a feather spell, hoof it back to the market district to pawn it all for sweet, sweet gold. Rinse, repeat. Strip those dungeons down to the studs, leave nothing behind. Did I mention dungeons reset after three days? Uh... For someone like me who has an addiction to amassing wealth and loot, this is an easy thing for me to fall prey to. But those cheap thrills don't really last for long because as I said in my previous video, the money has nowhere to go, making the accumulation of wealth pretty much useless. When it wears off, I'm only left with boredom that has me looking for the quit to desktop button. And I can't shake the feeling that's like when you hang out with old friends you haven't seen in years, and after an hour you remember why you haven't talked to them in so long. You haven't changed, they haven't changed, the things you all do haven't changed, and the places you visit hasn't changed. Nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed is that you've forgotten. That's the feeling prolonged dungeon diving fills me with in Oblivion. It's not a fun feeling. So why do I think exploration is still one of the strongest arms of Oblivion? Well, that's because this feeling starts to set in after a few hours of dungeon diving. There comes a point where the monotony sets in and the experience devolves into a grind whose fruits are worthless in the short and long term. Taken in small concentrated doses, exploration can actually be enjoyable. In fact, that whole philosophy can be applied to the entire game. But we'll get back to that, first I want to talk about what part of exploration never really tires. The overworld is a term I've thrown around a few times and have yet really to define. It refers to any space that is not a city, interior, or dungeon. It's the wilderness that connects all the locations of the game space. Exploring this area is an absolute joy because it's full of unique and changing scenery. You can cross the Dragon Bridge a dozen times during different days and weather and it feels like you're seeing something completely new each time. You'll occasionally get ganked by roaming enemies and if you're in a hurry that can be annoying. But if you're not going anywhere in particular it's a welcome diversion. Sometimes the enemy will draw you in a direction that you would not have normally gone, usually off the beaten path, leading you to some captivating scenery or some point of interest. This is where Bethesda's world design is at its best. Even without the compass, you will feel like the game is pulling you in a dozen directions with promises of something interesting to see just over the next hill or through a patch of trees. This is exploration at its best, exploring for the sake of exploring. 
You're exploring for the intrinsic value of discovery because you don't need a thinly veiled Skinner box to get your dopamine flowing. You just need some stimulation, any stimulation. The rest of the game lacks this sort of diversity, this sort of liveliness. The cities manage to feel dull and dead in comparison despite being full of NPCs who are going about their programmed lives. The quests lack any sort of thrust or emotional investment. Leveling and progression feels flat and unrewarding. But despite all these faults, it's this. Just, just wandering through the wilderness of Cyrodiil that is just so goddamn good that it literally carries the entire fucking game on its back. It does it so subtly that I take it for granted sometimes and it's easy for players to miss when they are fast traveling between quest markers. But this exploration is where the magic of the game resides. When everything is working right, the experience of roaming the countryside, taking in the beautiful sights that are made more visceral and more real from the first person perspective, while the time of the day progresses and Jeremy Soule's beautiful score plays in the background, it's just so easy to lose all sense of awareness. The world washes over you in a delightful wave and you just feel good. You're simply having fun, simply enjoying this world. This is Bethesda magic. This is what you spend hours doing tedious dungeons and quests to get to. This is what an Elder Scrolls game is truly about. We don't need radiant AI, flat quests, boring dungeons, exploitable skills, and flimsy loot systems to appreciate this, although it would make for a better experience if these aspects of the games were improved upon. But there is a way to get more out of this game than the average player might get, a way to distill the experience down to a purer form. Moderation is key to the Oblivion experience. Do any one thing for too long and the mask starts to slip. You start to see behind the curtain and you notice all the machinery that is running in the background to create this fantasy simulator. And that's a serious problem. In my opinion, a good simulation should be able to withstand the most rigorous scrutiny imaginable. A simulation is meant to simulate an aspect of reality. And in order for that to be achieved, it needs to do it near 100% of the time. Otherwise, you start sliding into the realm of RPGs, and Oblivion just doesn't play very well as an RPG. So what's the deal here? Oblivion isn't a great exclusively RPG experience, and it's not consistent enough with its systems to qualify as a simulation. What does that make it, then? Well, that makes it a game that lands somewhere between RPG and Sim. Not a very satisfying answer, I know, but that's all I can really come up with. The secret to getting the most out of the game is to avoid looking at things too deeply in order to preserve the sanctity of its sandbox simulation, and to cut it slack when you see those faults because it's an RPG. I don't know, I'm no psychologist, but it sounds to me like this game is awfully needy. Oblivion is not without its flaws, and it's weird that a game that tries to be about exploration and player freedom ends up having a lot of quirks that constantly play against those two foundations. But when all is well, exploring and experiencing this unique world can be very satisfying. Anyway, that's all I have to say about exploration. I'll see you in the next one. There are fans of Oblivion who swear the quest content of the game is the best part of it. To those fans, I just gotta ask, what game were you all playing? Okay, maybe that's a little harsh. In truth, a lot of them specifically mention the Dark Brotherhood questline and the Thieves Guild questline, which are both fantastic examples of what Oblivion can really accomplish when all of its pieces are being used well. But I'd say a vast majority of the game's quests are some of the worst things it has to offer. Like, some of it is insultingly bad. This no doubt has to do with the fact that the game has over 200 quests, proving that, like with dungeons, Bethesda was opting for a quantity over quality approach. A lot of the design of these quests and guilds fell onto individual designers at Bethesda, some of whom excelled at this task and some of whom just couldn't quite meet the same performance. Unfortunately, a lot of the subpar content still made the cut, leading to some of Oblivion's greatest quality gradients. There's a certain trend in Oblivion quests, a formula if you will. It's almost the antithesis to what's supposed to make these games good. I'm going to go through the main story, the four major guilds, the Daedric Shrines, and a select few side quests to uncover that formula. Because the bulk of the bad quests play right into that formula, while the better ones either work it to the best of their abilities or shirk it almost entirely. So let's get this show on the road.
The main story quest line of Oblivion is very forgettable. Aside from a totally optional segment that has you grinding, closing Oblivion gates, there's no point in the story that is offensively terrible, which is more than can be said about some of the other quest chains in this game, but it's also outshined by other quest chains too. The issues holding back the main story are numerous, so let's just dive in and start covering them as we go. We are introduced to the story the moment we start a new game. The one of only two pre-rendered cutscenes we see gives us the basic gist of what's going on. An evil army from another dimension is on the march and only the Emperor is aware of the danger they pose. We start the game in Bethesda's patented prison introduction having finished baking our potato monster and getting heckled by the professional prisoner from across the hall. The Emperor we'd seen in the cutscene just a few minutes earlier comes strolling down with his guards as they talk about an assassination attempt that unfortunately killed his heirs. You gotta feel for Uriel Septim. The dude knew his family was doomed to be assassinated in this way, and he was powerless to stop it because the hands of fate and all that shit. I don't know. On the one hand, Patrick Stewart's acting here does lend Uriel Septim some real life. But on the other, I'm a tough crowd to sell ideas of prophecy and fate to. If you're going to do it, you need a lot more build-up than a couple of minutes of telling not showing exposition. But we'll, uh, we'll put a pin in that thought and come back to it later. The secret passage to escape the city leads through the Imperial Prison, and wouldn't you know it, we just happen to be occupying the cell that is supposed to be off-limits because it's a secret escape route. But here we are, coming face to face with the Emperor, and he recognizes it as such and states it is the will of the gods that we meet in this fashion, which means our destiny is now tied to his fate and we are destined for great things. Once again, let's sideline the prophecy stuff, the game just layers it on really thick in the beginning to give us a motive, I guess. I don't know. I don't think my character or I need more motivation than just get the fuck out of this tiny dungeon because we didn't come to Cyrodiil to listen to that twat hurling insults at us all day. The guards, being guards, don't trust us but tolerate our presence as the Emperor seems alright with us tagging along. Eventually we are told to stay put but as fate would have it, a rat smelling dinner punches through the wall, giving us a way out. We follow the route and it comes back to the Emperor and his guard unit. He talks more about fate and tells the guards we must help them because destiny. We go a little more and eventually come to a dead end where the Emperor, stripped of his remaining two guards, takes off the Amulet of Kings and tells us we must get it to Joffrey, and we are the only one capable of closing shut the jaws of Oblivion. He then gets murdered because the devs decided to disable our controls, forcing us to watch the assassin come through a secret entrance and do the deed. It's just a very lame and ignoble end to a character who, if you read up on, lived a very rich and interesting life. Boris, being understandably mistrusting of us the whole entire way, does a complete 180 when he sees us standing over the body of the Emperor with the most precious item in all of Tamriel now, because only the Amulet of Kings can light the dragon fires that keep the evil army banished from the realm of mortals. But the fact that the Emperor, who just watched his whole family die and is on the run for his own life, suddenly takes a shine to some random prisoner automatically makes us qualified to handle the most valuable item in the world right now. If this sounds just a little contrived and stupid, that's because it is. The best is when Boris assumes that I'm an experienced assassin because of my playstyle. An experienced assassin, standing over the freshly assassinated Emperor holding the most valuable item in the world. Not suspicious in the slightest. Right. So Boris tells us to take the amulet to Joffrey, the head of his organization who is currently in hiding because Sutterfuge is the greatest weapon the Bleeds have in performing their duties. So not only am I horribly suspect right now, but he then proceeds to disclose the identity and whereabouts of the only group possible of stopping all of this. We beat it out of the sewers and off to deliver the amulet. Eventually. I got some other things to do first. Eventually we get the amulet to Joffrey because I literally have no other use for the amulet except deliver it because the game refuses to let me do anything else with it. I guess it's the will of the gods that I can't be separated from the thing. I just love plot devices like that, especially in games that are supposed to be about player agency. Okay, okay, I swear, I'll stick to the plot and save the conclusion until we are done. But I'm sure you're all catching on to what I'm alluding to, and to spoil what comes next, no, this doesn't improve. Joffrey believes we can be trusted because Boris is a good guard, even if I do have my doubts about his competency. I mean, we did deliver the amulet, so we should be trustworthy now, right? It's not like I might not be a double agent working for the enemy to deliver the amulet to gain inside knowledge, and that my fellow agents will be swinging by to scoop up the amulet once I get what I really want, right? Well, uh, we'll get back to that thought in a few minutes. 
Joffrey tells us that Uriel Septim, being Uriel Septim and being able to see the future, saw the need to father an illegitimate child and have him raised in secret outside of the royal court under an assumed identity. Classic Uriel Septim trying to outsmart fate. If only he was able to outsmart the assassin that stabbed him in the back as he stood there smiling at us like someone who welcomed the sweet embrace of death. It turns out the Untitled Son lives in Kavach as a priest, so being the trustworthy guy that we are, Joffrey asks us to go save him because surely the Agents of Evil are hot on his trail too. I mean, I don't see why they would unless they possess the same future seeing Uriel does, as I assume the Emperor took the proper precautions to tell no one except the man instructed to deliver the baby to an uninformed family. That, that being you, Joffrey. I'm I'm talking about you. And you break that silence to send me to do something that you might have wanted to do yourself because now that secret is out, and if I was an agent of the enemy, you just gave me the location of the last card you had left in your hand. I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but god damn. We get to Kavach, and wouldn't you know it, Daedra are attacking the city. I guess they found out about Martin after all? It's actually not explained whether Kavach was targeted because Martin Septim is here, or if it was just sort of a random coincidence. There's nine cities in the game though, and the fact that they just happened to land on the right city their first shot kind of leads me to believe it was intentional. In which case, why didn't they just... No, never mind. Too many questions. I, I just need to stop questioning and start believing. Believing in destiny, believing in my role as a savior of the world, and believing in the ability of the writers. I'm getting out of here before it's too late. They'll be here any minute, I'm telling you. Run when you can! We arrive at Kavach to find we were a little late to the party. Most of the Daedra and the Siege Engine are gone, but one gate still remains to torment those who survived. In order to get Martin out of the city, we first have to deal with the gate and clear the way to the chapel. This means going into the gate because, as the guard captain puts it, I don't know how to close this gate, but it must be possible, because the enemy closed the ones they opened during the initial attack. There's really no reason to think this, seeing as we know nothing about the gate. But, at least he's honest that he believes he's throwing our life away because of it. With no other choice given to us, we jump through the gate and enter the plains of Oblivion. I've mentioned the gates a few times now, so I guess it's high time to explain why these gates are probably my least favorite places in the game. While the atmosphere is pretty cool, and ignoring the tedium they signal for me now, they do a great job of instilling a feeling of dread appropriate for the realm of a god of chaos and destruction. But the motif definitely gets tiring after you visit a few of them and realize they are all identical. Time doesn't change, weather doesn't change, the scenery doesn't change, just the layouts. And the layouts are nothing short of some of the worst designs in the game. They are incredibly confusing and frustrating to navigate due to a lack of recognizable landmarks. Really, the navigation of these gates is the main source of frustration players will feel when going through them. You'll sometimes be forced to hunt down doors to maze-like cavern networks to progress to the next section of the level, and those entrances can blend in with the landscape and be easy to miss. To make it all worse, there's usually arbitrary roadblocks like locked gates that require you to take a secondary route to find the mechanism to open them, artificially extending your stay in these dull locations and making navigating them even more confusing. All the while, you are fighting some of the most boring, damaged, spongy enemies in the game over and over again. Oblivion gates are the very soul of monotonous tedium. The first gate would have been a lackluster novelty if you only had to do it the one time, but the fact you'll be finding yourself in this realm a dozen times if you do the optional main quests, you'll end up harboring a particular loathing for them. So with that massive rant out of the way, let's just skip to the end where we remove the citral stone anchoring the gate, which is the only way to leave a gate upon entering one. We're sent back to Kavach where the captain is surprised we survived. I'm, uh, I'm glad he believed in our abilities. Seeing as we managed to do what nobody else was able to thus far, he asks for our help getting into the city to free the civilians trapped in the chapel. Seeing as that's where Martin is, we agree and help finish off the day in this part of the city. We finally get to Martin, who is at first insistent we got the wrong dude, but quickly capitulates because we helped drive off the day so we must be a good guy. Now, that's actual logic there. He's not agreeing to join us because we inexplicably showed up with the Amulet of Kings from the recently killed Emperor as something equally as daft. He thinks we are a hero because we demonstrated an actual act of heroism. We head back to Wayne and Priory to find it's under attack by the same robed people as the ones who killed the Emperor back in the sewers. I'd make a stink out of the enemy appearing to be omniscient, but seeing how blockheaded the blades have been up to this point, I really should be surprised they hadn't been attacked sooner, like at the same times they were murdering the Emperor. 
My point being, it's not surprising in the slightest they knew that the amulet was here, and Joffrey at least has the wherewithal to realize that's what they were after. And surprise, surprise, it's gone, but at least we got the heir, so there's still some hope. Joffrey makes probably the first good decision he has this entire story and suggests we all retreat to Cloud World Temple, where a handful of men could defend against an army. I'm not sure if we could defend against an army of demons who can spawn a fire-spewing city-devouring siege engine with portals they seem to be able to open up wherever and whenever they wish, but it's better than playing monk in an indefensible city. It's best we don't tempt fate and risk losing the air a second time. At Cloud Ruler Temple, they officially recognize Martin as Emperor, and we're inducted as a member of the Blades because our competency outshines a lot of the other members right now, and times are kind of tough. We're sent back to the Imperial City to investigate our enigmatic enemy that seems to know so much about us, meanwhile we know nothing about them. We meet back up with Boris, who is still trying to keep a low profile, but that's clearly not working as he has to fight off an assassin and then try and play it off as though I just caught him while he was on the shitter or something. We find a book confirming that this is the work of a Daedric cult, and Boris has us go talk to an expert of Daedric cults at the Arcane University who tells us Yep, we got ourselves a cult. Not only that, this is a particularly fanatic cult following the teachings of Mancar Cameron, who has written a bunch of books talking about the wonder and power of his patron god, Lord Dagon. This mythic dawn cult is bad news and sounds like the sort of people who would summon demons to destroy a city and kill the Emperor and all of his heirs. This revelation kicks off a Da Vinci Code-esque investigation that leads us in the sewers with Boris meeting a sponsor for this cult. I sort of botch it because I have trouble controlling my bloodlust, but no worries. We make it through and recover the last piece of evidence that details the map leading to their secret hideout. We get the location and head to the hideout, where we have the option to slip in as a new recruit, but once again, bloodlust, so I just go in shooting. What? We interrupt a ritual Mancar Cameron is conducting and he slips into a portal with the Amulet of Kings, but we manage to make off with this evil-ass book, slaughtering his entire congregation in the process. We give the book to Martin, who rightfully scolds us for being so cavalier and swiping the thing in the first place. But it turns out Martin dabbled in the dark arts during his edgy teenage years before becoming a wholesome priest. So he's uniquely qualified to dig through the book and figure out how to make a portal to get to the paradise Cameron built using the magic of Lord Dagon. While Martin scries the evil book, we gotta help Joffrey tie up some loose ends regarding some spies that have been skulking around Bruma to the south. It's a very straightforward quest that's just a vehicle to reveal that the Mythic Dawn have plans to turn Bruma into Kavach 2.0. Which I wouldn't really care if they did anyway, because Bruma's a pretty lame-ass city. But Joffrey is concerned by the news. I guess not having expected our enemy, who literally destroyed an entire city with barely any effort, would try the same trick a second time. How Joffrey got to be the Grandmaster of a massive Imperial spy organization is beyond my comprehension, because he's the most clueless person in the entire story. Seriously, he's blindsided and outsmarted at every turn and continuously underestimates the organization that has been consistently doing this since the beginning of the game. Martin, on the other hand, is actually a pretty decent character, but right now he's just got his nose in a bunch of books, so it's up to us to do the things that need doing. Speaking of which, Martin finally figured out what the deal is with the portal. He deduces we will need some ingredients to cook one up for ourselves. And periodically he will decode another ingredient, but for the time being he tells us that we need the blood of a Daedric Prince. This means we gotta do one of the shrines to get one of their trinkets that's technically a piece of their essence, which would qualify for the sake of the portal. I opt to get Sanguine's Rose because it's generally just a useless item and the quest is easy. With that crossed off the list, it's now time for the optional quest I mentioned earlier. It's clear an attack on Bruma is imminent, so Joffrey wants us to go to each of the cities and enlist their aid in defending Bruma when the time comes for the cult to launch their assault. Kvach might have been caught off guard, but that won't be the case with Bruma. Granted, I'm not sure what sort of chance Joffrey thinks a handful of guards will have against an army of demons and a massive fire-spewing siege engine, but he thinks this is vital to our success. Being a glutton for punishment and wanting to endure the full Oblivion main story experience, I agree to do it. Unfortunately, every city is being inconvenienced by an Oblivion Gate outside their walls at this very moment and sadly cannot spare the men to defend Bruma. If someone were to take care of the gate, <clears throat> then they would reconsider. Being the only person in Cyrodiil capable of closing a gate, it seems like it's just up to us to do it. So I showed you the intended way to close the gates, now let me show you the sane way to close the rest of them.
With all the gates threatening the major cities dealt with, we got the aid for Bruma and Joffrey can sleep easy tonight knowing we solved his problems. I don't really know what's preventing them from just opening more gates outside the cities, but let's not give them any more reasons to send us back into those gates, please. The next stretch of the main story is really just lackluster fetch quests and mostly uninspired dungeons as we grab the remaining ingredients needed for the portal to paradise. We need the Great Sigil Stone from the giant gate the Mythic Dawn wants to open to summon their giant siege engine, which means letting them open the portal outside Burma. Meanwhile, Martin and Joffrey will mount a defense while we run through the gate and get the stone, as we are now uniquely qualified for the job having done it a dozen times at this point. Relatively speaking, this part of the questline becomes kinda sorta almost fun. In fact, from this point on, the main quest manages to get just a little bit interesting. Not a lot, mind you. Let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. But now that the obligatory dungeon crawling is out of the way, eh, it's not too bad. We get a little in-game cutscene where we meet the Countess of Bruma and Martin in his Imperial Dragon armor looking all Emperor-like. And then we get a short walk to the battlefield where all of Bruma's six citizens come out and cheer on the Emperor. All jokes about Bethesda's inability to have many NPCs on screen at once aside, it's kind of a cool moment. It makes you feel like you're actually a part of something finally. Like all you were doing is finally accounting for something. That your actions have some sort of impact on the world. It's sort of mind-numbing that we've been on a quest that deals with the fate of the entire world and not until now did any of it feel like it's tied to an actual world. It all felt like it was happening in a vacuum. Even in Cloud Ruler Temple, nobody really responded to anything we were doing. Everything just felt so static. And while that feeling is going to return before too long, it's nice to have this moment where we get some recognition from the bigger game world that we exist and what we are doing matters to people. So we go down to where the gates are set to open because we now have that power somehow, and Martin gives a little speech. It's a very generic one-note thing, but Sean Bean excels at this sort of work and brings the uninspired lines to something resembling stirring because his delivery is so spot on. His voice work alone highlights this bit of character development for Martin, which might make him feel like the only character in the entire game with actual development. When compared to the speech he gave at Cloud Ruler Temple upon arriving and his diminutive response when we told him that he's the heir to the throne, it's another cool moment. It's at this point where I start to feel like this isn't so much a story about how I'm saving the world, but that I'm helping Martin save the world, and helping him grow into his role as Emperor. I'm going to come back to that point later, so try and hold on to that impression. So the speech finishes just in time for the gates to start spawning and all the guards we worked so hard running through oblivion gates to secure help hold the line as waves of danger come flooding in. There's really no risk of losing this fight with all these guards here. I think Martin is not essential for this fight so he can get killed and it would result in a GG game over. But with all these NPCs the heat is kept off Marty as we wait for the big gate to open. Once it's up, in we go. We're given a very generous time limit to run through this abbreviated oblivion gate. It's a cool moment seeing that engine we saw in the opening cutscene now in real time. It's still an oblivion gate though, so the whole thing still kinda sucks, but it's mercifully short and straightforward, so at least there's that. We snatch the giant sigil stone and we are transported back to the battlefield where the siege engine collapses on the ground dead somehow, even though it wasn't even close to the exit. I guess they wanted to capture that feeling of, wow, that was close. Except we are like a mile from the Bruma City Wall, so that thing would have had to crawl a painfully long way up frozen cliffs to make it to the city. Making me question why would they open these gates so far from the city walls when the Kavach gates opened up almost inside the city itself. But I really gotta stop asking these sorts of questions. Joffrey died for me during the battle and I almost feel something resembling sadness. And maybe I would have reloaded to try and keep him from dying if he was more than a one note character. But he's not, so I didn't. Boris managed to survive, which is kinda nice because despite him having some questionable judgement, I grew fond of him during our time playing detectives trying to get into the Mythic Dawn. But this is pretty much the last time any of the Blades characters will play any sort of role in the story, so we might as well say our goodbyes now. Back at Cloud Ruler Temple, Martin opens up the gates of Paradise now that we've got all the ingredients for our own portal and away we go. Paradise is one of my favorite locations in Oblivion. It would have been great if we could have visited it or something like it at will, because it's different enough to feel fresh but familiar enough not to be out of place in Oblivion. As Mankar Cameron describes it, it's how Tamriel was during the Age of the Elves. A picture of the past and his planned future. So I guess he's a regressive boomer who thinks the old days were the better days and the only way forward is backward. I don't know, who cares? He's such an underdeveloped antagonist I truly cannot fathom any of his motivations. 
He starts talking in our head now as we stroll through his paradise spouting nonsense that would have been much better to have gotten earlier in the game so we could have had time to unpack and process everything he's talking about. But the game just keeps all of it onto us as we are distracted by the pretty landscape and trying to figure out where to go. It's one of the worst treatments for an antagonist I've ever experienced. I'm sure a lot of what he's saying is just reworded stuff from his books, but the last place I want to get an antagonist's perspective is through lengthy walls of written text. A great antagonist has charisma and personality, and they sway you with their gifts of speechcraft. You know what they're saying is lies and whatever else, but you start to doubt your own convictions because they are speaking with absolute certainty and authority, lending it a sense of credibility. None of that works if it's written in essay format. You can absolutely convey those things if it's written dialogue. I'm not saying you can't have compelling antagonists in written words and need a voice actor like Terrence Stamp to sell it, but reading a wall of monologue text isn't going to do the trick. Basically, show me the charisma and genius of the antagonist. Don't narrate it to me. And by the time we hit paradise, it's way too late. We come across a Daedra who actually speaks to us rather than kills us, and this is probably more interesting and noteworthy than the guy we are coming to kill. He expresses his people respect us for slaying so many during the Siege of Kavach, and he'd be honored to fight us or bargain with us into servitude. This guy whose name I won't even pretend to try and pronounce gives us some very cool insight into the race that we've been slaughtering the entire story. Once again, it would have been great to have gotten this development say during the Siege of Kavach, but it's at least more subtly done here as opposed to the info dump from Cameron. It's just enough to get us to start thinking about the culture of the Tremor, who clearly place a huge importance on honor and dignity, and you get the sense that they are a very intelligent and sophisticated species. We'll never get answers to those questions in this game, but it's a fun mind tease. Appreciating the food for thought this Daedra has given me, I agree to do the favor for him in exchange for helping me escape from the first stage of Paradise. It's a very simple, go here and activate this object, but it's funny hearing these people complain when I do it. Once again, it's reinforcing the ideas of Dramora Honor, and I kinda dig it for a two minute diversion. It makes me sad thinking about the potential for there to have been more of this if they had just devoted the time earlier in the story to do it. But it is what it is. We go into the Forbidden Grotto, which is this giant maze of torture fetish devices for immortals who didn't appreciate the gift Lord Dagon bequeathed them. So they get to be tortured for all eternity instead. This section of the game bugged out for me hard, so the whole sequence just fell apart as the scripts weren't triggered correctly. But the gist is we meet one of the torturers who regrets what he's done and this hell he now is subjected to and wants to help us end it. So we go around LARPing as another victim of his until we manage to sneak out of the cave. But like I said, it was all bugged for me, so I just had to run through and I think he got bodied by some Daedra early on and that was that. Saved me some time, so I'm not too pissed. We then run into the guy who was supposed to be our sponsor to get into the Mythic Dawn when we were in the sewers with Boris, and no, I didn't remember him, that's just what the wiki says because who the fuck would remember this guy? He's all like, behold the power of my father, and I don't know, maybe Mancar Cameron truly is his father since they got the same last name? Okay, who cares? He escorts us into the big empty palace and my game hasn't stopped bugging out yet because suddenly everyone has a heart attack at the same time, and I guess I won because the whole world is collapsing. Don't worry, even if this hadn't happened, this fight is a joke and is over in only a few seconds. So we snatch all the goodies off their bodies, making sure to get the Amulet of Kings because, oh right, that was the whole point of all of this and we are back in Cloud Ruler Temple. Very convenient. Martin is dressed in his Imperial robes and puts on the Amulet because, boy, would it have been embarrassing if we got this far and realized he can't wear the Amulet because he's not the true heir. But it does, and he says he believed us since we first told him back in Kavach, and that we're best buddies now, and this is how we know he's gonna die because we have an actual emotional attachment to him, and Bethesda isn't trying this hard to make us like the character if they aren't going to try and reap the ultimate payoff for that attachment. But that's getting ahead of ourselves, we gotta get to the Imperial City and light the fires. But first, I got a few errands to run. Maybe my new best friend won't mind joining me. Back at the Imperial Palace, the Elder Council recognizes Martin as the rightful ruler and agrees to his coronation. But wait! Lord Dagon is attacking the Imperial City directly because he had that power the whole time and why the fuck didn't he just do this in the beginning? Why the whole drawn out plot with Mankar Cameron and the Mythic Dawn and shit? I know the Dragonfires were a thing that needed taking care of, but surely once they were out, he could have just warped into the Imperial City and just got to destroying everything before anyone even knew the Emperor was dead. Why did he wait until I killed his biggest pawn and dismantled his cult? Why attack two cities with the siege engine, neither one posing a real threat? Why didn't he attack Coral with the siege engine instead? Why did he even need those Oblivion Gates? A handful of cultists managed to make off with the amulet anyway. 
Why didn't he warp into Cloud Ruler Temple and wipe out literally the only group trying to stop him and kill the last remaining Septum? Why? 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 None of this makes sense. This incredibly shaky story just completely falls apart once this happens, and I'm just left going, when will this be over? We then get an escort mission as the last part of this quest, because why the fuck not? You can tell I've done this before because I tell Martin to stay put while I clear away for him, and then pull some trickery to get him to spawn in the temple because fuck fighting endless waves of Daedra while performing an escort quest. And then Martin, the only character in Oblivion who's actually a character, goes, I do what I must do. I cannot stay to rebuild Tamriel. That task falls to others. Farewell. You've been a good friend in the short time that I've known you. But now I must go. The dragon waits. And then turns himself into a dragon because, like I said, they haven't been building this character up for nothing. No, he needs to die now to elicit some sort of emotional response out of us that isn't boredom or mild frustration. Too bad I still don't care about Martin that much, and really, all I care about at this point is just having this thing over. Lord Dagon is killed in a cutscene, which is probably a mercy because I don't want to know what sort of sick test of patience a boss fight with a Daedric Lord would be if Bethesda designed the sequence. And then we get our second pre-rendered cutscene of the game. Main story complete. We are left standing in the ruined remains of the temple, and the head of the Elder Council comes sprinting in asking where Martin is. When we tell him, you're looking at him, while eyeing the giant petrified statue of Akatosh's corporeal form, he gets the hint and goes, Sucks we don't have an Emperor again, but at least Lord Dagon is dead and will never threaten Tamriel again. I have no idea what gives you that impression, seeing as the Septon line is now vanquished, the Amulet of Kings is destroyed, and the monument for the Dragonfires has been blown to shit. But yeah, I guess we're safe now because you said so. He tells us we are now the champion of Cyrodiil and that we are going to get our very own Imperial Dragon Armor which is usually only for Emperors but we deserve nothing less. Okay, not a bad reward. Though my favorite reward is people just calling me champion when they see me on the streets and asking what it was like to watch Martin turn into a goddamn dragon right in front of me. It's that sort of impact on the world that I feel like so much else in this game is lacking. Like I keep saying, that's a topic for the conclusion. Let's just wrap up the story. It's really underwhelming. I mean, really, really underwhelming. I haven't played anything predating Oblivion, though I've heard excellent things about Morrowind's story. But I can say with some authority, from Oblivion onward, Bethesda just can't make a good story in their games. They seem to conflate epic story with main story, and that mindset right there poses a really dangerous problem for these sorts of games. The entire story seems to have this identity crisis, where at first we seem to be the supreme agent of its narrative, Everything is happening because of us. But slowly, and by slowly I mean almost at the drop of a hat, events shift from us to Martin and suddenly the main quest actually starts to open up. Characters are allowed to develop a tiny bit, the world is reacting to events, we're learning for the first time, even if it's all crammed into a 20 minute segment in a very rushed half-assed sort of way. And if the story itself didn't collapse under idiotic contradictions to the rules the story has been beating into our heads the entire time, it would have ended maybe in a satisfying way. Martin didn't need to die. We didn't need to have Lord Dagon invade Tamriel and just... <sighs> Bethesda thought because this is the main quest, all this epic shit needs to happen all the time and that's just not the case. The main story should ideally interact with as many elements of the world as possible. Maybe tie in some of the guilds and give you a chance to be introduced to them in a more direct manner. The world is so rich in detail, and the main story uses almost none of those elements. Racial differences, cultural differences, the extreme diversity of Cyrodiil's locales, the different guilds and factions, the different playstyles, the extensive history of the world. All of this is there, already in the game, and none of it is utilized in the slightest in Oblivion's main story. Instead, we just get a rushed amusement park ride that gives us very little opportunity to interact with it, to become invested in it. And before we know it, it's over and leaves us with little to show except a blown up temple district, some dead oblivion gates out in the wilds, and people sometimes asking what it was like to see a dragon. Also, the Imperial Dragon Armor sucks. Okay, moving on. Now, there really should be only one question left on your mind at this point. If I said the main quest in Oblivion wasn't that offensively bad, and I just railed on it for about a half hour, then what in the hell is the worst? Well, you better strap in because you're about to find out.
I'm not going to subject everyone to as meticulous of a look at the Mages Guild as I had the main quest, partly because a lot of the complaints I had about the story there are the same but amplified here, also because a lot of the quests are just padded filler dungeon crawls. I had a lot of complaints about the main quest line, but too long ain't among them. The Mages Guild, on the other hand, has barely enough story content to create one engaging quest, and that weakness is then stretched to cover an entire 2-3 to three hour long quest chain. It's absolutely brutal. The worst part is that if you're a mage or you want to enchant items or you don't have the Wizard Tower DLC, going through some of the Mages Guild is mandatory. No other questline I feel is mandatory for a style of play, even the guilds geared towards certain styles. The Mages Guild is the only one, and with it being probably the worst experience of the entire game, it creates a very unfortunate arrangement. But just because I won't be going through each quest of the guild doesn't mean this is going to be a quick ordeal. Oh no, not even close. First, let's take a step back for a moment just to discuss the Mage's Guild as a whole. The guild is split into two distinct segments, the Guild Halls and the Arcane University. The Guild Halls are local chapters of the Mage's Guild found in each major city. They are meant to provide magical services to the community and make sure everyone is following the guild's best practices and policies. So no sordid magics like necromancy or enslaving people's minds or sacrificing people to daedric cults or whatnot pop up. The Arcane University is the hub of the magic bureaucracy and is like the cool kids club for mages. Everyone wants to get in but it's sort of an exclusive deal, or it's meant to be anyway. To get in, a prospective student, I guess you would call them, would need to collect a recommendation from every guild hall in Cyrodiil which I could see why it would be a barrier to entry for anyone that isn't a vagabond adventurer such as ourselves. The university is meant to offer more opportunities for a mage to get better at magic, perform legitimate research, and become a career mage. Honestly, I really like the Mages Guild as a guild itself. Out of all of them, the Mages Guild has the most logical and obvious structure to it. There's ranks that kinda mean something some of the time, there's some leadership roles, experts of particular fields and subjects, and the split between local halls and university feels like a meaningful distinction in theme and in practice. Out of all the guilds, the guild halls here provide some great services to the player that can't be found elsewhere, or maybe just not as conveniently, mostly in the form of spell and alchemy vendors and skill trainers. The university itself provides more than a few useful benefits for a magic player. I don't really begrudge the game for having the recommendation system or requiring the player to join to gain access to these things. Actually, I think Oblivion would have benefited more from stuff like this, but I think it would have been better if we only needed, say, three recommendations. Am I really to believe all the people here traveled all over Cyrodiil doing tasks for these guilds while successfully avoiding death, disease, injury, and poverty? I gotta doubt that insinuation. But it is what it is. It's fine if the quests we gotta do are at least a little fun and rewards more than just a recommendation, but of course, this isn't the case. So let's look at these recommendation quests. There are seven guild halls in total we'll need recommendations from throughout Cyrodiil, one in each major city aside from Kavach, of course. Each guild hall specializes in a school of magic, with Bruma just being an oddball school. This distinction is useful if you're looking for a particular spell, say, destruction. Your best bet might be then to hit up the hall in Skingrad before anywhere else, because you'll probably find it there. But that distinction really has no influence on the actual recommendation quests themselves. Some of them might introduce you to some of the concepts of their school, for example, the Shaden Hall recommendation quest has you diving into a well to retrieve a ring, and it might behoove you to have a spell for water breathing and another spell for easing burden, both of which fall under alteration, which is the school specialty. While going back to the skin grad example, you're given a level destruction fireball spell and told to clear out a cave of baddies, which is at least tangential to the ethos of the school. The Breville School of Illusion will deal with a lot of talking to people and give you some scrolls of charm spells, which is okay I guess, but the Illusion Skull has way more in it, and going around trying to find some girls as major staff because of some stupid middle school crush is not what comes to mind when I think of the potential for Illusion. But then you got the School of Restoration and Anvil's Quest that just has you hunting down a rogue mage, and by hunting down I of course mean you're acting as bait because that's what this guild does with its initiates. Leowen's quest tasks you with tracking down this amulet that keeps the voices in the guild hall leader's head from making her crazy and incapable of functioning. I guess this could be stretched to making you think about mysticism as that school is tied loosely with the concepts of reality and sanity, but I mean, that's a stretch. 
Turns out an underling was mad she had a condition that makes her need the amulet to function so he jacks it and we gotta find another. What a dick. The Coral School of Conjuration, I don't even know what that connection is. We gotta make sure this lady doesn't get a certain book because it contains all sorts of power and we are just meant to accept purely at face value the testimony of the Hall Leader. Okay, it's a guild, there's a command structure so I guess I can buy into it. The game gives you the option to give her the book anyways, but you gotta get it back before completing the quest so it's not actually a choice for you to make. And still, what does the book have to do with summoning creatures to fight for me? Maybe it's meant to represent the moral dilemma the guild faces because conjuration is a little close to necromancy and there's some grayness here and there's people attracted to the magic for the power it offers? I don't fucking know, I'm just trying to come up with something because otherwise it feels like we're doing shit because we're told to. The more we can become active participants in the story and not just passengers, the better, but these quests make that a real exercise of mental gymnastics in order to pull off. Bruma's quest just has you trying to find one of the members of the Hall who is playing a prank on the leader of the Hall because she's a terrible mage and apparently only got her position because she sucked up to the bosses in the Arcane University. Uh, okay? This quest I get is meant to be intentionally bad in the sense it's supposed to make the guild seem less than ideal. The guy who inducts you into the university proper even calls attention to this fact. But we already got a taste of that in the Shaden Hall quest where the guild leader tries to have us killed like the other initiate he sent down into the well whose body we find down there. And then the second in command of the hall tells us she had a big argument with the guy and we find black soul gems hinting that he was dabbling in necromancy. And we even get some foreshadowing. So clearly whoever designed this quest knew what the bigger stakes of the quest line were going to be and managed to work in the idea that the guild is not as unified and idyllic as the guild wants people in Tamriel to believe. They managed to do that in an albeit very abbreviated manner, but hey, it's at least effective and creative. The Bruma recommendation quest is just insulting in that we are treated like some dumb lackey pawn who is just here to cover the messes of other people's immaturity and incompetence. And believe me, that quest will not be the only one that gives that impression. Eventually, we get all seven recommendations and is off to the university to gain entry officially. Just like in real life, there's no fanfare, just an often repeated set of words, some robes, and a task we need to complete. I'm so happy though that they don't make us go on some inane tour of the university as though this space is so big and complicated that we need to have our hand held because that's what you get when you go to a university in real life. I mention this because this was one of the first things I noticed in Skyrim about their mages guild. They made me pull a let's show you the campus and introduce you to everyone, and I'm like, fuck, just let me go on with it. This college is only three buildings, I think I can figure it out. Joining the Arcane University was the perfect opportunity for Bethesda to do the same, and thankfully we were spared that five minute time waste. So I could have gotten up to this point, finally making it to the Arcane University without being a mage character. In fact, I could have never casted a spell in this game. At no point during the recommendations was I required to use magic. Some of them might have been made a tiny bit easier using magic, but it was never mandatory. The reason being I think is pretty obvious just after finishing the recommendations. Bethesda designed these guilds so that anyone of any build or playstyle can play through all the content. They didn't want to punish players for playing a particular way and locking them out of content. But here's the thing. The Dark Brotherhood, which is a guild of assassins, and the Thieves Guild, which by its name is pretty obvious what they are about, while sort of trying the same thing, kind of ignore that directive anyway. You can try doing those guilds without being a stealth character, but it's going to require a lot of tactics that will ruin the experience, and you're going to have some boredom and frustration as a result. Being stealthy makes those guilds easier, and more importantly, a lot more fun. The Mages Guild has none of that. You can bring your magic to the table with them, and the game goes, Oh, that's cute, but no, seriously, we got a cave of necromancers that needs clearing out. It doesn't matter in the slightest if you're a mage, an axe swinger, or a bow slinger. The recommendations had you playing the role of an intern, not a mage, and the university proper will have you playing the role of the browbeaten office drone who was hired after being a good intern who knew how all the bosses liked their coffee, and not because they were exceptionally qualified. I mention this because at this point, the aptly named Raminus Polis, which, I mean, come on, that's some sort of insinuation if I ever saw it, tells us that the Arcane University is different and, well, to spoil things, it's not. We are still not going to be required to bring our own magical talents to the table, and if that's still the case, then no, this shit isn't going to get any better. You do not yet qualify for further advancement in the guild. 
In the spirit of that, we are tasked with going and making our own mage's staff. Because it's a symbol of status and membership of the guild, and seeing how much trouble we went into recovering the girl's staff in Breville, we're led to think this thing is a big deal around here. Does that mean we will actually need this thing sometime later on? Will we need it to help us progress in a quest or complete tasks and... No, I just end up selling the thing once the quest is done. We go to the special grove where the mages tend to the special trees that yield the special wood to make our special staffs and is supposed to be an exciting and fun thing. But then we get introduced to what Bethesda truly thinks is fun for players. Fighting necromancers. Okay, I will admit necromancers are actually one of the more fun enemies in Oblivion to fight. They got a pretty diverse pool of spells they can use, doubly so if they spawn with a staff, and they will drop some menacing summons from time to time. I also like that I can sneak kill them with my bow so damn effectively, and they aren't immune to any damage types or poisons. So we can fight them any way we so choose, which is more exciting than generic creatures who just charge at you, and Deja who do the same. Necromancers will retreat and try their 2006 Bethesda AI best to throw down traps and outsmart you. That doesn't mean fighting them exclusively non-stop for an entire questline keeps them engaging. You'll grow tired of them very quickly. So we single-handedly clear out the cave, only to then get into a big brawl in the grove itself. It's not a bad sequence, but underwhelming for sure. It's more disappointing that we are denied any sort of chance of actually learning something about the guild, as that's what I was hoping this quest was going to do when I first played it back in 2007. Instead, we get a veiled dungeon crawl and an introduction to the main antagonist of the questline, which was foreshadowed during the Shaden Hall recommendation quest. It just seems premature to have them already being introduced when we still have no real attachment to the guild since we've been given no reason at all aside from the name of the guild itself. This could have been the chance to add some personality to the guild, maybe introduce the first character in the guild to treat us with some dignity. Maybe the mages of the grove are just humble, druid types who don't think much of the hoity-toity bigwigs back at the university. But no, none of that. Bethesda really believes in the inertia of the thrill of, Wow, this is the mages guild and I'm a mage. Wow, this is so cool. I'm part of a real college. I even got robes and I'm going to have a staff. So cool. We still get the wood because, you know, reporting the murder of our colleagues takes backseat to making sure we get our sweet symbol of supreme mage status. With the unenchanted staff in hand, now we go back to the guild to report what happened. Ramrod is heartbroken for about 10 seconds, and then tells us to finish making our staff. God, the tonal dissonance in this whole thing is unreal. It's shocking how blatant it is, almost as if the quest was actually two quests that got collated into one at the last minute and they didn't have time to smooth the dialogue over. I know I keep beating a well-beaten horse, but it's just everywhere. And the quests up until this point have been so mind-numbing already that all I can help but notice is the complete lack of self-awareness. Lack of self-awareness is really the only way I can summarize what we are tasked with next. Sensing the guild is in danger, Ramrod wants us to head to Skingrad and retrieve a book that was loaned to Count Hasseldor. Immediately the premise is suspect, or just plain stupid, but I'm learning to stop questioning and just let events happen. So it's off to Skingrad to meet with the Vampire Count, which is always a pain in the ass because we gotta talk to his advisor who will then go summon the Count because the Count will want to handle this matter personally. The advisor eventually tells us, Yeah, we can't have this meeting here for some reason. Go meet him in a field in the dead of night outside of town, okay? I've had suspicions. I've been getting misled since the start of this quest, but sure, I'll meet you out there since I sure as shit don't have any other options, and oh no, it's an ambush. The best part of all this is Hassador popping up out of nowhere like fucking Houdini and being the only person with any sense in all this because he basically starts calling us a moron for thinking we'd meet him under these circumstances. I really hate having characters insult my actual intelligence by assuming I'm as dumb as the limitations of the game force me to behave. And considering the weird dissonant commentary Bethesda seems to be peddling with the Mages Guild now, I take it as a personal insult because I can't help but feel this is all meant to be a joke we are supposed to be in on at this point. Hasseldor tells us there is no book. We were misled by the guild to spy on him, but fortunately he has his own house in pretty tight order and already suspected his advisor of being in cahoots with the necros. He used us as Bumpy to lure him out so he could kill him and be rid of his treasonous ass. He tells us to basically tell our guild to grow up here and accuse him directly if they suspect him of being a necromancer, rather than sending some lackey under false pretenses to spy on him. I just don't know what the guild is hoping to achieve with this whole thing aside from pissing off one of their most reliable allies. Because seeing as we were led to think this was about a book, we would never have thought to, you know, do some actual spying. What were they planning on doing? Just asking us how the Count looked that day? 
Was his face paler than normal? Did his red eyes have an evil glint in them? Also, if there was no book, surely this whole thing would have fallen apart. What was the best possible outcome here? We go, hey Hasseldor, you got this book? And he goes, nah man, they must have rented it to another vampire count. Oh, okay, no problem bro. Hey, nice hair by the way, dig the ropes. I just don't get it. So we tell Ramrod what happened and he's like, he saved your life? Shit, that's more than I would have done. Well, that's good, right? You can't possibly be a traitor. Oh, sorry I lied to you and put you in mortal danger to issue a political insult to a powerful and potentially dangerous man. How about a field trip to make it up to you? So it's off to a set of ruins of the alien variety. I'm thinking to myself, okay, maybe we will get to do some real Mage's Guild shit finally. I mean, that's what I thought back in 07. I know better now, because this is the quest where it really dawned on me. This whole guild quest line is a sick joke played at the player's expense. Bethesda tipped their hand just a little too much with this one, and that's when I went, fuck, this guild is shit, and it's intentional. We are greeted by Skaleel, who is currently sulking in these dingy ruins because Erlov, one of the big wigs sitting on the Council of Mages, is too full of himself to come and see the project himself, so he sends someone who doesn't really know anything to exist. She takes it as an insult because she seems to be a very sensitive personality type. In more clinical terms, I'd say she's at the peak of Mount Stupid of the Dunning-Kruger effect. She insists she's got real talents that are being wasted here, but considering I've yet to meet someone who actually exhibits any sort of talents or competence, or even has a pleasant personality, I'm led to doubt Scalil here is any different. Farther down in the ruins is the assistant who is just standing there awkwardly staring at the pillar he's supposed to be studying. Upon being prompted, he informs us that there are some inscriptions around the room that probably relates to the pillar, but he doesn't understand the language and needs a book to translate. Which they have in the ruins, but he doesn't want to talk to mean old Scalil. Really bro? Have you never had a job before? So already fed up with the sheer absurdity that these two numbskulls have been put in charge of an expedition, particularly an expedition in which several mages have already been hurt trying to figure out the pillar, I approach Scalil. She gives us the book, but promises she's going to get blamed when our attempts inevitably fail, and I just want to incinerate her to end her suffering at this point. Back at the pillar, we solve the puzzle all in about 20 seconds because not only did they have the manual to solve the puzzle, they also had all the spells in a convenient chest right here. It's like someone here already solved the problem, and then left because letting these two idiots access whatever is being hidden beneath a giant ancient elven locking device is probably way too dangerous for them. I wouldn't even trust them with a pestle and mortar after what I've seen from them. After carrying them the last 10 yards to the goal line, the assistant goes, Hey, do you, you know, want to go down and see what's in there? I mean, I wouldn't want to steal your thunder and all that. If there's great discoveries to be made, you should be the one to make them. To that, my eyes just narrow and I think to myself, And if there aren't any discoveries to be made, and it's just a dungeon filled with powerful and deadly ancient monsters that scared even the aliens, who did deals on the regular with Daedra, mind you, so they sealed it up for centuries. If that's the case, pray tell, will you be behind me to back me up? You know what, on second thought, I don't need you casting spells into my back and alerting the entire dungeon to our presence, so just stay here and uh, guard the entrance. And it's an undead infested dungeon, who'd a thunk? We clear it out and find an elven helmet we can't equip and then bring it back to Scalil who just goes, wow, that looks important. You should bring it back to the college because I have no idea what it could possibly be. Thank you, I appreciate the assistance. We bring it back to Erlov, who is just as clueless as Skalil, and I'm not even surprised anymore. He boots us back to Ramrod, who sends us on a mission to figure out what the deal is with Black Soul Gems. So you mean to tell me you guys have known about these things for all this time? Like, the lady in the Shadenhall Guild seemed to have a good idea what they are and what they are tied to and nobody has thought to investigate it until I became available. I'm not even surprised anymore. We go to the Mystic Archives, where the woman who took two days to figure out the big brain scratcher of a mystery back during the main quest that the first bolded letter of each paragraph in Mankar Cameron's commentary spelt out a secret passage is hard at work being overwhelmed. She immediately bites our head off for even showing up, and thankfully my expectations are subverted when I think a part of this quest will involve finding books and waiting around while she gets to reading them. But we just ask about Black Soul Gems and she goes, Oh yeah, nobody ever asked about that. There's a book in the corner there that will tell you about them. 
So the answers to a very important question is just sitting there and... I'm not even surprised anymore. We learn of the location of an altar used for a necromancy ritual, so we head over there, being the only person in the guild with functioning legs. And we just sit here watching the wait timer ticking down until eventually one night something happens and we watch a necromancer make some black soul gems. We go back to the guild and report what we saw and mission accomplished. We learn we will no longer be getting jobs from Ramrod, but instead Archmage Traffin himself. He's much less condescending and patronizing than Ramrod, but twice as clueless and it really makes sense why the guild is the way it is with this dope in charge. He tasks us with finding an informant who has been looking into the necromancer cult living among them. Now Traven fears for his safety, as he should be. I don't think the cult is nearly as incompetent as the guild and that's a dangerous thing to be betting against. We go to his last known whereabouts to meet up with some battle mages who are supposed to help us rescue the informant. Surprise, all but one are dead. Follow me! We go to his last known whereabouts to meet up with some battle mages, but there are no survivors. And it's up to us to clear out the necromancer infested dungeon. We clear it out, and oh, they turn the informant into a zombie. Well, that sucks. Guess it's just time to mercy kill him. What a waste of a quest. Literally, nothing was gained. Only my time was wasted. We go back to Traven, and he gets over the news pretty quickly. He tells us we gotta go back to Skingrad and get some info from Hasseldor, who by now has got to be more than annoyed with our constant pestering. Whatever, we go out there and Hasseldor says he'll tell us, but we gotta do something for him. Surprised, he asks? No, not in the slightest. I'm not surprised by anything in this fucking questline anymore. He wants us to clear out a cave of vampires, but more importantly get rid of a band of vampire hunters because it's bad for business having vampire hunters in a city run by a count who is a vampire. Turns out these vampire hunters are complete dicks for whatever reason, so we send them to the cave with the vampires where they proceed to kill each other but ultimately die because vampires in this game are no joke if you aren't expecting them. Is that so? Well, perhaps we'll have to pay them a little visit. Thanks for the tip, friend. I play cleanup, looting them all for some nice stuff, and report back to Hasseldor. He tells us Manamarco, the King of Worms, is back. If you're fresh on your Elder Scrolls lore, then you'll know this is one bad ombre. He's the arch nemesis of the Mage's Guild, and having him back when the leadership of the Guild is less than stellar is a problem for sure. Trevin's response is just classic. I had, perhaps foolishly, believed that necromancy was all but stamped out in Cyrodiil. It seems I couldn't have been more mistaken. Yeah man, you really couldn't have been more wrong. He tells us to go to Bruma to see what's up with the guild hall over there because he hasn't heard from the busybody guild hall leader, which is unusual. You remember Jean, the bad mage we were roped into playing a prank on. We go to the guild and find it's torched and full of stun-locking wraiths. Those quests would have been a whole lot shorter if we didn't have to fight these things. But we find Jaskar, the prankster from earlier, who is now just a traumatized cat having watched his guildmates killed and had their souls eaten by the King of Worms. This quest would have been a lot more effective if they hadn't destroyed the guild hall that was the site of one of the lamest quests in the entire chain. If I was supposed to feel some sort of emotion having seen this, then, well, it didn't work. The Bruma guild hall didn't even serve a useful purpose. Sucks to suck, I guess. We report back and once again Traven gets over his grief quite quickly, realizing the gravity of the situation, I suppose. Once again, this was just a pointless quest because we already knew the King of Worms was back. What would have been more effective is if we just didn't even have the quest before where Hasseldor tells us that Manamarco is back, instead we learn from Jaskar. That would have had at least a tiny bit more emotional something, and we could have ended the quest with some new information. Instead, Bethesda spilled the beans too soon and this quest just falls completely flat. While it turns out Traven's leadership skills are seriously lacking, we are told to come back after a couple of days as the council debates what to do. And in that time, the council collapses and everyone takes their favorite toys and runs off to hide in their dungeons. And you know what that means? More necromancy dungeons. So we are sent on not one, but two fetch quests, as if this quest line needed any more filler. Fortunately for all of you, I don't think this video needs any more filler, so I'm going to gloss over them quickly. One dungeon is just that, a necro dungeon. Kill the baddies, get the helmet, find out the idiot Erlof got himself killed, done. The second one is a little more nuanced, and I mean little as literally as I can. 
We get to the dungeon and find it's full of mages just sort of standing around eyeing us with the same enthusiasm we will find elsewhere. But here in these ruins, it just feels unnerving. I mean, more so than usual. Knowing what I know and thinking myself clever, I decide to start killing all these mages. I know they all turn on us because of course they will. With them all dead, we confront the lady who made off with the artifact, who at first thought we had come to join them in defecting to the necromancer cult. I don't really get why so many people are willing to defect to such an unknown cause. Do all these people really want to just play with dead bodies that much? I don't get it, and our enemies' motivations are never explained, except the King of Worms, who just wants to destroy the guild because that's been his fetish for the past few centuries. I'd like to have you mostly intact, so Menemarco can suck the marrow from your bones. Anyways, she turns on us, and so does her bodyguards. We kill them, get the amulet back, and prepare to stroll out of the dungeon unaccosted, but the game goes, Nah, not so fast. You thought you tricked me, and wouldn't you know it, all the mages we killed are respawned as necromancers now. I'm seriously just not even remotely surprised anymore. We gotta kill them all over again before leaving. We bring the items back to Traven, who is just beside himself. Erlov is dead, and one of the council members was a necro the entire time. He wants us to go to a special ruin to get a colossal black soul gem that has been prepared for Manamarco to carry out his evil plans. So we go there and find three battle mages who had been scoping the place out waiting for an opportunity to attack. We are put in charge of dictating their tactics, and I just have no idea why this was even something they bothered to write in script. It's just so stupid. They each explain what method of combat they are most effective with, and we are given a choice to have them be close to the entrance of the place or hang back. This isn't a real brain scratcher. One says she's good with an axe, one says she's good with long range spells, and the other says he's good with swords and healing spells. Even if you screw up somehow, who really cares? Once we get the chance, we head into the ruins, and then it's just yet another necromancer filled dungeon crawl. We're actually hunting down the former head of the Shaden Hall Mages Guild, the one with the black soul gems. I guess they wanted to make this all come full circle or something, but honestly, I didn't even notice it was him until I read it on the wiki, so once again, who cares? Loot the big soul gem and head back to the guild for our final quest. Finally. As here Traven does something really unexpected, and I mean that sincerely. He sets himself on fire and kills himself, trapping his own soul in the gem because it was designed for his own soul. Doing this makes it so that we won't get turned into a thrall because... who knows. He then promotes us to Archmage because it's the end of the questline and that means we have to be made the head of the guild now. I've stopped asking questions at this point. Rest in peace, Traven. I'm sure you won't be missed. We go to Manamarco's hideout, the location of which I don't even remember having learned, but I guess that's just not important. What is important is going through yet another necromancer cave. This one is extremely straightforward. We go to see the king of worms who just stands there gloating, fails to turn us into a thrall, and very quickly gets his shit kicked in and dies. The end. We go back to the guild to tell Ramrod what happened, seeing as he's like the senior most member left alive. He's like, oh cool, Manamarco's dead. Shame about everyone else, but business as usual. Guess that means we both get promotions out of this, right? Oh, by the way, you're the Archmage now, which means jack shit. You can use the Archmage's quarters, and the chest in there duplicates alchemy ingredients. Okay, bye. That's the end of the Mage's Guild. Very climactic and satisfying. I, uh... I have a lot of thoughts about the Mage's Guild. Almost none of them positive. I'm more just dumbfounded by the entire thing from start to finish. It's all just so nonsensical, I almost don't know where to start. On the one hand, we got a very weak-ass, ancient, powerful necromancer trying to destroy the guild completely out of nowhere. And on the other, we have a guild filled with incompetence that seem to hasten their own destruction. The analogies to white-collar tedium and petty, corrupt, soul-crushing institutions are everywhere, to the point that I just think this was the whole point of the guild. They were supposed to be obnoxious, the quests were meant to feel like a waste. I just don't see any other conclusion that can be made. This questline is just so bad that it has to be aware of itself. And if that's the case, why on earth would they have gone with such a take? Was this just a rushed guild? 
were they going to go with something else and it just got canned before there was time to make a new questline so a self-aware commentary on the incompetence of major institutions was the best they could cobble together? That's my best guess, my only guess. Because in a game filled with mediocre quests, this whole chain was abnormally terrible. The structure of the guild, from all the smaller halls to the actual university, the recommendation quests to the main quests, none of this is inherently bad. It makes sense that a giant institution like this would have processes and stuff, but the fact that every second of it is one miserable slog with necromancer dungeon after the next dominating half the quests, the fact that you barely do anything that feels even related to magic, and instead has you playing the role of office intern. The quests don't even react to you using magic solutions, or even thoughtful solutions. A pure mage player or a player who refuses to cast even a single spell will have the exact same experience. What a waste of potential, and a waste of the player's time. Let's move on. The Fighter's Guild is up next. I used to think it was the worst of the bunch, but after playing the Mage's Guild again, no, it's definitely not the worst. It's close, but at least has moments. In truth, it's just incredibly bland and forgettable. I have no intentions of lingering on it to dissect every week dungeon crawl quest, so let's just blast right through it. Everyone likes to mention the first quest, a rat problem, as one of the standout quests in the line. This quest has you going to some crazy old bat's house in Anvil under the assumption that she wants to get rid of the rats in her basement. Well, you know what they say about assumptions. That's right! Rats in my basement! And something has been killing them! It's horrible! My poor babies! You must do something! I don't know what I'd do without them. Their little pink noses, their scaly little tails. Please get to the basement and find out what's happening! So we gotta get rid of the mountain lions killing her beloved rats. If they're out here, they'll be in this area. I can't imagine there are more than four of them. Let's take care of this. We get sent on a wild goose chase and eventually find out it was her neighbor who just wanted the rats gone. She didn't mean to lure mountain lions into town because, you know, starving mountain lions prowling the streets are probably more dangerous than some domesticated rats locked in a basement. We end up saving the rats and that's it, we collect our pay and go home. It's this sort of disconnected contract work that makes up the bulk of your time in the Fighters Guild. The Mages Guild felt like it was entirely filler from the first mission to the last, nothing really stand out except for the quests that had some thin story tossed over it to make the dungeon crawls and boring errands feel connected. Fighters Guild retains a lot of that legacy of filler content, but not to the same extent, and at least here it has some reasoning. The Fighters Guild are basically mercenaries, and a lot of mercenary work is just the oddball job some local needs help with. You do the job, you get paid, and it's on to the next job. We get our quest from three people in the guild, the leader of the Shaden Hall branch, the leader of the Anvil branch, and Madrin, who I think is the second in command of the guild or something. I don't really know, mostly because the game gave me no reason to care about the structure of the guild at all. The Fighter's Guild feels like a guild in name only. As much as I bitched about the Mage's Guild, it at least felt like one. The structure made sense, there was a purpose to the halls, aside from the Bruma chapter which gets torched anyway. The Arcane University centralizes the entire operation. Apparently, the Coral Hall is the main hall for the Fighters Guild, but that's only because that's where the Guildmaster's office is. It feels arbitrary, but the existence of the halls in general feel arbitrary. I don't know if we even go into the Guild Hall in Skingrad or Graville. Not only that, the halls really offer nothing except some trainers and a place to sleep. When it comes to accommodations, the Fighters Guild really offers nothing, and asks too much for us to believe that this is supposed to be a highly organized operation that has a lot to offer its members. The distinction between the three quest givers is important, because unless the quests are coming from Modrin, the main story of the quest line isn't progressing. Modrin's quests all revolve around a rival mercenary company moving into Leowin, calling themselves the Blackwood Company. These guys are making a reputation for taking the shady contracts, the Fighters Guild is too honorable and legitimate to touch. Unfortunately, this is costing the guild contracts and our fellow guildmates are starting to feel that crunch. I can't really blame them, 100 gold for doing dangerous work is a joke of a reward. 
As you level up, that goes up, but because of how everything scales and is relative, we'll never be making worthwhile money from these jobs. And you can forget about special rewards like gear, this is a cash-only endeavor. But only Modrin gives the interesting quests, because as it turns out, a rat problem is the only creative and interesting one you'll get that isn't a story quest. The rest are just half-baked dungeon dives for this manufactured reason or that. After coming out of the Mage's Guild, these dungeon dives have gotten really stale. And when I say Modrin gives the interesting quests, I only mean that relatively speaking. The quests still usually devolve into a dungeon crawl, but they at least are bookmarked by some thought-provoking dialogue. I mean that with the biggest asterisk possible. The mystery of the Blackwood Company is teased for way too long in an attempt to pad out the questline more. It starts picking up in the last hour or so of the questline, but gets interrupted by a couple more filler quests before reaching its conclusion. I'm not going to go through all the quests like I did for the Mage's Guild because really, there's just not much here. The guild is 80% unrelated side quests that are just not interesting in the least bit. Not to play, not to watch, and definitely not to discuss. A lot of the quote unquote story quests just involve your guildmates complaining there's no work to do and that the Blackwood Company is stealing all the contracts. When we start to investigate the Blackwood Company, things finally start picking up, but that's not until the 11th hour of the questline. Anyway, we are sent to investigate the Blackwood Company after we kidnap and torture a Blackwood Company member by subjecting him to the speechcraft mechanics until he buckles. We find out they have a history in their hall from Blackmarsh, and they all drink its sap to give them strength. We are sent to go join up, which they don't question because people have been defecting from the Fighters Guild in droves recently because there's no work. So we get to take part in an initiation process and drink some of the hiss sap and black out, waking up in a village with a goblin problem. We slay all the goblins and pass out again, waking up in Modrin's house, who tells us we were found by our fighters guild guildmates passed out in the street. So is the Blackwood company onto us? If that's the case, why did they let us go? Or are they just in the habit of letting their members pass out on the streets after drinking his sap and doing a job? Once again, this just doesn't make any sense, but whatever. Modrin says this doesn't make any sense, so we should go see the village. There's supposed to be a bunch of dead NPCs, but my game bugged out, so their bodies were gone. What happened was the hissat made the villagers look like the goblins I was killing, and I guess this explains how they get people to stomach doing the dirty work. But this is never reinforced because all the people we meet from the Blackwood Company are just total dicks who act like bandits, including the guy whose ass I tried protecting because he had fallen on hard times and had a family. He turns out to be a piece of shit and we are forced to kill him, I guess teaching us the important lesson to never be merciful in this game. But if I was to believe these guys needed hallucinogens to carry out their dirty work, the game failed to convince me. We're then sent back to the Blackwood Company to confront them and then destroy the Hiss Tree. It's a quick brawl that ends with us destroying the pump and lighting the tree on fire. It's a neat little scene that provides one of the few standout moments of the questline. The Guildmaster berates us and then promotes us because she realizes she's been a total dunce and because of her inability to acknowledge the threat of the Blackwood Company, a lot of people died and her guild almost imploded. She, uh, she does a smart thing and recognizes she's out of her element. Just like with the Mage's Guild, apparently it's preferable for the guild to operate with an absent leader, aka the player, as opposed to someone who manages to make all the wrong calls all the time and doesn't realize until the guild faces a massive existential crisis. It's crazy that I spent six times the words talking about the Mage's Guild as opposed to the Fighter's Guild when I think the Fighter's Guild is better. That's just because the Mage's Guild was so bad, there was almost an endless amount to discuss. The Fighters Guild is just a bland collection of busy work. It's not insulting to the player's intelligence or anything, it just doesn't ask the player to believe in what it's setting up. It just exists, and it's done just as soon as it starts to overstay its welcome. There's really nothing to discuss about such a questline. So let's start talking about a guild that has a lot more going on. It's a bit of a toss-up between which guild is my personal favorite, the Thieves Guild or the Dark Brotherhood. I rank the Thieves Guild just a little bit lower because its story doesn't really get good until near the end, while the Dark Brotherhood is consistently great the whole way through. Regardless, I hold the Thieves Guild in extremely high regard, especially when compared to the previous two guilds and the main story in general. Unlike the previous two guilds, the Thieves Guild can't just be joined on a whim. For starters, they aren't even really a guild, as they don't have a guild hall or any real central leadership, save for the Grey Fox and a few Doyens. It's more like a network of criminal contacts that share information and coordinate for certain things, but they all cooperate and offer their protection to each other. 
It's a very cool and intelligent structure, and Bethesda actually portrays it exceptionally well. You're always meeting contacts in secret locations, or in someone's house, or in public with the guise of hiding in plain sight. It's a very exclusive club, but once you're in, you'll occasionally find someone in a city who recognizes you as a guild member and greets you with secret greetings and lots of innuendo to your shared membership. This illusion is not once, as far as I've ever seen, broken once it's established, and it makes the guild feel very consistent, and it's just very well executed. The Thieves' Guild is all about mystery, secrecy, rumors, and misdirection. That tone is established before you even find the guild, and it stays true all the way to the end. So, the first challenge is joining the guild in the first place. You may want to join even if you don't know about the quest line and such, because NPCs will mention this is the best way to sell stolen goods. Or you might see that tip on the loading screens. There's a few different ways to learn about and join the guild. My preferred way is just to get a bounty and then get caught and serve a sentence in jail. Once free, a representative will contact us after a little while and tell us about a meeting in the Waterfront District. Another way is to look at the wanted posters for the Grey Fox posted around the Imperial City and then ask NPCs and beggars until eventually one of them will spill the beans if they have a high enough disposition. Either way, the ticket is the meeting in the Waterfront District, which will only happen once we learn about it. We can't just go there one random night and wait. Once there, we are greeted by two prospective recruits and Armand Christophe, the local guild representative, or Doyen as they are referred to in the guild. He proposes a contest to see who's the best thief, and whoever wins will be the one joining that night. He gives only two instructions. Steal the diary of a local man living in the Imperial City, and do not murder anyone in the process. Everything else is up to us and fair game, including stealing the book from each other. The complete freedom to this quest is the first thing that immediately sets it apart from anything else we've seen yet. No other quest, especially guild quests, told us what it wanted us to get, and specifically said the specifics are up to us to decide. This is not an anomaly. In fact, this will be the norm for both the Thieves' Guild and the Dark Brotherhood going forward. In fact, the Thieves' Guild has some of the most open-ended quests in the game, and this is the fairly obvious secret to why the quest worked so damn well. We managed to beat the other thief participating in this contest before she could snatch it, but even if she did manage to beat us to the punch, we would have had plenty of opportunities to steal it back from her. And even failing that, there would be a second quest that isn't a contest that just charges us with stealing a sword from our shopkeeper's house. Once again, another open-ended objective. But we were quick on the scene, and with the diary in tow, we head back to Kristoff for entry into the guild. He inducts us into the guild proper, and introduces us to the way things work in the guild. Starting off, we only have Ungar and Bruma to act as our fence. We can only sell our stolen goods to him, and he's out of the way and low on gold. But we need to fence a certain amount of gold to unlock new quests in the guild, encouraging some independent thievery between quests. Of course, I'd just like to get it all done at once, knowing I only need 1k gold fence to unlock every quest in the game. So we spend a couple of nights raiding a few locations in the Imperial City and call it a day. But it's great that if you're playing an actual thief, the guild itself encourages more of it, as opposed to the Mage's Guild, which is entirely ambivalent to whatever you do when not doing Mage's Guild quests. Kristoff also can sell us lockpicks and pay off bounties at a discount, but I rarely rack up bounties and I got the skeleton keys, so lockpicks are a non-issue now. But still, it's neat to have an option like this built into the guild for this type of play. It gives tons of reasons for a thief player to join the guild and rank up. As you rank up, you gain access to more fences in different cities who all have more money. Kristoff then gives us our next job, which involves stealing tax proceeds and the relevant records from one of the biggest watch captains in the Imperial City. These funds were taken from the poorest people of the Waterfront, who the Grey Fox intends to refund. This quest introduces us to one of the main antagonists of the Thieves' Guild early on, Hieronymus Lex, and starts to set the Grey Fox up as more of a Robin Hood type than a career criminal, as the Imperial Guard is leading the people to think. This quest is more complicated than the previous, as it requires us to rob the city guards as opposed to some random dude's house. Rightfully so, this quest requires us to scope out the guard tower, which we are allowed to enter the first floor of, but none of the other floors without trespassing. Hanging around the first level lets us see the comings and goings of the different guards, and this is awesome because it uses Bethesda's Radiant AI to dictate when the guards change shifts. Using what we're seeing and a little logic, we pick a time that is a likely good time to get our sneak on, and we head up to the restricted areas. There's no quest marker to tell us where the item actually is hidden, so we gotta do some poking around to find the stash. We locate the documents and the gold in Lex's desk, so we swipe it and beeline it out of there. Stealing from the city guard is an audacious thing for a new thief to attempt, and while the quest isn't exactly that difficult, it still feels rewarding because of that context. 
context such as this is what the other two guilds in the main story was so badly lacking. Which is why none of what we'd been doing in those quest lines felt like it mattered. It's incredible how much just a little context and rational motivation can elevate a simple quest such as this. Back at the waterfront, we give the goods to Kristoff and he's pleased. Next, he wants us to nick a statuette of a deceased woman in Shaden Hall for an unnamed buyer. Once again, simple premise, but all we are told is to go get the thing and don't kill anyone. The rest is entirely up to us. So the first order of business, as usual, is finding the location of the thing, which is easy enough to locate if we just ask a beggar about the statuette. We learn it's in the chapel under Croft, so that's where we head. Crypt itself is a rather simple location, but it's guarded 24-7, so sneaking is, as to be expected, the name of the game here. There's plenty of shadows and things to hide behind, so getting through is easy enough. Once we got the statuette, we just sneak back out and head back to the waterfront district. Upon arrival, we find the whole place is swarming with guards who are running around trying to find Kristoff, who has been accused of stealing the statuette. Clearly something is afoot, and upon asking some fellow thieves, they reveal Kristoff has gone underground to avoid arrest. This is all a ruse by Kristoff to flush out an informant in the guild, and now they know Mavrino Arano is compromised and she needs to be taken out. This being the Thieves Guild and not the Dark Brotherhood just means pinning the theft on her. We head to the waterfront and break into her house, planting the bust in her house, and then alerting Lex that she's the thief. Requires a lot of convincing, which for me just means bribing him because I got more money than the Pope at this point, and eventually Lex trusts us enough to at least go and check it out. He's very reluctant to believe us because Arano has been feeding him information for a while now, so it doesn't quite add up why she'd be the thief. But when he gets there, he finds the bust and places her under arrest, assuming she was formulating some sort of conspiracy to cover her own misdeeds. With the informant in custody and the matter of the stolen bust now settled, things can continue as usual. We are rewarded and then told our time with Kristoff has come to an end and it's time for us to report to our new doyen in Reville. Scriva is our new quest giver in Breville, who likes to spend most of her days either reading at home or at the Lonely Suitor Lodge living a rather unassuming life, all in an attempt to keep her role in the guild a guarded secret. It lends her character some interesting depth which really didn't require much work on the developer's part, but makes Scriva seem like she has her shit in order and that's why she's in charge around here. Someone like this is someone I want to be working for, not an imbecile like Traven, whose greatest contributions to our efforts to save his own guild was killing himself. Scriva gives us a job. Go to Leowin and help a former guild member deal with a freelance thief who stole a valuable ring from her. So we head over to the swampy city and start poking around until we find out where our contact, Adarji, is located. We find her and get the full scoop, an Argonian freelance thief, Amusei, stole the ring. She wants blood for this, but we aren't at liberty to oblige, so she just asks for us to make him suffer. Apparently Adarji has a hatred for Argonians, and other people in town will make mention of this from time to time. Which is something I mentioned the game lacked in my previous video. I noted Oblivion was lacking in the racial tensions department. Little did I know, the Thieves Guild of all places had this. So, the designer of the Thieves Guild not only worked to make the guild itself fleshed out and logical, they also went out of their way to add some depth to their own characters to use them to create more depth in the world itself. That's some serious effort when, once again, none of the other quest lines up until this point even bothered to interact with the world, let alone add to that world. We go back to the beggars who mention Amusei has been arrested for trying to swindle a countess. Yeah, we got him here. Argonians aren't allowed visitors though. Countess Alicia's orders. She's the thing about the lizard folk. Amusei, you say? <laughs> I thought you wanted to, to see Amu Day. He's off limits. Amusei, though, is just down the hall. Uh, make it quick. We gain access to the prisoner who turns out to be the Argonian we had met trying to join the Thieves Guild with us earlier. In exchange for a lockpick, he tells us that the ring, in fact, belongs to the Countess, so she locked him up after he tried to ransom the ring back to her, with the ring now in her possession again. We are supposed to go back to Adarji to avoid a quest-breaking bug, but uh, I didn't know that and went straight to asking around the castle about the ring and the Countess. It's not a big deal, being on PC I was able to unstuck the quest when it did bug out, but I missed out on a conversation with Adarji when she said she'd buy the ring back from us if we managed to get it back, and that Amusei is a stupid lizard for trying to sell the thing because the ring lets Adarji read the secret letters of the Countess, which is information she then sells. So yeah, he done goofed trying to sell the ring off. Once again, we find ourselves dealing with a guild member who knows what she's doing and has a nice little gig going. 
Proving this guild has its fair share of clever schemers, and not just people who we are meant to believe are the best at what they do simply because they are members of the guild, and their credentials aren't meant for us to question. Anyway, in the castle we find a bribable mouth who tells us the Countess only takes the ring off when she retires for the night and places it in a jewelry box beside her bed. At least, this lady is supposed to be in the castle. But here's where the bugs start kicking in and she's wandering the countryside for some reason. She tells us a secret passageway into the private chambers of the Countess, the same passage that someone else says is used to transport Argonians to a torture chamber. So there's some serious racism towards Argonians in this town, once again, adding to the world. We sneak into the castle and use the passageways as described, but here's a quest-breaking bug, the ring isn't actually in the box. I eventually figure out my folly and just use some console commands to fix the quest, and away we go. Back to Adarji, who thanks us and hopes we made the filthy Argonians suffer, as she says. Personally, I got no problems with Argonians, but damn, does this make Leowin look like less than an ideal place for my lizard friends. Back in Breville, we get our reward and complete the quest. Our next job is sending us back to the Imperial City. Things with our old friend Hieronymus Lex is starting to heat up again. They are turning over the waterfront looking for the Grey Fox, Armand Christophe is under house arrest, and many of our fellow guildmates are either arrested or in hiding. We gotta make contact with one of the local thieves there and coordinate a retaliation. We meet up with Methrodel, who is coordinating a giant synchronized theft spree. Five high-profile thefts at five locations in the city at the same time. The logic being, Lex will be recalled to shore up security in those other parts of the city, and won't have the resources to maintain the occupation of the waterfront. A neat little plan. Our involvement is to steal a staff from the Archmage's quarters, which is, uh, well, we are the Archmage. So, okay. We are to steal from ourselves, then. Yeah, this part wasn't very thought out, I guess. So, we just walk into our own quarters, take the staff that wasn't there last time we were here, and then we leave a note in our own nightstand for nobody to discover. And then we just walk out, no questions asked. Well done, I guess. Methodel seems to think so, and has us go to the waterfront and see when Lex gets recalled. So we do, and Lex is ordered back by the mages when a Dramora messenger appears. A uh, not so subtle choice of messengers, especially considering we just had an oblivion invasion and the guild was almost destroyed by necromancers who loved conjuring Daedra. Methodel then has us return the staff to the guild, but not by bringing it back to the university because that would arouse suspicion. Instead, we are to leave it in the house of a retired guild member and hope they receive the message that this was only business and the guild means no harm to the mages guild. Once again, we are the archmage, so none of this would be a problem, but okay then. It's only a simple matter of asking the beggars where the mage lives, breaking into his house at night, and depositing the staff in a chest while he sleeps and slipping out. Once we're done, it's back to prevail for our reward. I don't know. I really like this quest on paper, but the execution is very wonky thanks to us being the Archmage. I get the feeling this quest was made before it was decided the player would become the Archmage. It actually makes me think the Mage's Guild was one of the later questlines designed, maybe even the last, or maybe it was just undergoing a sudden redesign. Because I can't see someone taking what must have been days of work to make this quest without once someone going, hey, you know the player can be the Archmage, right? It would also explain why the Mages Guild was so shit, while the Thieves Guild was... so good. If they made the Thieves Guild early on, it would have had more time before Crunch rolled in. I have no evidence to back me up, just a hunch based off of a few quests, but it's not all unheard of for something like this to happen. And it's a pretty simple explanation for why we got such wildly different levels of quality in these quest lines. The next quest is a special one, relevant to the Grey Fox himself. Scriva asks us to go to Skingrad and look for a thief who has failed to complete his task. He was charged with stealing a book, but he never returned and now they are sending us to find the book and the thief if we can. A quick word with the ever-knowledgeable beggars has us learning of the thief's arrest after he bragged about the heist at a bar. So once again, we are in need of gaining access to the guarded dungeons of a castle. We're a bit suspicious of strangers here. Don't give us anything to be suspicious about, will you please? No, but it will earn you two years in Skingrad's dungeon. Now get lost before I decide to report you. Trying our luck to bribe our way in a second time yields much less success this time around, though. It turns out there's a ton of ways to get to those cells. One way actually involves us getting hired as a servant in the castle. 
Uh, unfortunately, I didn't know that this was an option. Instead, went with what my journal hinted at and got myself arrested for a petty theft. Somebody, stop! You violated the law. Pay the court a fine or... Hope you rot, criminal scum. Once inside, we see that there's only one prisoner here and he's not the thief we we're looking for. He tells us prisoners are taken by the Pale Lady and our thief had been taken days ago and hasn't been seen since. A recent Argonian prisoner was just taken and was bleeding as he was dragged off. So after serving our day in jail, we sneak back into the dungeons and begin following the trail of blood through the castle. The trail ends in a torture dungeon where the Pale Lady, who in fact turns out to be a vampire harvesting the blood of prisoners, attacks us. We slay her and find our dear old friend Amuse locked up again. Across the way is the corpse of our thief and no sign of the book. Amuse tells us he has a message the thief asked him to deliver to the guild if he was to die. We help Amuse escape the dungeons in exchange for the message, which turns out to be the location of the book he had stolen. It's weird to think that this is probably the first death of anyone or anything in this entire questline so far, and it was over a book. I was so used to slaying enemies and creatures in all the other quests and random NPCs dying here and there that I'd become numb to it and just stopped thinking about it. But the death of this thief, even with it happening off screen, actually has some weight and importance to it. It's a testament to the less is more approach to storytelling. Amuse says he's going to try joining the guild again, thanking us for sparing him from becoming vampire food. We go get the book and bring it back to our doyen in Breville, finishing the quest. It's time for Lex to go, according to the Grey Fox. He's been a thorn in the side of the guild for too long, and it turns out that the Countess of Anvil is in need of a new guard captain. The Grey Fox wants him reassigned so as to keep him out of their business in the Imperial City. Once again, they aren't assassins, and killing or ruining an honorable guard captain isn't what the guild is about. The plan is to replace the list of recommendations the steward of the Countess has drawn up with a forged list that highly favors Lex. So once in Anvil, we find the nearest information kiosk that tells us that we need to get into the desk of the steward, and that the castle blacksmith might be able to help us gain access to that part of the castle. So we go meet the blacksmith who turns out to be a guild member, and he shows us a secret passage to let us slip inside. So under cover of night, we raid the desk for the original list and sneak out. With the aid of the kiosk again, we are able to enlist the services of a stranger who lives in an abandoned shack as a forger. He's very standoffish, but agrees to do the forgery. After a day, we return to pay him and get the forged letter with our boy Lex at the top. Then it's just a simple matter of sealing it with the Imperial Seal back in the Imperial City. This isn't actually as simple as it sounds because the area is full of guards, but with some patience and luck we can get the letter sealed and then it's just the matter of delivering it to the Countess who agrees Lex is the right man for the job. She asks us to deliver his transfer notice, so we have to back to the Imperial City and deliver the transfer order to an unamused Lex. But being the honorable guard that he is, he does not protest to the transfer and concedes defeat by the Great Fox. Scriva tells us, good job, Lex won't be a problem for the guild anymore and we are rewarded and promoted. Maybe fate will be kind and deliver him to me in Anvil. From this point on, we will be working for the Grey Fox directly. Every so often when we are waiting around in one of the cities, a messenger will appear to tell us where to meet the Grey Fox. Methodel eventually appears and tells us to meet him in a guildmate's house in Bruma. So we do, and I really love the conversations with the Grey Fox. He's such a smooth character, very mild-mannered and sophisticated. And it doesn't at all seem like his status as the most wanted criminal in all of Tamriel gets to his head. It's no wonder his organization runs so smoothly, and once again I can't help but draw comparisons to the Mage's Guild and the Fighter's Guild, which were both just so dysfunctional with terribly bland or outright idiotic leaders. It almost feels like they were designed that way to contrast with the criminal organizations in order to say something about Cyrodiil itself, but I think that's just reading into things a little too much. So the fox tasks us with stealing Sevilla's stone, which is kept under guard at a secret monastery by retired moth priests who have been blinded from years of reading Elder Scrolls. Stealing from a bunch of blind monks doesn't sound so hard, so we head up to the mountains where we bribe our way into the sanctuary where the priests live in total darkness. Fortunately, they are very keen of hearing and are surrounded by other guardians and traps, so sneaking through the large dungeon turns out to be more involved than one would expect. But like the rest of the quest, some good skills, patience, and luck eventually sees us successful, and we are able to slip out with a stone in tow. Back in Bruma, we deliver the stone to the Grey Fox, who expresses great joy at having the stone. 
He claims it will help him see past the defenses of the Imperial Palace and that he's glad the Emperor had no idea the priests were sitting on this artifact otherwise he would have had it destroyed or confiscated. This starts to shed light on the scheme the fox is hatching but before he says anything else he insists that we part ways for now. We meet back up in another house in Coral after Amusei, who now has joined the guild and is actually a trusted assistant to the Great Fox, delivers the request to meet up. This time he gives us the task of acquiring the Arrow of Extrication, an arrow capable of unlocking doors. This item had just been acquired by the court wizard in Breville. Asking the beggars once again reveals the fact that the wizard has a secret passage leading to a secret lair where he conducts secret experiments that are too dangerous to be done in the city. So, for the fourth time, we are sneaking around in a castle looking for hidden passageways. We eventually find our way to the secret tunnels, which are a nightmare labyrinth of twisting tunnels, some of them underwater, and they are infested with necromancers, conjurers, and daedro. After uh, getting lost down there for quite a while, we manage to get to the court wizard's tower, though it seems he doesn't mind our presence as we are both members of the Mage's Guild. Once again, our membership in the Mage's Guild causes a weird issue with this questline. Fortunately, nothing breaks as a result, and we are free to just take the Arrow of Extrication, or the head of it, anyhow. That's all there is of it, and the Grey Fox notes he will need it repaired once we turn it over to him. He's about to reveal his plan, but cuts himself off, and then we part ways waiting for the next time we meet. It's not long until we are in another house in Shadenhall, receiving another task from the Fox. This time he has us retrieving the boots of spring Jack, once belonging to a famous thief of the same name who lived 300 years ago. The Grey Fox points us to the last known living descendant of spring Jack, a nobleman in the Imperial City who goes by the name Jacobin, Earl of Imbel. Asking around the city reveals his house and the fact that he's a strange man who keeps odd hours as a night owl. Upon breaking into his house, we find a book, but it doesn't reveal the location of the boots, so we are forced to confront him directly. It's pretty obvious at this point that the man is a vampire and hides his affliction from the public. He cowers us and tells us the boots are in the family crypt in the basement, and he's always been too afraid to venture down there himself. Going down there, we see why, as it's full of vampires. We get to the coffin of the famous Jack, only to find the boots aren't in there, only a journal that reveals he never actually died, but instead became a vampire. That vampire now goes by the name Jackbin. Once this is revealed to us, Jackbin, aka spring Jack, comes down to greet us with a claymore and full armor, and we are forced to kill him, taking the boots off his body. He tells us we should prepare for one final heist, as the risks are high, but the reward will be more than worth all this trouble. We then part ways. When we meet up next in the Imperial City, the Grey Fox finally reveals his plans. Stealing an Elder Scroll from the Imperial Palace Library. This isn't to be sold, but for the notoriety, and because he has plans for the scroll. The plan is a long and intricate one that he's been developing for years, and with Sevilla's stone, he was able to figure out the last few parts to make it all possible. All the jobs we've been doing for him have been to prepare for this grand heist. Naturally, we agree to it, and I'll just let the Grey Fox himself explain the details. The Elder Scrolls are kept in the Imperial Palace, behind a door that cannot be breached. Sevilla's stone has revealed a path around this door. You will have to travel the old way. Once used as an escape route for Imperial Emperors, it has been forgotten for centuries. To unseal the entrance, we must sneak into the basement of the palace and activate the Glass of Time, whatever that is. In the Imperial Sewers, here is the key for the gate to that section of the sewers. I picked the pocket of Okato himself to get it. My scrying with Sevilla's stone has provided clues, but not the details. I know the tools you will need there, but not the obstacles themselves. The boots of spring Hill Jack will allow you to leap to an unreachable place. They will also protect you from a long fall. The arrow of extrication is the only way to unlock the final door. Take them both. Once you're inside the palace itself, you need to find the reading room. The blind priests will deliver a scroll to you there. I arranged for the notable Celia Cameron to want to read a particular Elder Scroll. Don't ask how. However, she will be unavoidably detained. You will take her place. Do not speak to the priests. They're blindfolded and will not realize it isn't her unless you speak. Sounds complicated enough. 
Keeping in the spirit of the whole quest line up until this point, we know the vague details but none of the specifics, and it will be up to us to improvise on the spot as we go. The job is ours now, and it's time to pull our final heist. I can hardly believe it. The odds were clearly against you. Capital job. Capital. By the time I got to this quest, my skills had leveled up enough to remove a great deal of the difficulty from it. But if I'm being honest, this quest isn't about the challenge. It's about the context of the whole thing. We are stealing by far the most valuable item in the world now. It's simply epic. It feels like we've been preparing for this job ever since we joined up with the guild. We've built up our standing in the guild and proven our skills and loyalty to be entrusted with such a task for the fox himself. His offer of something much greater than mere gold for this job entices us in just the right way, but the experience of pulling this heist in of itself is a reward. The lengthy crawl through the sewers is definitely more tedious than it ought to have been, especially since the sewers are just a confusing maze of similar looking quarters and chambers filled with undead enemies and goblins. Not exactly the sort of enemies that are easy or fun to try and outsmart. But I love how we've been pulling jobs in the civilized surface of the city for a while. And now we get to see a different side of the city. A side that is mostly abandoned and forgotten. It makes it feel like you're exploring ancient secrets, even if these are all spaces we've seen a billion times at this point, filled with enemies we've fought twice as much. But I can't stress enough the power of proper context for quests. I was a little frustrated and lost, sure, but once the sewer bit ended and we found ourselves in the old way that felt very similar to the introduction of the game where we were sneaking through the sewers with the Emperor, it had that satisfying coming full circle vibe that this whole quest radiates with. And then the old Imperial basement level goes into an alien ruin segment and by this point we'd seen enough of these for the mystique to have worn off. Once again, it's the context of its placement. These are alien ruins beneath the Imperial City, and if there was any lingering doubt that the Imperial City had in fact been built by the Elves, then this ought to eliminate those doubts once and for all. It's a brilliant touch that reinforces the feeling that what we are seeing no one has seen in centuries. We bring the scroll back to the Grey Fox, who instructs us to bring a ring to the Countess of Anvil because he wants to see how she reacts, signaling that there is just one last mystery left to sort out in this quest. We agree, as weird as it may seem. When in Anvil we do so, she tells us it belongs to her long-lost husband whose identity she can't quite figure out, and by this point the mystery should be clear. I'll let the sequence explain the final bit. By the power of the Elder Scrolls, I name Emmer Dereloth as the true thief of Nocturnal's Cow. You're the Grey Fox? I've been betrayed! I am the Grey Fox, but you have not been betrayed. But... I am also your missing husband, Corvus. Corvus? Is it really you? Ten years I've waited for word from you. Why did you hide from me? Ten years ago I inherited this cow from the former guildmaster of the Thieves' Guild. I became the new guildmaster. But I also received its curse. Whoever wears Nocturnal's cow shall have his name stricken from history. Once I donned the cowl, no one in all of Tamriel could recognize me. With the cowl, I became the Grey Fox. Without it, 
I was a stranger, even to you. You mean you were unable to return? I've stood right next to you, and you didn't even know it. I cried out to you, here I am, it's me, Corvus. But you just looked at me, confused. You have broken my heart for a second time. I cannot let the infamous criminal mastermind, the Grey Fox, become the Count of Anvil. If you try to announce yourself as Corvus, I will deny you. I will deny you before the Emperor if I have to. I guessed you would say these terrible things to me. That is why I brought my friend along. From this moment forward, I renounce my life of crime forever. I'm passing the Grey Cowl of the Thieves' Guild to its new Guild Master. There's a lot to unpack here, but essentially all the rumors we have heard about the Grey Fox were partly true because the Grey Fox is an identity created by the magic of the Cowl itself. The person bequeathed with it would lose their identity to anyone else and could only be seen as the Grey Fox, explaining how he's been around for 300 years. The original Guildmaster had stolen the Grey Cowl from Nocturnal herself, which was the source of the curse leading to the chain of events Corvus described, which we witnessed ourselves during the quests. With the curse finally lifted and the pages of time altered once more, Corvus renounces his title as Guildmaster and passes it and the curse lifted Cowl over to us staying true to his promise that the reward would be greater than mere gold, bringing to a satisfying close the Thieves Guild questline. There's so much in this questline that makes it one of the best experiences in the game. As I said in the beginning, the entire Thieves Guild is all about mystery, secrecy, rumors, and misdirection. Bethesda establishes this thematic tone about the guild before you even join it. Hell, when I first played Oblivion, I didn't even think the guild was real. That tone is carried all the way through to the end when it is given a fitting and thematically sound conclusion. All the mysteries surrounding the guild. What is the guild? Who is in it? How do you join it? How do they operate? Who is the leader? Is the Grey Fox real? Who started the guild? Are the rumors about the Grey Fox true? All of these questions we learn the answers to over the course of the questline, and they are all set up before we even knew if the guild was even real, or just a figment of people's imagination. Not a single question is left unanswered, and they are all answered in a satisfying way. By the end of the guild, we understand its structure, the people who make it up, how they operate, their motivations, how they impact Cyrodiil, and how Cyrodiil feels about them in response. It's all there, it perfectly integrates with the world, and does so much to build up certain aspects of itself, the world, and the characters related to the guild. It's something none of the major quests or guilds leading up to this point have done. But going even deeper into the nuts and bolts of the quests themselves, I gotta say there isn't a bad quest in the bunch. Some of them are weaker than others, but even the worst quests in the line beat the best of the mages guild. It's because the quests are designed to play off the greatest strengths of Oblivion itself, which is player freedom. The game trusts you to solve the open-ended objectives yourself, to find the solutions yourself and use what you've been learning about the game and its systems to come up with solutions. They even use the game systems like Radiant AI to build some of their objectives around, elevating the systems to more than just the cheap window dressings they ordinarily are relegated to. There's plenty of ways to get most of these quests done. Many of those ways are probably cheesy or could break the game, but they are there, and the game doesn't even straightjacket you the way the Mages Guild does. In fact, the Mages Guild never even trusts you with open objectives. As the entire guild was about completing boring, trivial fetch and delivery tasks or devolves into some dungeon crawling experience we can get by just wandering the world on our own time. The Thieves Guild offers unique opportunities for challenges and experiences that simply cannot be had anywhere else. I'll briefly mention the fact that the guild also encourages independent thieving to reinforce the idea that you're a fucking thief while the Mages Guild has absolutely none of that. You could go through the entire Mage's Guild without casting a single spell. Meanwhile, sneaking, lockpicking, and stealing shit is absolutely essential to the Thieves' Guild. Somehow the Guild manages to restrict you to certain playstyles that is thematically relevant to it and yet feels far more liberating and rewarding than a quest that felt like it went out of its way to be as non-committal to a particular playstyle as possible. The Thieves' Guild has proof that Bethesda didn't have to be so terrified of putting limits on player freedom at certain junctions of the game. We have a perfect example of this here that will actually make the game feel more liberating. Bethesda just had to learn to trust their own players more. Put into the greater context of Oblivion, the Thieves' Guild actually leaves me a little sad. It shows what this game could have actually been if there was this level of commitment to the quality of its development. 
It's one of the really high highs that makes the really low lows so intolerable in retrospect. This is why I chose to play these quests in Morris to best order. I don't think I would have been able to stomach the Mage's Guild if the reverse order was taken. That's how starkly different these two guilds stand. And that, I think, perfectly summarizes the feeling I get from Oblivion as a whole. But now we're pulling away from the Thieves' Guild, so it's probably about time to say farewell to it in general and welcome our next and final major quest line to the stage. Sithis is calling. Good god, I did not even for a second think this video was going to be this long. I had no intention of going this deep covering some of the guilds quest by quest, but I just couldn't think of a better way to abbreviate this stuff. Each quest in some of these quest chains showed a different aspect, and if I want to paint as complete of a picture of Oblivion as I can, I have no choice but to pick through them slowly. Unfortunately, this means I have to split the video about the quest into two videos because I ain't editing a four hour timeline, no way, no how. I was hoping I'd at least get the Dark Brotherhood into this video, but the Thieves' Guild dominated too much time and I need to give the Dark Brotherhood its proper dues, because if covering the main story, the Mages' Guild, and the Thieves' Guild has taught me anything while writing this script, I find a shit ton more to talk about than I originally had in mind as I'm going. I already know the Dark Brotherhood is going to be a beast, but with this newfound knowledge, there's no way I was making it into part one. So follow me into the next video where we will finally conclude the guilds, get into some notable side quests, and cover the Daytrick Shrines. Please consider doing the things that appeal to the algorithm gods, and I'll see you in the next one. You'll sleep rather soundly for a murderer. That's good. You'll need a clear conscience for what I'm about to propose. I'll never forget the first time I had this encounter. I remember finding some innocent man out camping in the mountains with his dog. I think I mistook him for a bandit or something, and when the message popped up that my murder had been witnessed, I thought that meant I was going to gain a bounty. I was surprised when the guards didn't hunt me down in the Imperial City and sort of forgot about the whole thing until Lucy and Lachance greeted me as I awoke. I always thought that was an interesting way to get into a guild. Like the Thieves' Guild that actually requires us to do some stealing for us to get in, or at least one of the methods anyhow. The Dark Brotherhood requires us to commit a murder in order to be invited to join. It immediately establishes the tone for the guild through the player's experiences and not because some dialogue or text box tells us so. This first conversation with Lucien Lachance is forever burned into my brain. I can recall most of it verbatim, and for good reason, it's just awesome. It's corny and cliche, but for some reason, between the voice acting, the robes, and the fact that some unknown entity has been watching us kill and Lachance has been literally watching us sleep, the whole conversation just immediately hooks me. I'll be the first to admit the Dark Brotherhood is definitely the guild designed for the edgy teenager that I was back when I first played the game. It's almost cartoonishly evil to me now that I'm older, and while still edgy, I at least am a little bit more aware of it. It's not the edgy cool factor that makes it rank so highly for me these days. No, it's, it's more valid than that, at least. So let's really start getting into this thing. The chance offers us a rare opportunity to ply our unique gift for taking life without pity or remorse. If we want to join this elite super secretive family of unscrupulous killers, we need to perform another act of murder, but this time less wanted and more targeted. Staying at the Inn of Ill Omen, which is a great name for an inn I must say, who wouldn't want to stay at such a welcoming place? There lives an old man named Rufio. Our task is to make him not living. We can accept or refuse, though I don't actually know what happens if you say you aren't a murderer, because why would we choose that if we aren't trying to join a guild of assassins? This game has programmed me to dismiss dialogue options, as they never really had any sort of impact on gameplay. The Dark Brotherhood, despite having more options than any of the other quest lines, upholds that tradition. My guess is that they just had them for added roleplaying. Anyways, down at the Inn of Ill Omen, where it's happy hour all hours, we find out Rufio has been living here for some time and spends most of his time sleeping in the basement alone, never coming up to mingle with the people of the inn. The innkeep isn't sure what his deal is, but he pays his tab and that's all that really matters. Well, you might as well alert the housekeeping staff and fetch an undertaker because you're about to have a corpse down there instead of a patron. We head down and do the simple deed and stroll on out, nobody none the wiser. The next time we sleep in a bed that Lachance deems safe, he materializes and congratulates us on a job well done, welcomes us into this dysfunctional but beautiful family. 
He instructs us to make it to Shaden Hall, where we will find an abandoned house with a unique door in the basement. It will ask us a question, to which we just simply respond, Sanguine, my brother, and open sesame, we are in. It's kind of weird how homey and safe the sanctuary feels. It actually feels more welcoming than any of the other guild halls, I gotta admit. The place has a very communal vibe to it, and despite on the surface it looking like a tomb of sorts, there's some touches like rugs and furniture that makes it feel lived in. And everyone is actually incredibly nice and welcoming. For a group of cold-blooded killers, they really have a sense of loyalty. It's immediately obvious that the whole family thing is taken quite literally by these people, and that starts to lay the groundwork for what truly makes this guilt so brilliant. We are greeted by Ochifa, the self-described mistress of the sanctuary. She runs the sanctuary for the most part and is a very welcoming lady. She's delighted to have us here, but we won't be working directly with her just yet. Vincenti Valtieri will be giving us our beginning contracts. Going down to see him, we learn he's actually a vampire, but like everyone else, he's a very domesticated hunter of the night, and even promises to offer us a chance to inherit the dark gift as soon as we prove ourselves in the guilt. Um, I'm good. Thanks, though. He explains the way contracts work, which are, like any other guilds, kind of just quests. But contracts have a twist. So the Mage's Guild and the Fighter's Guild gave very simple quests that just involved fetching items, talking to people, or killing baddies in dungeons. So they didn't really have to take that annoying thing called player agency into account when making the quests. The Thieves Guild and the Dark Brotherhood are different beasts though, where quests on the surface follow similar lines but in fact are much more open-ended. The problem is that a lot of players will take the path of least resistance, and the other quests prove that that path is just killing and looting everything until the journal says you've done good. So the good guilds had to figure out a way to get the players to actually engage with the mechanics and content in a way that will be more satisfying than just shooting and looting. The Thieves Guild had rules. You can't kill people on jobs or else you pay a blood price, which was usually around 1k gold. And you would gain bounties in cities because most of the quests took place in cities. The Dark Brotherhood had to take a different approach because, well, killing people is the whole point of the guild. So instead we have bonuses if certain parameters are met. Let me explain. So the Dark Brotherhood aren't some thugs you give 100 gold on the street to bludgeon your nemesis to death. They are a very professional organization. There's a structure, procedures, and policies. People perform a ritual to the Night Mother, the true head of the organization, and she in turn hears their prayers for murder who relays this to her listener. And he or she then dispatches representatives to work out the details of the contract with the person performing the ritual and receives payment. These people aren't going through all this trouble because they want the Dark Brotherhood to murder the target any old way. There's usually specifics to deflect suspicions or to send a message. They go to the Dark Brotherhood because they have a reputation for being extremely exact, pulling their contracts in the details prescribed. See, we could go through each quest just slaughtering everyone and forgoing the stealth and thought needed to figure out the puzzles the designers set up for us. But that will not only rob us of a satisfying experience, that will also forego our bonus. And this isn't just some worthless gold, no, these are actually very powerful and useful magical artifacts that are very relevant to a stealthy assassin character. You want the goods? Stick to the script. You might be thinking, you've been complaining about quests that steal agency from the player, now you're complimenting a guild that just does that. Make up your mind. It's true, this is technically depriving the player of their agency, but in order to make quests, the player must in some manner give up some agency. Quests are where an open world game is given some structure. That structure, by its very nature, deprives the player of some freedoms. The key is not to ask them to surrender too much of that freedom, and this is the even more important part, to properly reward them for that compromise with either in-game rewards or better yet, with an enjoyable gameplay or story experience. If the player doesn't surrender enough agency, they are going to find ways to circumvent the neat little ride you as a game designer have taken the time to construct for them, no matter how enjoyable that ride is. That's human nature. Aside from some fringe cases and players coming back for a second go-around, most people will select the path of least resistance, and that's usually pretty well ingrained in them after, say, 30 hours in-game. They are going to have habits that the rest of the game has instilled in them, and those habits are likely not to be what you want them bringing into this to cruise through it. 
A quest is meant to challenge, ideally, and if they can snooze through it by doing exactly what they've been doing for 30 hours already, they aren't going to find a challenge. And you want a challenge because that's what delivers a satisfying gameplay experience. That's literally the underlying principles of games, be they tabletop video games or the physical variety. Overcoming adversity is satisfying, and the act of overcoming those challenges can provide moments of fun. Even in a story-rich game where challenge isn't the key, the challenge there is then navigating a world and having your mental expectations challenged and subverted. Something about the experience must be novel. So yeah, even your walking simulators need to have a challenge in their design. This is why so many of the quests in Oblivion are just so fucking dull. They don't challenge because the designers were afraid to ask players to commit to a style of play, and with that very difficult to meet parameter, they found the most consistent formula was just drop in dungeons full of enemies and use combat to carry the experience. Except like I said in the first video, combat in this game sucks, and even if it didn't, copying the exact quest formula across 200 quests will get stale. This is why we get bonuses in the Dark Brotherhood. Because when it comes to conditioning human behavior, you can generally do so in one of two ways. Punish people for coloring outside of the lines, or incentivizing the preferred behavior. The Thieves Guild took the former route with its blood price fines, while the Dark Brotherhood went the latter route with bonuses. I'm generally a much bigger fan of incentives as opposed to punishments, but that's, that's a different discussion, let's just move on from that. So why didn't I complain about the blood price in the Thieves Guild? Well, by virtue of the guild being so much better than anything else in the game up until the Dark Brotherhood, just the intrinsic value of having fun was enough to get me to comply to its rules. I didn't need the threat of the blood price to get me to follow them. See, the Thieves Guild gets an enormous boost to its perceived quality due to the fact that it exists in a game that has the Mages Guild. Had the other guilds been as well designed as it and the Dark Brotherhood, I would have come across that blood price as a less compelling disincentive as the Dark Brotherhood's bonuses. But I had to wade through the Mages Guild's bullshit, so the Thieves Guild got a huge pass for a lot of its shortcomings just because it trusted that I had a brain. But uh, we just got on a big tangent there, so let's get back on track. We get our first four contracts with Valtieri, and they're all quite simple in scope and objective. The first contract has us sneaking aboard a pirate ship and murdering its captain. Valtieri takes a lot of the thought out of this one by just telling us, yeah, there's some cargo boxes on the docks, you should use them to get smuggled aboard. In the future, the optimal path or the hidden shortcuts won't be nearly as obvious. If we ask our fellow guildmates about our contracts, they might spell those things out a little bit more clearly, so you might want to avoid doing that despite what Valtieri suggests if you want to figure things out for yourself. So we head to the Imperial City Waterfront District and cram ourselves into a little crate conveniently left open on the dock. Just in case you weren't listening to Valtieri earlier and needed another heavy-handed hint. This is a tutorial assassination quest, so these gestures are easily forgiven, and the quest is incredibly short. Once aboard the ship, we gotta sneak through and avoid the crew, which is very easy to accomplish with all the rooms and doors we can duck into. We get to overhear some conversations between the pirates, which gives us some flavor and humor, and even suggests who might have set up the contract with the Dark Brotherhood in the first place. I told you a million times it wasn't my fault. The wheel was covered with gold droppings. My hands slipped. It could have happened to anyone. The dialogue is also used to signal to us when it's safe to move through the hold. Once the coast is clear, we reach the captain's quarters and get rid of him, which is actually a little challenging because he fights back, unlike Rufio who just slept his way into the abyss. With the captain dead and the crew loudly banging on the door asking what's going on, we dip out the back and book it back to the sanctuary for our reward and our bonus. The second quest is similar to the first in that it's pretty simple and Valtieri spells out the method quite explicitly. We are to sneak into a man's house and loosen the braces that hold up the stuffed animal head that hangs over his favorite chair as he sits between certain hours during the evening. This is meant to be staged to look like an accident and his manservant Grom is to be unharmed. Other than that though, the details are left for us to figure out, such as how to get into the house undetected. Reconning the area around the manor reveals a door to the cellar, giving us access to a discreet route to the bedroom where behind a board we find the braces. A quick undoing of the fastenings drops the thing onto the dude's head, causing a commotion below. As we sneak out, we can see Grom standing over the body of his dead master, so we gotta slip out before he notices the assassin sneaking by the doorway. Job done, bonus earned, nice. Third contract and following the pattern is more open-ended. It's also one of my personal favorite quests of the game. This one tasks us with assassinating a Dunmer prisoner in the Imperial Prison, Valen Dreth. You might remember him as being the ass who antagonizes you at the beginning of the game. Well, someone wants him dead, and I can't possibly imagine why. 
There's a secret way into the prison, a way Valtieri implies we know quite well. So long as we kill Dreth and leave the guards alone, we get our bonus. I love this quest for several reasons. First, I'm a sucker for developers having us return to the very beginning levels again, but with some kind of twist. That feeling of things coming full circle, returning but more powerful and with different motives, really instills a satisfying sense of progression that is nice to be reminded of from time to time. The second reason this quest is great is that it's the first of the Brotherhood quests that involves a lot of sneaking around characters who are likely to detect us. The previous two quests had some sneaking, but we were never in any real danger of being detected. This quest has guards on patrol, and while it's not super challenging, especially for a character like mine with a high sneak skill, it still requires some thought and attention. We gotta be on the lookout and frequently hold back as guards disperse and duck into dark corners as a patrol comes by. It really makes it feel like you're an actual assassin. The third reason I love this quest is just antagonizing Dreth. We get some amazing dialogue between the guard and Dreth, and I'm almost positive this guard is the one who set the contract up. Who else even knows this sad sap exists aside from us and the guard here? Dreth is obviously unstable and shouldn't be out in the streets, and the fact that we can't harm any guards leads me to my conclusion. Eleven. Eleven years in this rat-infested hole. But I'm getting out, and you'll still be stuck in here. Yeah! <laughs> oh, yeah? Where will you go, huh? What will you do? You can't survive out there, Dreth. You're an animal. You belong in that cage. I'll remember that when I'm lying on the beaches of Somerset Isle with your wife, you Imperial pig. Right! And you'll be rich, too. Oh, and you'll become a king! And you know what I think, Dreth? <laughs> I think you'll be back. You lot always come back. You'll see, you Imperial dog. When I get out of here, all of Tamria will know my name. Valen Dreth! Valen Dreth! All right, all right. I'm tempted to let you out right now if you just shut up. Anyway, once the guard is done tormenting Trath one last time, it's our turn. Wait, I, I know you. You, you're the one. The, the day the Emperor was killed. They went through your cell. You lucky bastard. But you came back? Come on, you've got to help me. Let old Valen out of this cell. You've got your freedom, now give me mine. What do you say, huh? Come on, friend. The Night Mother... No, no, guards, guards, help me. Somebody help, assassin. Run away. Valtteri was right, it is satisfying. We then swipe the keys to the place and just stroll out like we're some passing civilian. Absolutely brilliant. Back in Shaden Hall, we pick up our fourth and final Valtieri contract. This one isn't an assassination at all, but helping a man stage his own death to get out of a debt. He borrowed from the wrong people, and they really just want him dead, so this guy paid the Brotherhood a great deal of gold to stage his death before the hitman comes and actually does it. We are to make it look like we are there to kill the man, and using a special poison make it look like he is actually dead. The hope is the hitman will think the job is done and go and tell his employers, and that will buy our employer some time to sneak out of Cyrodiil once we've given him the antidote to revive him. My favorite detail is how the Dark Brotherhood doesn't ordinarily do these sorts of jobs because... The Dark Brotherhood is not in the business of staging deaths, no matter how much gold is offered. Sithis demands blood and blood must be paid. In order to accept the contract, we demanded a life. Motiere offered his mother, and we accepted. Lucien has already taken care of that uh, detail. There really isn't much to this quest, truth be told. There's very little we can do except go to Coral and do as we're told. The dialogue makes up for some of it, though, and it is a very brief quest, so I don't mind it too much. It helps show the Dark Brotherhood is a very multifaceted organization and is willing to take on very unique requests so long as it involves life and death. It's a neat diversion and serves to bookend our tutorial-ish contracts with Valtieri. It all goes off without a hitch and we get our bonus. Easy peasy. In the meantime, we also grab a quest from one of our guildmates. It's not technically part of the guild, but it falls within the general vibe of the guild. 
Tanava reveals he and Ochiva were Shadow Scales back in Black Marsh. Shadow Scales are taken once they are hatched to train in the arts of assassination to carry out duties in service to the royal powers down there. The two of them trained with a third, Scartail. Well, Scartail never left Black Marsh and continued to serve as a Shadow Scale, but dishonored his vows and bailed on a job, fleeing to Cyrodiil. Because Shadow Scales are forbidden from killing each other, he needs to contract us to do the job. All we need to do is bring Scartail as hard as proof. Being loyal to our fellow guildmates and bound by the honorable code of being cold-hearted killers, we accept and head down to the edge of Cyrodiil where Scartail is hiding. When we get there, we find he's already weakened and unarmed, having barely fought off a royal assassin from Black Marsh already. He offers to pay us off in exchange for his life, and we can bring the heart of the Argonian assassin into Tanava as proof. I agree only to learn of the location of his stash and then kill him and cut out his heart because we wouldn't be good assassins if we didn't live by the sadistic, merciless code of honor. Tanava is pleased and gives us some boots that are well, pretty much worthless at this point, but I love seeing the lizard smile and... That's what I kill for, to bring smiles to people's faces. Our first contract with Ochiva has us hunting down a high elf named Phalian in the Imperial City. She warns us about Adamus Philid, an Imperial watch captain who has it in for the Dark Brotherhood. If he suspects the Brotherhood committed a murder in his city, he goes out of his way to clamp down on their operations, so she insists we try to make the murder seem as inconspicuous by killing him in a remote place indoors away from any witnesses. In order to pull off this off, we will need to do some detective work. I'm not sure how I feel about this quest. On the one hand, I like having to go around town asking people about our target to locate him, and it's really cool getting to piece together an idea of what this guy's life is and his story and trying to figure out how to end it. But on the other hand, I'm left wondering a few things. If the whole point of us killing him away from people is to reduce suspicion, then wouldn't going around town asking everyone and their mother about failing going to arouse quite a bit of it? And how does killing him away from witnesses make the Brotherhood less suspect? I thought clean professional kills was what made the Brotherhood so famous. Wouldn't it actually be better to kill him in a less professional way? Never really bought the explanations for the challenges set up to justify our bonuses for this one. It always just felt less thought out than the others. Asking around town leads us to the Tiber Septon Inn, where the innkeeper tells us he lives in the hotel with his wife, who pays for everything because Falion is now a skooma addict who spends most of his time roaming the streets looking for it. We locate his wife, who, feeling like she can trust us because our magical disposition number is high with her, spills her guts about Falion and her fears about what he does all day. It's a very jarring conversation because I've never spoken to this woman before, and she just starts rattling off her worries to us like we're her mother. Thanks to her, though, we wind up learning about the abandoned house he goes to do his skooma, which sounds like the perfect place to murder him. So off it is to the place where we set up and wait for him to show up. And once he does, we discreetly kill him and skip back to the sanctuary, a job well done. It would have been more appropriate if we managed to kill him with some sort of poison skooma or something, maybe selling it to him here in the house as we pose as a skooma dealer or something. That way it just looks like an overdose as opposed to him now having an arrow in him. Maybe the idea is that people will miss the arrow sticking out of him and assume it was the drug use that did it? Or maybe it was another drug addict that did him in? I don't really know, but this quest has too many plot holes for me to really give it much credit. The second quest actually falls along this idea, though. Ochiva entrusts us with another contract to infiltrate a fort to poison a veteran and captain of a mercenary company. In order to do this, we need to sneak into the fort completely undetected and swap the medicine he is given daily with a poison. It's absolutely essential nobody sees us, which means a lot of sneaking like a good assassin should. If the last quest was a little underwhelming, this one is more fun and challenging. One of our guildmates actually gives us the location of a back way into the fort that will help us get in undetected. Following the advice, we sneak into the fort and dodge patrols, getting some dialogue between a disgruntled member of the company and a more loyal one as they discuss the unchanging condition of their leader. Ten bucks on the disgruntled underling being the one who issued the contract. Employed dissatisfaction aside, we sneak into the chamber where the captain is and swap the medicine with the poison. Then it's just a matter of sneaking back out of the fort and dodging a few more patrols in the process. This isn't a challenging quest, especially since we got a good sneak skill and detect life which lets us wall hack our enemies to time when and where we gotta move to avoid getting caught. There probably should have been a few more guards and faster patrols, but it wasn't completely straightforward, so it wasn't too boring. Do you like parties? Because you've been invited to one. Of course, you'll be killing all the other guests. 
Are you ready to attend? This quest is Oblivion at its absolute prime. This is what this game could achieve when every component is working together, when every aspect of what makes this game up is used. So, as Achieva explained, we are going to a party with the intent of murdering all the guests. Now, we could just go in and start hacking people to death, but that would spoil the fun and forfeit the bonus, which doesn't even make sense why it would. It's just the designer beating the player over the head saying, just don't ruin it for yourself, you jackass. Seriously, this is a quest about social engineering, and I really wish there were more quests like this. If there had been, I would have rolled a high personality and speechcraft character every single time. I would have sacrificed three other guilds if it got us a whole guild length quest chain revolving around speech. But wishful thinking aside, let's go through just one of the ways we can tackle this quest because we actually have options for this one. Go, go, socialize, talk to those fine people, and then plunge your knife into their throats when they ain't looking. <laughs> The first step is doing a little recon, getting to know our targets, or um, I mean our fellow party guests. We first meet Matilda Petit, a supposed Breton noblewoman from High Rock who seems just a little too eager to want this money to be a rich noblewoman. She also hates Dunmer, so uh, we may have a personal problem with this one. We also got Primo Antonis, a stuck up rich guy who came here thinking this would just be some good old fashioned fun, he didn't even need the money. Nels the Naughty is a Nord, and living up to the stereotype of Nords, he drinks a lot, especially when people start dropping dead in the house. And he also hates the Empire. Neville is a no-nonsense retired legionnaire with a deep hatred for Nords, making him the perfect foil for Neville. Probably the only two people in this house who might figure out our true intentions. Then we got Devesi Dran, a fellow Dunmer. She's a sweet girl whom I spare the horror by killing her first. So it goes like this. We first play off the little crush Devosi and Primo have by convincing the girl she should go wait for Primo in his room to seduce him. Because, well, he's totally into her. He? He did? Oh my goodness, what should I do? Should I talk to him? Or maybe play hard to get? Or should I, you know... Or would that be too forward? Oh, you think so? I mean... It is rather forward, but I like it. All right, then. I'll wait for him in his room upstairs. Oh, thank you. Thank you. With her hopes up and successfully isolated from the group, she makes the easiest first kill. This disturbs the rest of the guests and starts to create tension, but it's not enough yet to provoke any of them into action. Yes, the poor girl is dead. What a shame. Well, I guess she won't be finding the gold. <laughs> <laughs> Primo ends up our second victim as he hangs around in the library as everyone else heads off to bed. It's uh, not the most glamorous kill, but eh, gets the job done. With two guests dead, now tensions are raised. Neville and Nels are ready to slit each other's throats and the old lady Matilda is caught in between. Nobody suspects us yet because, despite us lacking any sort of alibi, they all trust us seeing as we charmed and bribed them all. Playing off of Neville's paranoia, we convince him to run upstairs and grab his legion gear, and now events move quickly. One less dark elf in the world. And now there's one less person to find the gold as well. It's a good day, don't you think? This leaves Matilda alone upstairs for about a quarter of a second, plenty of time to give her a taste of Marwyn justice. With Neville somehow sensing Matilda's death upstairs, He's convinced Nels did it, his hatred for Nord so great he ignores the fact that Nels was downstairs the moment he heard the old lady's body hit the floor. Yes, yes, we must kill that foul Nord before he slits our throats. Aye! So many people- <laughs> Now it's just a matter of escaping with his best buddy and- Ah, oh shit, he was the murderer the entire time. God damn it! The quest sort of suffers on account of Bethesda's patented AI telepathy technology, removing the thrill of posing or hiding bodies and waiting for people to make the grisly discoveries, but I get the designers were working with a very rigid AI system. Just the thought of all the possibilities having a discovery system would open up would have me replaying this quest a dozen times each playthrough. With all the guests dead and none of them ever figuring out we were the ones doing the killing, Ochiva is pleased. She actually gives us a straight permanent stat buff as a bonus. The Night Mother's Blessing. 
this is a sort of reward that should have been more common in the other guilds, not just worthless golden robes. Our next job is a contract sanctioned by the Black Hand itself. Adamus Philida must die. The Imperial Watch Captain has finally retired, thinking he'd won and escaped the wrath of the Dark Brotherhood by retiring to Leowin. Turns out he's wrong. Well, dead wrong, in fact. We are given the Rose of Sithis, an insta-kill if used on an unarmored target, and the instructions to kill him, cut off his finger with his Imperial Signet ring still on it, and stick it in the desk of his successor in order to score the bonus. It's brutal, it's sick, and it's pretty fucking great. So, it's off to Leowin to get it done. There's several issues that need to be resolved for this job to go smoothly. First is Adamus Philida himself. He may be retired, but he's still a well-armed and armored foe, so taking him on when he's able to fight back would complicate a clean kill. Second is that he's followed by a bodyguard most of the time, so we have to either get him away from the guard or kill him without anyone seeing us. And that's where the Rose of Sithis can come in handy. The third is that he moves around all the time and is usually in a public setting. So why don't you just... go away? And finally, we need his finger for that bonus, so we will have to reveal ourselves from our sniping spot if using the rose is the route we end up going. This is generally one of the most difficult quests in the Brotherhood chain to pull off completely perfect. In fact, this might be the first time I actually managed to pull it off without incurring a bounty or starting a fight with a body card. I don't know if it was luck or if I actually did manage to do it all correctly, but it was satisfying to get a good run on camera, that's for sure. It's pretty easy to track Philida down once in Lightwind. He walks the streets in his white Imperial armor, making him a very easy target to track. After that, it's simply a matter of following the man until he's in a good spot. Generally, the best place to catch him is when he goes to take a swim in the pond. That's when he's away from his bodyguard and without his armor. Then it's a simple matter of finding a good spot to snipe him undetected and moving quickly to snatch the finger. Once that's done, we gotta make it to the Imperial City and sneak into the office where his desk is and slip the finger into the desk, which is a task that shouldn't be underestimated, as there's guards all over the place and they don't take too kindly to assassins trying to drop severed fingers in their offices. Once it's all taken care of, it's back to the Sanctuary to deliver the news to Ochiva, who is very pleased Philida will be spending the rest of eternity being tormented by Sithis for all the headaches he's caused the Dark Brotherhood. I mean, I gotta feel bad for the guy, he was just doing his job. But I also appreciate the fact that the devs didn't try to sugarcoat this by softening the blow and making Philida some evil tyrant or something. Nah, he was just a good man and we're the evil fucks who take life without any sort of remorse. That's what it means to be a Dark Brotherhood assassin, and it could have been very easy for the devs to try and justify saving the player's soft sensibilities, but that would have ruined the true experience of playing an evil character. It's strange because Bethesda games typically don't allow players to play evil characters, even though player freedom is such a sacred pillar of their game design. They always seem to come just short of letting the players truly be free, but not with the Dark Brotherhood. There's no minced meanings here, we're just bad people doing bad deeds. Even the Thieves Guild had some altruistic components to them. The Dark Brotherhood is really the only bastion for evil bastards. Speaking of evil bastards, Lucian Lachance has need of us, sending us a sealed letter when we see Oshiva. Whatever it is, according to the letter, it is extremely urgent, and we shouldn't tell anyone we are going to see him at his secret hideaway just outside of Shadenhall. This is where I began to believe in the greatness that is a high sneak skill, and I began to suspect stealth was actually just a little bit broken now making reaching with chance in his fort kind of easy. He informs us the Shadenhall Sanctuary has been compromised by a traitor. The traitor has been operating for some time before we even joined the guild, so we have been absolved of any suspicions, but the rest of the Sanctuary is not so fortunate. Everyone else is suspect, and because of that, the Black Hand has authorized the Rite of Purification. Everyone in the Sanctuary must die. It's a drastic measure that has only been done twice in the history of the Brotherhood, but it's through drastic measures from time to time that the organization has managed to survive for so long. The idea is that if everyone in the Sanctuary is purged, the traitor will be among those killed. Think of it like amputating a limb to save a patient's life if you're feeling macabre. All the souls of the Sanctuary will be offered to the Sithis as a sign of fealty, which sounds like a real rotten deal for those involved, unless Sithis shows some mercy to his devoted children. But something tells me the god known as the Dreadfather torments souls indiscriminately. 
Your reservations aside, it is our duty to the Dark Brotherhood to carry out the task. We are elevated to the rank of Silencer and will be Lucian Lachance's right hand moving forward. As an official member of the Black Hand, many of the tenants that bound us previously have been lifted. So long as we serve the Black Hand and Sithis. So, it's back to Shaden Hall to get it done. The best way to go about this is isolating each member and taking them down one at a time. They are all masters of combat and are usually armed and armored, so using stealth is absolutely the way to go unless we want to alert the whole sanctuary and get mobbed to death. One of our guildmates spends her time in a private room in the upstairs of an inn in town, so she's the easiest one to target first. A sneak attack with an arrow does a trick and then it's time to head to the sanctuary for a more methodical deconstruction. Lucian gave us a single poisoned apple, which is great, but if we want to speed this up, we need more. So we grab all the poisoned apples we can and clear out all the food in the living quarters and replace it with poisoned apples. Then it's just a matter of waiting and seeing what happens. This is absolutely a very inefficient way of killing the sanctuary, but it is satisfying watching NPCs get killed by their radiant AI routines. It's worth a try at any rate. Grom is the first to taste the forbidden fruit and thankfully so, he's probably the only one who would have been a real bitch to fight. He falls over like a sack of potatoes after a few bites and then sort of just lays there for two days as no one seems to notice or care. Once again, the limitations of Bethesda's AI is pretty obvious in this quest and it makes the thrill of killing all of them rather muted. None of them realize they're in any sort of mortal danger unless they see us attacking someone in front of them, even as the bodies of their guildmates start to litter the halls of the sanctuary. Valtteri is up next as he spends most of his time alone at the bottom of the sanctuary in his private room. So we sneak up on him as he sleeps and cut him a few times with a fiery dagger, which is his weakness as a vampire. Marajdar dies somewhere off camera and I was never able to find his body. He no doubt ate an apple himself and died in some unknown location. Ochiva goes to train in the training hall by herself, so a stealthy poison arrow does a trick there. The remaining two are then pretty easy kills on their own and with that, the purification is complete. It's nothing short of hilarious that I feel more for the deaths of these evil murderers than I do for any of the other deaths of any of the other characters in earlier quests in the game, and that's really just nothing short of an indictment on the poor writing of the previous quest chains. None of those characters, save for maybe a couple in the Thieves Guild, had any sort of development or even a personality, they were all just vehicles for some shoddy melodramatic plots. So when St. Traven lights himself on fire, I feel nothing except maybe just a little relief I no longer have to be his errand boy. But having to kill every member of the Shadenhall Sanctuary feels kind of bad. They weren't even that great of characters either, none of them had any sort of development or character arcs, but it's just when compared to literally any of the others we've come across so far in this game, it sucks to lose the only ones that actually stood out. Fortunately, we still got Lucy in the chance. Well, kinda. Up until this point, the Dark Brotherhood has pretty much exemplified what Oblivion can do when its quests are designed to work with all of its systems. Gameplay, world design, exploration, and NPC interactions. That all pretty much goes out the window now in exchange for what fucked every other quest chain, dungeon crawls. This is the big black eye for the Dark Brotherhood questline. We are now going to be receiving our quests through dead drop locations. No more talking to people like Valtieri, Ochiva, or Lachance himself. No, we'll just be getting quests through dialogue boxes. Well, written dialogue boxes, but simple text nonetheless. We lost all those colorful personalities, lost the ability to ask guildmates for inputs on jobs, and instead just get quest markers in dungeons. So fucking lame. This part smacks of filler, and while there's plenty of in-game reasoning for this part, Dead drops are more secret and more secure, and really does make you feel like the lone assassin out in the field, I just have such a bad taste in my mouth from three long quest chains already beating us over the head with drawn out excessive dungeon crawls. Having some of the most intricately designed quests in the game coupled with a great base of operations filled with interesting characters all yanked away at the same time really spoils the experience for this stretch of the quest. As a result, I'm going to plunge through this pretty quickly because there just isn't much to discuss. If it isn't for the story that the designer manages to weave all this filler into, this would have been enough to sink the Dark Brotherhood below the Thieves Guild, which had not a single quest that felt like filler. But this all ends up serving a purpose, so this is just a bitter pill that has to be swallowed. The first dead drop quest has us killing a necromancer who is attempting to turn himself into an immortal lich. 
Now, this would have been an excellent premise for a Mage's Guild quest, because stopping a necromancer from becoming an immortal undead seems like something that they ought to be worried about. But instead it falls to the Dark Brotherhood to do it, and it just seems very out of place. They let us assassinate him by simply pickpocketing an item off of him, killing him instantly as it holds his life force as he transforms. But that's about all the assassiny stuff going on here. It's a lame quest and isn't really worth much getting into. The next quest is, in theory anyway, much better. We are tasked with wiping out an entire family. Now, this is the stuff the Dark Brotherhood lives for. We know the location of the matriarch of the family and nothing else, so we go pay her a visit and the senile old lady believes we are a courier for a gift delivery service and not an assassin looking to wipe her family out. So she gives us a list of all the locations of her children and makes the job of hunting them down all but completely trivial. It just becomes a matter of following quest markers and finding ways of getting rid of them. She's probably the real highlight of the quest as the rest of them lack any interesting dialogue. So we kill her first. And then it's on to going down the list. One daughter is a recluse living in a cave with some wild animals, making her the easiest to kill with no witnesses. One owns an inn with an imperial soldier constantly posted in there, but with the right angle and a sneak attack, he's removed. Another works as a guard for Umbakano in the Imperial City, and I didn't even bother trying to find an appropriate way to kill him. I just attacked him in the basement of his employer's mansion and took the bounty for the assault. Finally, the last daughter is a guard in Lyowin and patrols the streets alone. Unable to kill her in one shot, we end up incurring a significant bounty for this one because she managed to telepathically report the crime before dying, I guess. I don't really know her care because I know what's waiting for us now that this whole family is dead. I had a whole segment dissecting the next few assassination dead drops, but honestly, they are just all so dull and straightforward, it's just not worth getting into. The lack of bonuses, because those disappeared with the dead drops, really begins to show, and these quests just become a matter of going to the quest markers and making the target dead. There's very little thought needed, and some of them you won't even attract attention from the guards if you're caught fighting them in the streets because they paid off the city guards to look the other way. It's literally just, go here and fight this person. This feels more like the arena than the Dark Brotherhood, so rather than going through this piece by piece and seeing this video hasn't had a montage yet, let's just do it that way instead. No! I'm too late. I thought I could get here in time! Thought I could stop you! By Sithis, what have you done? What madness has claimed you? You have betrayed me. You have betrayed the Dark Brotherhood. Why? I am here to end your miserable life. To... but... I can see the confusion in your eyes. You... You have no idea what I'm talking about. Do you? So, we've been duped and just murdered like half the Black Hand, including the listener himself. The Black Hand knew they were being hunted, which explains why they were getting increasingly more difficult, luring us into more elaborate traps and remote locations. It's an interesting way to retroactively reframe the previous few quests and totally caught me by surprise the first time I did the quest. So we didn't give up all that made the previous half of the quest chain great for nothing. We at least got a sweet plot twist that doesn't feel completely invented. 
Now it's time to hunt down the traitor and bring this madness to an end. Lucien has us go and wait at the next dead drop location to see who shows up next to drop off the orders, which I don't really know why he thinks the orders aren't already there, but okay. We head to the city of Anvil and arrive just at the right time to catch the false orders being dropped off by an intermediary. He claims a man in robes who lives in the lighthouse paid him to drop the orders off, and that's all he knows. Well, he also knows the lighthouse cellar stinks like something died down there and suggests we check it out. Doing so reveals something out of a horror story. This is most certainly the home of the traitor. The place is full of corpses of tortured victims ranging from animals to humans and a lone crazed dog presumably feasting on the rotting corpses left to guard the place. We then find a shrine with a severed head simply titled Mother's Head at its center and the diary of the traitor is written in what seems like blood. It details everything he's been doing to undo the Dark Brotherhood for revenge of the murder of his mother. When he was young, his father contracted the Dark Brotherhood to murder his wife, and Lucien Lechance was the one who carried out the murder, chopping off the traitor mother's head right in front of him as he hid under the bed. Since then, he swore revenge on his father and the Dark Brotherhood and Lucien Lechance. It seems his first murder was his father. Eventually, he ends up joining the Dark Brotherhood himself, working at the Shaden Hall Sanctuary. He rose up the ranks of the guild, even falling in love with a fellow guildmate. But when he told her how he likes to keep the severed head of his dead mother around, she understandably was a little freaked out. So he does the only thing a well-adjusted psychopath does and kills her. He then starts killing random people in his cellar and kills everyone aboard a ship in the Anvil Harbor. He continues rising the ranks until he has made the silencer for one of the members of the Black Hand. He eventually commits a murder in his quest for revenge that almost blows his cover and this is how they learn that there's a traitor among their ranks. He ends up figuring out how to use Lucian's dead drops to get us to start murdering the Black Hand, all in hopes that eventually they will call an emergency meeting with the Night Mother. Being a member of the Black Hand himself, he will then be able to have an audience with the Night Mother herself and slight her, ending the Dark Brotherhood for good. It's really interesting how someone noble like Adamus Filda wasn't able to even make a dent in the Brotherhood's operations, but a completely sadistic, unhinged psychopath, even by the standards of Dark Brotherhood psychopaths, is able to bring the organization to the brink of total destruction through his systemic and planned actions from within. It's a brilliant juxtaposition that shows the strengths and weaknesses of an organization such as the Dark Brotherhood, and it's all completely believable. This is one of the only antagonists in the entire game we actually get to learn about and in some ways sympathize with. I can't really blame him for wanting to destroy the Dark Brotherhood. And not actually being a psycho killer myself, I even support his efforts to some extent. With the truth now known, it's time for us to go meet up with Lucy and the Chance at the remote farm we agreed to meet at. But when we get there... Silencer, at last you've arrived. Fear not, for the crisis that has threatened the Dark Brotherhood has finally come to an end. I am Arquin, speaker for the Black Hand. As you can see, we have dealt with the betrayer, Lucian Lachance. No longer will you serve as his puppet. It seems Lachance wanted revenge against the Dark Brotherhood for some reason, and used you to do his dirty work. These people have no idea Lachance was innocent, and unfortunately we don't actually know the true identity of the killer just yet, though it is likely it is one of these five. As they all have seemed to enjoy torturing Lachance, it's not very obvious who the true killer is. And just as he had hoped, we will now be seeking the Night Mother's guidance for waking her in her secret crypt. Even though we are promoted to Speaker of the Black Hand to replace a chance, we really have no way of discerning who the traitor among this group is. Although we know he's a man, so I think we could have at least ruled out Arquin and explained the truth to her. Would that have made a difference? Eh, I don't really know. It sounds like this I really yearn for actual meaningful dialogue options in this game, but we're stuck on this railroad, might as well take it to the end. I can't help but just feel sorry for Lucian. He was an evil bastard like everyone else in this guild, but he was no traitor and died a disgraceful death. He knew he was being framed, but still there wasn't anything he could really do outside of the precautions he had already been taking. I've seen a lot of people mention this, but it is worth repeating. The corpse we see here is just one of the generic zombie corpses we see throughout the game, especially in Necromancer Caves and Oblivion Gates. Only this one isn't colored green, and that's enough to make us able to identify it as Lachance, giving our imagination enough to picture how grisly his death really was. It's a great example of the subtle power of visual storytelling in video games, and is something Oblivion is able to leverage from time to time. With the right context and build-up, devs are able to make us think and feel certain things with just a few carefully placed environmental details. It's something video games in particular are able to do very well. Well, it's time to finally meet the Night Mother and hopefully bring an end to this madness. 
At least with us knowing the truth, maybe there's still some hope. We did, after all, manage to single-handedly dismantle most of the Black Hand. So it stands to reason we can't preserve what's left of it. Especially since the traitor does not know that we know the truth now. Arquin performs the ritual before the statue of the lucky old lady in Breville, revealing a trap door to the crypts of the Night Mother. In another stroke of interesting recontextualization, the devs have given new meaning to a familiar location, which I'm a real sucker for, as I said earlier. The statue transforms from a welcoming symbol of love and charity into some nightmarish horror as the statue literally screams. Down in the crypt, though, things don't go so well. Ah, yes, I have been expecting you. The listener now kneels by Sithis, as does his successor. There is a traitor amongst you. The traitor is dead, dear mother. We have come now to ask your blessing. Anoint one of us your listener so we can restore the Black Hand. Foolish little girl. Lucien Lachance served Sithis till his dying breath. The Black Hand is Enough. tainted by the traitor. Enough of this. Restoration is You will impossible. all suffer for the pain you have caused me. I will destroy your Night Mother, and the Dark Brotherhood will fall. Ow! Huh. <laughs> what treachery! The traitor still lives. It is Matthew Bellamont. Do not let him harm the Night Mother. Kill him! He'll never take me down! Show me what you've got! The best you can do! Well, the traitor is dead, but so is all but two members of the Black Hand. This definitely complicates the recovery of the Dark Brotherhood. But the Night Mother admits she knew all along about the traitor's intentions since he was a child and swore his revenge. She refused to intervene though because if her listener and her speakers couldn't see the truth, then they just aren't very good at their jobs and shouldn't be rewarded. Instead, she let them get dismantled, knowing full well that the traitor wouldn't succeed and we'd be the one to end his life. Because of that, she chooses us to be her new listener. Well, I guess that's one way to earn a promotion, just let a traitor murder all of your competition. Once again, in a little bit of self-aware irony, the Night Mother herself basically says this all happened because the leaders of the Dark Brotherhood had grown complacent and incompetent. It's the exact same thing that almost led to the destruction of the Mages Guild and the Fighters Guild. Apparently, Guilds and Cyrodiil all suffer from really bad leadership. Only here, the Night Mother recognizes such and just lets the roster be purged so she could replace them all with better talent. Well, I guess that's one way to restructure an organization. Let a traitor purge everyone unfit for their positions and let the best of those remaining take out the traitor and make them the new leaders. The Night Mother lets us loot her crypt, happy as can be that she has a new listener, even if the rest of her organization is dangerously weakened now. Once we got our fill, she transports us back to the Shaden Hull Sanctuary, and that's more or less the end of the quest line for the Dark Brotherhood. We can technically perform a weekly ritual where we receive the list of those looking to make contracts with the Dark Brotherhood, but this is an unending quest and it's just there to make us feel like we are indeed the listener of the Dark Brotherhood. I mean, I gotta give them credit for putting this in, as none of the other guilds had any sort of post-quest line content that lets us at least try and roleplay as the heads of the other guilds. With those, we just get the highest title, and that's pretty much it. But don't be fooled, this is just some flavor content and really not much else. Arkwin will hold down the fort at the Sanctuary, trying to recruit and rebuild it following the Purge, and presumably find new members to fill out the Black Hand once more. But other than that, our time of the Dark Brotherhood is at an end, bringing with it the end of the major guild quests. It's difficult to come up with some general blanket statement to summarize all the guild content. Some of it is great, some of it is terrible, with most of it landing somewhere between those two extremes. When things are going well, the quest designs are trusting the player to figure things out on their own, simply presenting an objective and telling the player to use what they know to get it done. When the quests are at their absolute worst, we are being sent into boring dungeons filled with generic enemies we've fought a dozen times already just to find some story item or NPC that delivers us exposition, and then has us return to the quest giver for that story exposition to be tossed aside faster than it had been dumped on us. The inconsistent nature of all this makes it difficult to recommend to newcomers unless we warn them what to avoid. But even the great stuff doesn't do anything particularly exceptional, it's just brilliant compared to what else is in the game. But I think I've spent more than enough time covering the guilds. It's time to move on to another chunk of quest content, the Daedric Shrines.
In Oblivion and the Elder Scrolls games in general, the player will often cross paths with certain entities known as Daedric Princes. These beings are, for a lack of a better description, gods. More specifically, they were gods who did not take part in the creation of the world and therefore maintain their more concrete forms and powers, as opposed to the Aedra who sacrificed or were tricked depending on the creation story to create the world of mortals. Daedra and Daedric Princes are generally seen as demonic and evil, although that label is not wholly true. Most of them seem to just be completely apathetic to the going-ons of the mortals and only interfere when it serves to amuse or benefit them. Even the more benevolent princes tend to fall into this pattern of behavior. There are 17 Daedric Princes, but only 15 of them have shrines in Oblivion. Each shrine allows us to make an offering to the prince, who will then communicate to us a task they wish to have completed if they are going to bestow upon us their blessing. Some of these quests are genuinely interesting, and while all of them lack in comparison to some of the great quests in the Thieves Guild and Dark Brotherhood, they are still interesting in their own right. But unlike any of the other quests in the game, whose only rewards tend to be the experiences themselves, the shrines actually grant us some of the best gear in the game, with the final quest for Hermes Mora being a book of exceptional power granting huge amounts of levels to skills of art choosing. I'm going to go through each quest, but seeing as most of them are the same go here and kill X objectives, we've already seen a trillion times at this point, I'll gloss over them very quickly. Starting with Azura, who is one of the not-so-demonic princes of the Pantheon, her task is rather benevolent in premise. Some of her followers would turn into vampires in service to her and lock themselves in a cave to avoid causing havoc in their feral forms. She asks us to go there and mercy kill all of them. It's a dungeon crawl through a generic cave, but completing it gives us Azura Star, a rechargeable soul gem of the highest power level. It's absolutely worth the few minutes it takes to complete her quest. Boethia is one of my personal favorites to complete, but getting to his shrine is a real bitch as it's deep in the mountains to the east. His quest has us participating in a tournament fight to the death, where we go up against a member of each race in the game. This quest is fantastic for gear when done at higher levels, as each opponent we face is generally armed to the teeth and stocked up on a stupid amount of potions and arrows. I would recommend coming here with as little weight as possible and plenty of feather potions and spells. It's a great quest to stock up on some consumables and for some mid to late game gearing up. The weapon we get at the end of the quest, Goldbrand, is also a very nice weapon if you're using one-handed blade weapons. Clavicus Vile tasks us, or rather strikes up a bargain as he prefers to see it, to retrieve the Sword of Umbra. Umbra is a pretty awesome sword with a Soul Trap enchantment on it, and if you get it prior to the end of the quest, it weighs nothing, which makes it even better. Retrieving the sword involves fighting the female warrior who now goes by the name of the sword, as its power seems to have driven her insane on some level. Fighting her at a very low level is, uh, challenging. But being able to use her sword for a while and wear her armor is well worth the effort. Vile's companion, Barbus, will offer us an alternative to turning the sword over to Vile. He suggests we refuse to hand the sword over to him because it's not something Vile should possess. If we turn in the sword, we are rewarded with the Mask of Clavicus Vile, a cool looking heavy armor helmet of decent protection with a rather worthless fortified personality enchantment on it. Keeping the sword is okay, but it goes from weighing nothing to weighing 40 pounds, so it loses a lot of its appeal. I end up turning over the sword, but I really have no use for either reward. The mask just looks more interesting, I guess. Here is seen is the Lord of Hunting, and tasks us with hunting down the last unicorn. He directs us to a grove where the unicorn is being protected by some minotaurs. It's a relatively simple quest, though the unicorn can be a bit tricky to kill just because it's got some high resistances and has a very powerful attack. The model of the unicorn itself is a little unique, but it really is just the same horse model we've seen throughout the game with a white texture and a horn attached to it. Regardless, Hirsin wants it dead, so that's exactly what we do, taking the horn as proof. As a reward, we are given Savior's Hide, which is a very nice light armored chest with a magic resistance enchantment. Lord Dread took my ogres, says he owns them. Lying maggot, they're my ogres! Malakoth is upset that some of his ogres are being used as slave labor in a mine, and has us free them from their captivity. There are a few routes we can take with this quest, ranging from just storming the place and killing everyone in there, to sneaking through picking the locks on the cells and turning the ogres loose on their captors. Once all the cells have been open, we can return to the shrine and be rewarded with Valengrung, a quite powerful two-handed blunt weapon with a paralyzed enchantment on it. Very nice for cheesing enemies. Mafala sets us to creating strife in a peaceful community where Nords and Dunmer have successfully coexisted for a while. 
but under the appearance of tranquility is deep-seated racism and resentment common between Nords and Dunmer. This quest would have been much more interesting if it had multiple routes to sowing the seeds of chaos, but in reality there's only one way to get it done. Steal the evidence that would incriminate the other family, murder the leaders of each group, and then plant the respective evidence on the corpses. This will then trigger an all-out slaughter between the families until one is just completely eliminated. In this playthrough, the Dunmer survived. Very good. Once one of the families is dead by the hands of the other, Mafala awards us with Ebony Blade, which is pretty much identical to Goldbrand, but with the Silence and Absorb Health enchantment instead of a Fire enchantment, making it really powerful. Meridia wants us to wipe out some necromancers because we, we, we just haven't had enough of those quests, right? She gives us the Ring of the Khajiit, which is a very nice ring for stealth characters as it gives an awesome chameleon effect to make sneaking even more brokenly powerful, and a fortify speed buff for us speed demons who just want to go really, really fast. Molag Baal's quest is one of the more interesting ones as it doesn't really hold our hand and just tasks us with provoking a former knight who has forsworn violence into attacking us with the cursed mace. When we travel to the town he lives nearby, the townsfolk shed some light on the man's character, explaining that he took an oath of non-violence when his wife died of a sudden fever when he was away fighting. He now lives in solitude on the edge of town, spending most of his time at his wife's grave. Trying to provoke him even by attacking him yields no results. We have to wait for him to visit his wife's grave where he will then be vulnerable to breaking his vow. If we drop the mace in front of him and attack him by the grave, his anger takes hold of him and he picks up the mace and starts attacking us. Once we are dead, we will be teleported back to the shrine where Molag Baal congratulates us on damning yet another soul. He then rewards us with the mace of Molag Baal, which has some nifty little enchantments that makes it a decent weapon for one-handed blunt characters. No. You're dead. I killed you myself. What manner of creature are you? Will I be tormented with your image forever? Namir is a charming prince who loves squalor and filth. We gotta get our personality down to a very low threshold before beginning the quest, but apparently we've become such a despicable person since doing the Dark Brotherhood quest that we are welcomed at the shrine with open arms. She expresses outrage that a group of priests are trying to help her followers who live in total darkness and filth in some ruins. She gives us a spell that will help us deal with those pesky priests and lets us loose. In the old ruins, we find priests holding torches trying to quite literally bring light to these people. Amira's followers are afraid of the light and hide when the priests are nearby with their torches. We have other plans though, and with our spell we are able to extinguish the torches. Once in the dark, Namira's followers spring from the darkness and slaughter the powerless priests. It's a very perverse premise for a quest, and I find it to be one of the more memorable and enjoyable ones, if not short and insanely easy. As a reward, we are given the Ring of Namir, which is insanely powerful with its Reflect spell and Reflect damage enchantments. I love using this ring on mage characters, coupled with some spell absorption. Nocturnal I already covered when I talked about the Skeleton Key in an earlier video. A couple of thieves stole her eye, which she uses to uncover secrets, and hid it in a cave. The quest just involves us eavesdropping on the two thieves to uncover the hiding location, getting down there, retrieving the eye, and then returning it to the shrine. As a reward, we get an unbreakable lockpick, which just completely nullifies the security skill. It's just an absolute essential for almost any character. Parite's quest is a forgettable trump through a forgettable plane of oblivion. His followers accidentally stun locked themselves trying to perform a summoning ritual of the prince, and Parite, already embarrassed for being known as the weakest of the princes, wants his followers' souls unstuck from the planes of his realm, which look identical to the realms of Mehrun's Dagon, because they really couldn't be bothered to give this guy a unique realm. It's a lot of navigating difficult to navigate land and fighting the same dull Daedra we fought untold scores of during the main quest. He rewards us with Spellbreaker, which is perhaps one of the most powerful items in the game with its absurdly high reflect spell enchantment. For being the weakest of the princes, he does have a sweet shield. Shao Gorath's quest is by far the most memorable and most fun. While all the other shrines had us making offerings of simple things like animal pelts, glow dust, and nightshade, Shao Gorath's followers insist on a very specific set of items to coax the crazy prince into talking to us. We need a head of lettuce, a lesser soul gem, and some yarn. Why? Who knows? It's a sort of unknowable randomness that makes Sheogara such a charming and frustrating prince to deal with. It tells us of a settlement of Khajiit on the border of Elsewhere whose citizens believe in a very specific prophecy that would signal the end of the world. 
Shergoreth has a simple request. Make that prophecy come true. Speaking with the town shaman reveals the three signs of the end times. First would be a plague of rats, where an infestation of rats would overrun the town. Then there would be a plague of famine, where all the town's livestock would die in their pens. Finally, a plague of fear, which the shaman won't reveal because it's just that scary. For the rats, we find out that Innkeeper has a lovely collection of cheeses, one of which smells so potent it needs to be locked up in a glass case. So we steal that cheese and stick it in a cooking pot in the center of town, and the smell is so strong it attracts a swarm of rats in the town. Step one of the prophecy is now fulfilled. The shaman begins placing rat poison all over town, so we steal some of it and place it in the feet of the livestock. This leads to all of them dropping dead in the field. Step two, now checked off. Once all that is done, Shergorth will speak directly into our minds and tell us to head into the center of town and keep our heads down. Head into the center of Border Watch and make sure to dock. With the town sufficiently scared, they are convinced it is the end of the world and everyone starts running around the town in a panic. And we get to take one last look at our handiwork before heading back to the shrine for our reward. We are then given the Wabajack, a staff that will transform its targets into a random creature. So it could turn a very powerful monster into a harmless sheep or a little old lady into a minotaur lord. It's like a monster roulette and can be quite useful for downgrading difficult fights if the staff decides to roll in your favor. An amusing toy to mess with, or potentially a powerful tool of destruction. An absolutely perfect item to complement the god of madness. Sanguine's quest is kind of a pain in the ass for the wrong reasons. He wants us to crash a dinner party at the castle in Lyowin by casting a certain spell on the countess and her dinner guests. Getting into the party requires a certain level of fame, or just to be wearing items of a certain gold value. The problems start when we try to cast the spell. It's an area spell, and getting it to affect the entire party can require some trial and error. Unfortunately, casting the spell counts as assault, and the guards are very fast to stop you, really only letting you cast it once before they grab you and start trying to hack you to pieces or drag you off to jail. This means you'll probably reload more than a couple times until you find the right guest you need to hit to get everyone. Once the spell works, we'll realize everyone in the room has been stripped naked, including us. We gotta run out of town with the guards chasing us, trying not to get torn apart by the guards since we lack any sort of armor. Once we're out of town, we can travel back to the shrine where Sanguine will be pleased, erasing our bounty and returning all of our items back to us. He then rewards us with Sanguine's Rose, which will summon a random Daedra that will attack the target for 20 seconds. I mean, it's alright, and it's a unique effect that can't be found anywhere else in the game, but its use is very limited and just served as the item I sacrificed for opening the portal to paradise in the main story. Farmina's quest has us retrieving her orb from a wizard who stole it from her. She directs us to his tower, where upon entering it we find it all out of sorts and filled with Daedra. The orb has transformed his tower into a living nightmare and has also trapped him in an endless nightmare. It's a visually interesting dungeon to explore, and the reward for it is a skull of corruption. This item allows us to make exact copies of NPCs that will attack other NPCs. It's a fun little tool for creating havoc in towns It can be coupled with some other unique staves and some illusion spells to wreak some serious havoc. This just leaves Hermaeus Mora, who requires us to complete all the other shrines before we can start his. Getting to his shrine is the most arduous of them all, but at the top we get a view unlike any of the others in the game. It's a neat little touch putting the Prince of Forbidden Knowledge's shrine looking down at the rest of the world. His quest is also a unique one. He wants us to collect souls from all of the races in the game. This basically just means finding members of each race, casting the unique soul trap spell on them, and then killing them. The easiest way to do this is just to travel between all the shrines and sacrificing their souls to the prince. This is ideal because all 10 races are represented throughout the shrines. These NPCs are completely useless to us now, and they are all in remote places, so murdering them won't incur any bounties. We could also hunt down bandits and vampires if we don't want to resort to murdering NPCs, but in the spirit of performing a task for Daedric Prince, I opted for the murder route. Once we got one of every soul, we returned to the shrine for the reward. 
We are given Agma Infinium, a powerful skill book that allows us to pick one of three paths. The path of steel, the path of shadow, or the path of spirit, correlating to the more familiar combat, stealth, and magic roles respectively. This then boosts two of the related attributes and three of the related skills by 10 points each. A very useful item for the last few difficult to attain levels, or for pushing skills and attributes past their max. The acquisition of Ogmen's Infinium signals the end of the Daedric Shrine questline. It's a fun little diversion that often serves as a nice capstone following the major quest content of the game, while also showering the player in gear that really ought to have been more integrated into the quest instead, as these short and simple tasks provide much better rewards than most of the major quests in the game. You were right about one thing, though. This is my game, and I'm changing the rules. There are quite a few side quests that we can pick up throughout the world that aren't affiliated with any sort of guild or faction. These are usually just little standalone adventures that sometimes have a little story attached to them, and sometimes not. This is pretty much what I would consider the cutting room floor of content for Oblivion. What we get as side quests mostly should never have seen the light of day, but in an attempt to add more to the world that feels quite barren of things to do outside of what we've already explored, Bethesda squeezed these in. Some of these quests are so bad they make the Mage's Guild quests look good in comparison, while most of them are just mind-numbingly bland and forgettable. I'm not going to go into most of them because that would just be a tremendously tedious and boring diversion. Some of them are worth looking at as they are genuinely decent or just so horrible they deserve a look at as a cautionary example of how to not make a quest in this game. We'll start things off in the city of Anvil where we find a totally trustworthy fellow selling a mansion in town for real low cheap. He says he needs to sell the place quick to finally tie up his loose ends in Anvil and move to the Imperial City so he's willing to let the place go for such a song. Smelling a great opportunity to get in on the ground level of a clearly up-and-coming neighborhood, we part with the 5,000 gold and get the deed to our new place. It's not much to look at, but Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither is a real estate empire. All the thoughts of future investment opportunities has us tired, though, so it's time to catch some shut-eye. We are startled awake by a sudden chill in the air, only to find three ghosts in the room with us. A struggle for survival ensues, and only when all three ghosts are defeated does it dawn on us. This place is haunted! That's why it was so cheap. The rest of the quest has us tracking down the seller and having him help us lift the curse on the place. The original owner and the source of the curse was a long distant relative of his who became a hermit and began dabbling in the dark magics. He eventually succeeded in turning himself into a lich who we accidentally awaken when we break into his secret crypt in the basement of the house. It's actually a really interesting and unique quest by Oblivion standards that helps add a little flair to one of the houses we can purchase in the game and was really not something I expected to stumble across when I first played through the game, and I was like, oh shit, I can buy a mansion? It's not long or intricate, but it's great for adding some much needed flavor to a game that, for the most part, can feel lacking in the adventure department. Especially when it's got quest chains like the Mage's Guild that feels more like busy work rather than exciting adventure. Stumbling across something like this, something so easily missed, creates this feeling of discovery. An unexpected voyage falls along similar lines as the mansion quest, as it has us being taken out to sea aboard a ship turned in once we spend a night in one of its rooms. It turns out a crew of pirates hijacked the inn, managing to set it to sea in an attempt to buy some time to locate a rumored treasure hidden somewhere aboard. It's a dumb easy quest, probably fit for a level 1 character, but there's some amusing dialogue, and emerging from below deck to see we are quite literally out at sea is a neat little trick. This is one of those simple little quests that use the context of its premise to sell an otherwise ordinary and easy to make world space, and ends up creating a neat 10 minute diversion that ends up feeling more rewarding and interesting than the more elaborate quests in Oblivion. Some of the more memorable side quests stand out simply because they take us to some interesting locales. Through a Nightmare Darkly, for instance, takes us to another Nightmare Realm, but one that is more interesting than the one we went to for an Amira's quest. Here we are helping a fellow Mages Guild member rescue her friend from a dream world of his own creation. Turns out he got stuck there and forgot certain aspects of himself, so we are required to perform four tests. A test of perception, a test of resolve, a test of courage, and a test of patience. Each test has some sort of puzzle-like objective associated with it. Nothing mind-bending, but it's a nice little tromp through a unique looking setting. The brush with death has us looking for a famous painter who's gone missing. Turns out he managed to get himself stuck in a painting he was making because his paintbrush is, in fact, magical and allows him to make great art without any effort or creativity on his part. 
The quest itself is brain dead simple as it just has us fighting some trolls, but it's the world that we get transported to that makes it noteworthy. I said in an earlier video, Oblivion has this painted sort of aesthetic to it. Well, this world takes that idea literally. But the locale is really all that's worth noting about this quest, so let's move on. Canvas the castle has is getting involved in an investigation to find a painting that had been stolen in Castle Coral. The Countess charges us with tracking the painting down and bringing the thief to justice. It's noteworthy as it actually gives us a few choices and is relatively open-ended. The Countess gives us a list of people to talk to, some keys and permission to all the areas in the castle, and says go find the painting. It's a refreshing break from the usual quest marker following most of the other side quests tend to be, and has us connecting albeit very few dots to come up with a suspect. A little love triangle is exposed and we end up having the option to turn in the thief or not. But any list of great open-ended oblivion quests would be invalid without mentioning paranoia. There's a wood elf named Glarthir in Skingrad whom everyone thinks is a little, uh, odd. He accosts us and enlists our aid in exchange for lots of gold. His whole thing is that he believes there is some sort of conspiracy against him in town and he wants us to uncover evidence of it being true or not. Really, he's just asking for us to tell him he's right. Each time we meet in the secret spot behind the chapel at night, he gives us a name of a suspect and details why he believes they are suspect. Usually it's because he thinks they stare at him too long or something. So he asks us to follow them, see what they're doing, who they are talking to, and report back to him. Now, we could do our due diligence and trail our targets, but the game doesn't actually force us to do any of that. There's never a point where a message box pops up and says, okay, looks like they aren't suspect. Meaning we can just lie and tell them whatever we want. So really, that just means one thing. The best thing to do is confirm his worst suspicions and tell him that each suspect is indeed part of conspiracy and that he's totally onto something. And so it all falls into place. Yes, yes, it all makes sense now. Here. This is your last task. Here's the gold, as promised. I always pay my debts, and then some. Do the last task in that note, and I will pay you much, much more. This eventually drives him over the edge, and he gives us one last task, which is to murder who he believes is the ringleader of the entire conspiracy. From here, we got three options actually murder the NPC, turn Glarthir over to the guards, or tell the target about Glarthir's madness and let street justice be carried about. Being an agent of chaos, I naturally choose the last option, but there's no right or wrong way of handling this quest. And if we end up breaking into Glarthir's house, we find all sorts of clues into his madness and get a sense of just how long he's been concocting this conspiracy theory. It truly is a fantastic quest that makes good use of the layered systems Bethesda built and helps do some of the world building and characterization I can't get enough of when quests do it right in Oblivion. It lets us choose whatever path we want to choose without impediment or judgment. It's truly a one of a kind quest in this game that has me making a save before starting it just so I can try different things to see how the game will react. But I guess it's about time to finally put the quests to bed. We've been going through them for two videos now, looking at some of the best and worst Oblivion has to offer. There's a few other side quests that are notable for one reason or another, but I've beaten a point to death long enough. When I started, I said there's something of a pattern or a formula a lot of Oblivion's quests follow. A template, perhaps. The problem with quests in this sort of game is that conventional wisdom might lead someone to think that quests in general are a violation of the underlying design philosophies of the game. A game that's all about player freedom, freedom to explore, freedom to develop, and freedom to interact with the world however the player wants, wouldn't be able to work with something as restrictive as quests. This is where buzzwords like emergent gameplay might start to pop up as designers and players alike believe these games can only be enjoyable when the player is the one in the driver's seat making their own stories and their own fun. I disagree with that notion though. What always stuck out as the better quests were the ones that utilized certain parts or all the parts of the game's sandbox. Quests like Paranoia Who Done It has the player toying with the Radiant AI, trying to figure out NPC habits. Many Thieves Guild quests, while not designing the quests entirely around those AI routines, still implemented them to create immersive mini-puzzles the player had to work through in order to successfully complete jobs. 
These quests might ask players to utilize aspects of stealth, combat, persuasion, and a little bit of problem solving and detective work to see things get done. They might just pose an open-ended objective, build a small slice of the Oblivion sandbox, and then tell the player, use what you got and what you know to get it done. All of those quests end up being the most enjoyable gameplay-wise. I understand those are also the most difficult quests to design, as they require a ton of testing to make sure things don't break, but it's also acceptable if they only create the illusion of total openness, and instead, there's really only a few paths that are open for the player to explore. So long as there are options available and an aspect of exploration, it will be a million times more rewarding than the duller formula we see a whole lot more of in Oblivion. That formula usually devolves into either running around chasing quest markers that lead us by the nose from one scripted dialogue or combat sequence to another scripted event, being fed piecemeal, dull exposition heavy dialogue spewed from characters we barely know and don't care to know because they are just disposable vehicles for this dialogue. Or even worse, we are given an objective like kill all the enemies in a dungeon or go into a dungeon and retrieve an item. This just places the burden of creating the quest content onto the player instead of leaving it in the hands of the game designer. The dungeon diving quests are some of the laziest and cheapest forms of quests in Oblivion, and probably the most plentiful as well. It sidesteps the issue of how do we make a quest that any player of any playstyle can complete by just replacing all the challenge with a dull combat experience we can get on our own by just loading into one of the 200 dungeons floating around in the wilderness. It's the simplest and least rewarding solution to that omnipresent problem the designers always seem to be plagued by. And I believe they overestimated that problem, though. When looking at the two best guilds in the game, we can see that it's rather simple to compel the player to play through quests a certain way. It's fine if the designers make quests that necessitate stealth, murder, and theft, so long as the gameplay experience is fun and rewarding when the player sticks to those predefined paths. The player most likely will be fine with playing a more restrictive slice of the game if it gives them an experience they can't get anywhere else in the game on their own. I can't orchestrate the deaths of an entire house full of party guests, which is why Whodunit is so much fun even though it discourages me from just walking in and butchering all of them. It's the unique gameplay options and the dialogue and just the thrill of being the puppeteer that makes the quest so enjoyable. I'm willing to roll with it because it's a rewarding experience. The designers just have to learn to trust the players and not make so many sacrifices on the altar of accessibility. We just got one last topic to cover before we hit the conclusion, and it's something altogether different. So I'll see you in the next, where we'll cover my favorite DLC of all time. The Shivering Isles is easily my favorite DLC or expansion I've ever played. When you take my favorite game of all time and then add a 20 hour long expansion that improves on almost every aspect of the base game, you got what must be by default my favorite DLC of all time. And when I say improves on almost every aspect of the game, I'm not being hyperbolic. But we got a lot of ground to cover so let's just get right into this thing. A mysterious door has opened up in the middle of the Nibbin Bay near Brazil, and upon swimming halfway across the bay and making landfall, we are greeted by all sorts of strange plant life and geography, or at least strange by Cyrodiil standards. At the fucked up looking door, we get a glimpse of what lays in store for us. I'd stay back from that door if I were you. Nothing that's gone in has come out right. I don't know where it came from, and I don't want to. Those who've gone in have come back out... wrong. I'm just here to warn folks to stay away. Look for yourself! Their brains are addled! Got no sense! Perfectly normal people went in there! And this is what's come out. Ha! It's your funeral! I'm just here to warn people, not keep them out. Go ahead in! I'll be here to clean up the mess when you come out. Intrigued, we step through. Yeah. 
Yes, what can I do for you? I imagine you're here about the door. Yes, you have entered, and now you are here. Amazing, truly. I am Haskell, Chamberlain to the Lord Sheogorath. You approach the Shivering Isles. Through the door behind me lies the realm of Sheogorath, Prince of Madness, Lord of the Never There. Because my lord wills it to be so. It poses no danger to Mundus. No compact has been violated. It is a doorway, an invitation. Perhaps you will accept it for what it is. We get the sense our boy Haskell here has been doing these introductions a lot as a fleet. As he himself says, the door is an invitation to any and all who may wish to enter. Intriguingly, he mentions that no compacts have been violated, referring to the Cold Harbor Compact that ordinarily forbids Daedric Princes from interfering with Mundus. So already we are seeing the story making use of the established Elder Scrolls lore to explain itself, adding more depth to the universe as a whole. This is not the last time we will see this, and I probably won't make mention of it that often because the writers really try to utilize the lore, and of course expand upon it, and I just don't feel like interrupting myself every time an example pops up. Haskell isn't convinced we aren't just another hapless adventurer whom the Isles will swallow whole. If we want to prove our worth to Lord Sheogorath, then we will have to make it to his palace in the capital city New Sheoth on the other side of the island. Of course, getting there won't be easy as we got a whole foreign realm full of crazy people and homicidal monsters wanting to swallow us whole. Oh, and we also got a 12 foot tall indestructible juggernaut guarding the only way into the Isles. Quite certain he has seen the last of us, Haskell vanishes beyond the door and the room just bursts into butterflies and flies away. The land of the Mad God immediately lives up to its name. It would be easy for me to go on and on about how strange it is, how cool and alien the land is, how beautiful and deadly everything is, how much I love the fact that they split the island into two distinct biomes for much added variety, and just… I could just go on for hours really. I won't though, I'll just let the game speak for itself. If you've been watching the other parts leading up to this, and of course if you've played the Shivering Isles, you'll immediately know just how different the Isles are compared to Cyrodiil. Different in a very good way, too. It's like they took the criticism that Cyrodiil was very bland and boring to heart and just went, what would be the most interesting and unique place we can set an expansion in? I don't know, how about the Realm of Insanity? I really wouldn't be surprised if that's how it really went, because I can't help but feel like this expansion was in response to something. At a few junctions of the game, particularly with Haskell, the game will make mention of things that feel like a jab at the criticisms that I myself have made in this video series. It's a little surreal and just fucking brilliant, because they really nailed this locale. When it comes to any location in any Elder Scrolls game, I don't think anything quite compares to what Bethesda managed to do with the Shivering Isles. But continuing on, it's not long before we get to meet our first Shivering Isle residents in the city of Passwall. And oh boy, are they a bunch, all right. They should have listened to me. We'll be swimming in blood soon. Yuck. Let's go watch. Just as long as we don't catch any of their diseases, adventurers always get strange diseases. Come on, it'll be fun watching them get knocked around up there. I'll lead, you'll follow. Just don't get any blood on me. We make it to the Gates of Madness, only to watch a group of adventurers get slaughtered by the Gatekeeper. Unfortunately, we gotta get through those gates, and the Gatekeeper has the keys sewn up inside him. Asking around Passwall leads us to the village hunter who... I can only describe as having a real affection for bones. I'm J-Red Ice Veins. Do you ever wonder why things look better without their skin on? For instance, you can only really see the bones when you take them out. You can hear them better that way, too. I want him dead. I need him dead. His bones are calling to me. Rumor has it you want him dead, too. If you're any good with a lockpick, we can help each other out. We can get into the gardens of flesh and bone. 
They say the gatekeeper's magical. I don't believe in magic, but I do believe in bones. And the best way to kill something is with the bones of its own. I can see the bones of a dead gatekeeper in the courtyard of the gardens. The door's locked, though. You'll pick that lock, and I'll collect the bones. Then I'll make some arrows, and we'll kill the gatekeeper. Sound good? After some creepy psychopath dialogue, we agree to help him on his quest to kill the gatekeeper. This simply involves breaking into the gardens of flesh and bone, killing some fat material for the bone man, and grabbing some bones from the dead gatekeeper so bone man can make us some bone arrows. It's going to take time for him to fashion these arrows, giving us some time to snoop around past while some more. Try not to cough on me. I need a bath. Doing so reveals an interesting tidbit about Romina, the crazy powerful and also just plain crazy mage who created the gatekeeper. Every night she goes and visits the gatekeeper to talk to him and gets all weepy and apparently her tears have an adverse effect on the daedra bound inside the gatekeeper. So we go drop by while she's having one of her nightly sob sessions and nab her tear soaked handkerchief like a true creep and squeeze out the tears into bottles to act as a poison against the gatekeeper. I have to interrupt myself again here and just make mention about how the expansion in the first 15 minutes of us getting here is already encouraging us and rewarding us for exploring, talking to NPCs, and just going off the beaten path, even in its main quest. Once again, this is not an anomaly, and judging by how many things made me go, oh shit, I'm glad I poked around here, I never would have caught this little secret, I know there are 10 more secrets I didn't catch this playthrough. There were no quest markers leading me by the nose to learn about Realmina. I just happened to stumble upon it because I wanted to talk to the crazy people of Passwall and hear what crazy things they had to say. And that speaks volumes to the impact good dialogue can have on the drive to explore. At one point in the Mage's Guild quest, did we have a desire to talk to our fellow guildmates when there wasn't a quest marker over their heads? The answer is never. Just another thing Bethesda seemed intent on changing in the expansion. We meet back up with Bone Man, who's got the arrows, and with them, we are ready to take down the big boy. Using his mother's tears and the bone arrows, we take him down right quick, and then it's a matter of grabbing the keys and heading through the gates of madness. Haskell materializes to patronize, I mean congratulate us, but insists our work has only begun, and we still need to actually make it to New Sheoth. We have two doors we could go through, one leading to the vibrant and deadly land of Mania, and the other leading to the dark and also deadly land of Dementia. Both lead to New Sheath, but both will provide very different experiences befitting their climate. Haskell tells us that in the Shivering Isles, choices matter, which, like I said, is one of those moments where Haskell is knocking on the fourth wall a little. I opt to take the road through Mania as it would probably look better on camera and because I always go through Dementia as it is my personal favorite of the two. I don't have problems or anything, I, I, I swear. The road to New Sheath is as welcoming as to be expected, that is to say, it isn't. We are ambushed constantly along the way by nightmarish monsters that attack with frightening ferocity and will constantly stunlock us, poison us, or just deplete our health with alarming speed. Thanks to the virtues of level scaling, coming to the Isles as a higher leveled character as I prefer to do makes it into a challenging post-game segment that turns a lot of what we've come to expect from Oblivion on its head. Enemies have more robust fight patterns and are more difficult to cheese and use a variety of attacks and spells that make having an equally as varied arsenal of spells, weapons, and defenses a benefit and not a pointless exercise like in Cyrodiil. All in all, while the creatures of Cyrodiil were some of the dullest enemies in the game, the creatures of the Shivering Isles are challenging, frightening, and fun to fight. Navigating the land itself is most certainly interesting, but strangely more restrictive than Cyrodiil. There's tons of hills and mountains all over the place that create obvious paths through the landscape that serve to connect points of interest. While you can fairly easily hop out of these valleys, especially with high speed and acrobatics, Doing so will serve to get you very lost, and more times than not make you think you've accessed a place that developers never intended on letting players see. It's a strange level design philosophy that really doesn't mesh with the navigational cues we've picked up from Cyrodiil. Over there, you really could pick any direction and just start walking in that way, and generally hit no obstacles. You'll probably leave the comfort and safety of the main roads, but it will never feel like you're heading into restricted areas of the game map itself. In the Shivering Isles, that just isn't the case, and in media more so than dementia. 
the landscape is also very difficult to read for finding paths and roads, and so even if you're making a concerted effort to stick to the routes after realizing venturing too far off of them is hazardous to your actual sanity, you'll find yourself quite often veering off course anyway, particularly when following quest markers. It doesn't ruin the experience and in a way helps make the aisles feel larger, but it's something anyone traversing the land will notice, especially coming from 50 hours in Cyrodiil. My journey through Mania was mostly uneventful, aside from the constant enemy ambushes that were serving to condition me towards the more challenging combat of the Isles. I did stumble across a camp where this fringe mage was in possession of a book that talked about the various ruins across the Isles. It's one of those rare times where an in-game book did just the right amount of world building to explain what might seem like a plot hole, foreshadow future story reveals, and leave the player with more questions than they had before finding the book. This book immediately had me looking through bookshelves in the aisles for anything I didn't recognize from Cyrodiil in the hopes they would be just as enlightening. The book points out that all the ruins around the aisles date back to older eras that each ended with a realm destroying apocalypse of sorts. The author reveals that according to his research and calculations, the next apocalypse could be any day now. The book isn't dated or anything, so it just as easily could have belonged to a previous era. But the fact that it is in possession of a zealot mage in the woods hints that at least these crazed mages believe it to be true. We finally make it to the City of Madness, and like the rest of the world, it is split into two distinct cities. The Manic City of Bliss, and the Demented City of Crucible. In Bliss, we meet more colorful NPCs, one of whom is terrified of falling asleep because he believes the walls might fall on him while he's sleeping. He asks us to find a place for him to sleep at night, outside and away from any walls. In doing so, we meet the first person in the Isles who seems to still have all of his faculties. He insists he isn't crazy and he doesn't belong in the Isles, but that only begs the question of why he's still here then. What does this say about the player then? Are we the only sane ones here, or are we the craziest of them all? Anyway, the not crazy what elf, once convinced this isn't some trick, agrees to exchange his bedroll outside with Wallman's indoor bed. The reward ends up being just a scroll that would be very situationally useful, but considering the quest took all of about two minutes to complete, I can't complain. We make it to the Palace of Sheogorath and enter the throne room, and the interior design of the place creates the impression that all roads lead straight to this one man, or god, demon, entity thing that chooses to look like a man. Well, all roads and all things lead to Sheogorath, and all things flow from him. This is his realm, and there's no question about that. Respect him, or else. It turns out Haskell does not own a monopoly on all the patronizing in the realm, as Sheogorath is slow clapping as we approach and informs us that we are the first mortals to make it this far, and, well, that has to count for something, right? He has certain designs for us, but we aren't ready to hear it all just yet. Though it does involve stopping the Great March, whatever that is. He's got some errands he needs us to run, one of which is getting the Fortress of Zedalian operational again. It's a place where unwanted visitors to the Isles used to be sent before the Gatekeeper was created. But seeing as we just slayed the Gatekeeper to get in, that's not really an option, and Shergorth insists there are certain types he does not want having free access to the Isles. This first introduction to Shergorth is really quite something. It's one of those standout conversations that still burned into my brain from the first time I played this expansion over a decade ago. In fact, most of Shergorth's disturbing and amusing lines have really stuck with me, partly because they were just great lines, and partly because he's the only character in Oblivion who seems to have any sense of humor. Moments of levity and humor are far and few between in this game, but the writers definitely had some fun with Shergorth, finding what I believe is the perfect balance between pure madness, scatterbrained tangents, unsettling homicidal machinations, and moments of true clairvoyance. At no point do I find myself questioning why the Isles are the way they are, or doubting that a place such as this could or would function the way it is presented. Had they made him a total nonsensical moronic asshat like, say, Peter Griffin, I would never have been able to believe he could actually manage a realm as diverse and intricate as the Isles. Had he been too logical and clear-headed, well, then why would he be called the Mad God? On the surface, writing a character like Shergorath seems like it would be easy, and while technically I guess it would be pretty difficult to fuck him up too much, it's still not an easy task to get him exactly right either. And I think they did get him just right because he never ever becomes obnoxious, which is the biggest concern to be had when writing a crazy off-the-walls character. He doesn't overstay his welcome, and his dialogue is probably some of the most nuanced we see in the entire game. It's fucking crazy that the God of Madness is the most elegantly written character in this game, but it is what it is. Shergorth is awesome. Moving on. We get scooted off to Zedillion, and it's here we get our first real dungeon diving experience in the expansion. 
and keeping in line with everything else so far, it's quite an improvement over its Cyrodiil counterpart. The Shivering Isles only employs two types of dungeons. Shivering Isle Ruins, which are like if Imperial Forts and Alien Ruins had a baby, and Underground Root Systems, which are just much more interesting cave systems. Some of these fortress complexes can be incredibly large, with tons of branching, interconnecting corridors. These corridors are loaded with traps, treasures, secrets, and of course, plenty of monsters. They all tend to be quite large, especially when compared to some of the ones in Cyrodiil, and more attention and care was put into the designs. But they still use the kit-like systems that allowed the devs to stitch them together, still making them feel more artificial and maybe even pre-generated as opposed to handcrafted. They're fine when measured in small doses, and thankfully that's exactly what the main story does for the most part. But that's jumping ahead, we gotta get Zedillion up and running first. The objective of this quest is quite simple, but once again, an improvement over what we saw previously. A group of Grumites has moved into Zedillion since it fell into disrepair, and the grubby little monsters have yanked the power crystals from their pedestals and turned them into religious staves. We gotta cleanse the place of their presence, take back the crystals, and retune the giant obelisk that acts as a beacon of sorts that attracts intrepid adventurers to Zedillion in the first place. Grumites are interesting for several reasons. First, they are a lot like goblins in Cyrodiil. In fact, they are almost identical to goblins, except that they are more fun to fight. They use lots and lots of poisons and are very wily in movement. Most of them don't have a ton of health, but they can mess you up, especially if they start ganging up on you. But what's more interesting is that they seem to have a sort of tribal proto-civilization going on. They have a religion with these cool looking totems, and sometimes you might find statues of them in the wild. I'm assuming they built them because why the fuck would people make statues of monsters? They also have a class system of sorts, and they make their own weapons and shields. There's probably some lore in the game explaining them further, but it's nice that even on the surface we're getting an enemy that has more care and attention given to him. Unfortunately for them, that doesn't stop us from purging them from the halls of this facility. So, with their numbers decimated and their religious artifacts violated, we have ourselves an adventurer mousetrap once more. Just in time too, because we got a party coming in to answer the siren call of the obelisk. The dungeon master, who has been presumably sitting in these dungeon ruins for who knows how long waiting for Shergoth to light the place up again, gives us a crash course on how this place runs and why it exists. He tells us it's designed to attract people of a certain spirit. A spirit deemed unfit for the Isles. And it basically dooms them to being either killed or rehabilitated into insane freaks that would be more of a fit for permanent residency in the Isles. This answers some key questions about the Isles, specifically, how the hell all these people got here, and why are they all so batty? I mean, it's unrealistic to assume all these people went through Zedillion, especially since this place hasn't been up and running in quite a while, but it at least answers how some of them got here. But the problem is that you don't want to have just anyone coming into the Isles, especially ones that might be too greedy or exploitative to live in harmony with the soft-minded citizens of the Isles. So, Zedillion acts as a filter of sorts. What I like is that Bethesda actually took the time to answer these questions. I kinda stopped prodding the world of Oblivion that much just because the quests never really bothered to answer even the most basic questions and motivations of characters. So when I got to the Shivering Isles I was expecting more of the same and I would have given it a pass just because, well, hey, the landscape is more interesting. But they did take the time to come up with answers to questions players might actually have and they worked those answers into a valid, logical, and unobtrusive way. The quest isn't a search for the deep and nagging question of why do these people live here, it just happens to give us that answer along the way. Anyways, it's time for us to deal with these adventures, and that doesn't actually mean running down there and killing them. No, Zedillion is meant to play with its victims, and each of the three chambers has two different options we the player presented with. A manic choice and a demented choice. The manic choices are meant to drive the party insane, and the demented choices are meant to be rid of them in a more conventional way. Despite my inclination to all things demented in this game, I much rather prefer the manic choices in Zedillion. The first chamber lets us pump gas into the room, which basically has a party hallucinate that a tiny enemy grows to five times its original size and chases them around the chamber until one of the members goes insane. The second chamber has a giant locked cage full of treasure, and upon noticing the lock, a mountain of keys falls from the ceiling, and the greedy mage goes crazy believing the real key is somewhere in the pile. Too bad none of those keys fit the lock! <laughs> the final chamber lets us trick the orc warrior into thinking he's dead when he has an out-of-body experience and sees his unconscious body on the floor. When the illusion wears off, he snaps, thinking he's now dead. What all of these have in common is that all three crazy party members at the end sound exactly like what I have come to expect from the citizens of the Isles. 
Had I run into a Breton talking about giant monsters chasing him around, a Dunmer obsessed with finding the right key, or an orc who is convinced he is dead, I would not think for a second these characters are out of place in this game. So, yeah, I think it's safe to say Zedillion more than lives up to its intended purpose. The DM thanks us for our help and lets us take some of the loot from the party. One item in particular is a sort of great power called Dusk Fang, or Dawn Fang depending on the time of day, because this weapon changes with the day. And not only that, it also drinks the blood of its slain foes to power up and just looks fucking awesome. Once again, Bethesda went above and beyond with trying to make the unique items of the Shivering Isles actually unique and fitting with a land of madness, even though the item did technically come from Cyrodiil. It also comes with a neat little backstory told to us through the Orcs Journal. As we are heading out, we find these strange white obelisks, much like the ones we've seen in the fort and elsewhere in the Isles, rising out of the ground around us. With them spawn similar looking Knights of Order who say nothing and only make ear splitting growls that sound like someone banging trash can lids with cooking pans when they are damaged. They fight with no regards for themselves, each other, or anyone else. They're just empty killing machines, it would seem. The DM says as much, telling us that these Knights of Order are attracted to the obelisks, which makes sense why they would show up when we switched on the resonator that powers a Dillion. Regardless, he's very concerned and urges us to inform the Mad God at once. We do so and he's not very surprised. He tells us that they are the minions of the Daedric Prince Jigalag and their arrival signals the beginning of what's known as the Grey March, which is an apocalypse of sorts that happens at the end of every era, which just so happens to be right now. We are going to stop him, or at least that's what Shergorth is hoping. He's vague on the details, but he's no fan of Jigalag ruining his realm, that's for sure. To the end of wanting us to stop Jiggy, Shergorth wants us to go around and get acquainted with the two halves of the realm and the people living in it. And in another moment of unexpected self-awareness, Shergorth says he can't expect us to save the realm if we don't understand it. And maybe if we understand it, we'll understand why it should be protected. We hop on over to the other side of the palace, the darker side, where Syl, the Duchess of Dementia, resides. We find her alone, pacing around her throne room, and upon approaching her, she greets us in the most delightful manner. Her paranoia is almost as charming as her threats, and she tasks us with hunting down a conspiracy she is convinced exists, but has absolutely no evidence of it existing. I mean, with the way she has treated us in the first 10 seconds of meeting her, I'd be hard-pressed to believe there isn't a conspiracy against her too. She grants us the title of Grand Inquisitor, which is an ominously vague title perfectly suited for an ominously vague task. She pairs us up with Herdier, the court torturer, because of course the Court of Dementia has an official office for that task. And then, channeling her inner Stalin, she reminds us that if no conspiracy is found, we will be the ones held responsible. So on it is to play this game of hot potato until someone is caught holding the blame when Syl loses her patience. Down in the dungeons we get to meet Herdier, and well, he may be my favorite character yet, aside from the Mad God on Haskell. Immediately sensing a deep-rooted connection, he and I go on a little trip together to go loosen some tongues. Please, no! Oh. Please, no! Oh. Please, no more! Walk with our lord. No, no, I, I, I don't know anything about anything. I, I'm sorry. I can't help you. Please, no. I don't know anything about a conspiracy. No, please, no. The young folk just don't appreciate a good stick anymore. Shouldn't tease me like that. I hope you'll trip and fall on a sword! Please, no more. I'm afraid I have no idea what you are talking about. Please, no! Ah. You may continue to do your worst, Inquisitor. Ah. No, please, no. Ah.
I, I don't know anything about a conspiracy. Please, no! Oh. Please, no more! Pleasure and pain be with you. I don't know anything about a conspiracy. Please, no. Please, no more. I don't... No, please, no. After having burnt to a crisp several people in the court and in town, there is, in fact, a conspiracy against Syl. Who would have thought? The conspiracy involves quite a few people, and some of whom are quite close to Syl. We have to crisp a couple more people, eavesdrop in a secret meeting between an informant we managed to flip and one of Syl's bodyguards, find the informant dead a few hours later, and then finally confront the guard with evidence of her guilt. She's not very convinced, but throws the head of the conspiracy, Murreen, under the bus anyhow. She says we are going to need solid proof to make her fess up, but upon directly confronting her, she fesses up immediately. But not before saying her piece about how Syl deserves to die a painful death for consorting with the enemies. Whatever that means. Broken Clock Syl is delighted to have the conspiracy uncovered, or maybe she's just delighted to have someone to finally torture. In any case, she has Murreen taken to the dungeon, where she is given a concentrated dose of what me and her dear have been dishing out the past few days and then thanks us for our work, but not before reminding us of what happens to those who betray her. She also gives us a nice enchanted bow that will use a random effect each time it hits something. Perfect for keeping your enemies on their toes. Dementia has a few worthwhile side quests to get into. The first and my personal favorite is helping a citizen of Crucible kill himself. You see, taking your life in Shivering Isles is a terrible crime according to Shergorath. So, if someone was to do that, they would be damned for all eternity to be reborn on the hill of suicides as a ghost, forever plagued by their torments. Harris Clotumnus has no desire to endure that fate, so he basically hires us to kill him, circumventing the suicide penalty. He warns us that he doesn't want to see it coming because, well, he's a bit of a coward, but he also recommends we make it look like an accident unless we want to be charged with murder. While waiting for death to come, he will continue on his day as though nothing has changed. It's up to us to follow him around and find the right opportunity to do him the favor and mercy kill him. That opportunity comes when he goes up to the top of a tall staircase leading to the palace on the edge of town. He likes to come up here because the view helps him forget his depression, and that's when we give him the push he's been waiting his whole life for. Someone really ought to put up a railing. That happens all the time. We inherit his house on the Ring of Happiness, a macabre little reward for a quest that I probably appreciate more than is healthy. Outside of town is a village called Falmore, where a high elf more or less has enslaved two Khajiits to work the bog pits of her farm. It's a dingy place where we see two Khajiits working and occasionally causing headaches for their taskmaster. We learn the female Khajiit is just a crazy liar who spouts all manners of nonsense, and eventually, once we've earned her trust with enough illusion magic, will give us a spoon to give her husband, as he will trust us and tell us what needs to be done. Her husband is another paranoid crazy type, and once we've given him his beloved spoon he'd been looking for, he lets us in on the big secret. He believes their master has some mind-reading ability and is planning to murder him and his wife, and that's why they continue to work for her. He wishes for us to free them both by sealing her notebook where she writes down all of their thoughts all day long, and then go and trash her house because that would drive her totally insane. Upon chatting with the taskmaster and reading her notebook, I don't think she needs any more help going insane. She, uh, she seems to be already there. Regardless, we do what the cat wishes, returning to him once it's all done. We then go into the house to find his former master having a mental breakdown, and that's the end of the quest. So fucking strange and random, and acts as a reminder to never take your grip on reality for granted. Uh, we also get a nice ring with reflect spell and resist magic buffs. The final dementia side quest has us traveling to a rumored to be haunted castle on the far flung spit of land on the edge of the isles. Vytharn is absolutely haunted, as ghostly soldiers continuously replay a battle for the now crumbling and sinking ruins of the keep. It's a very eerie locale, an entire realm that is eerie and unsettling. Upon entering the keep, we meet the ghost of the Count of Vytharn, and it's here that two things can happen. Either we can tell him we mean him no harm, and he proceeds to tell us the story of the keep and why these ghosts are all over the place, 
or we insult him by telling him we wish to lift the curse on the place. Ten bucks to whoever can guess the dialogue option I accidentally chose. But you know what, I'm kinda glad I messed this up, because picking the insulting option has a count locking us in the keep and forcing us to figure everything out on our own. We are given no quest markers or really any hints and it's up to us to piece the whole thing together and find a solution to this ghost problem. This is probably the one and only time a dialogue option I haphazardly selected in Oblivion came back to bite me in the ass. At no point in Oblivion did any dialogue option carry any consequences at all, and then comes along this quest where, upon picking the wrong option, we are locked in with all these ghosts and are forced to figure out the puzzles to free ourselves and the ghosts. And that alone makes this quest noteworthy. So we gotta go around exploring every nook and cranny of the keep and the bailey outside where we find the battle of the keep is on repeat. This is probably the only quest in this game that actually made me think a little bit. I refused to use guides for any quest in Oblivion that I wasn't convinced wasn't bugged out, so it took me a few minutes to get it all figured out. Eventually I realized that I had to prevent the defending ghosts from fleeing the battlefield, which meant tracking down key items that were important to their morale or their combat effectiveness. The elf archer didn't have her arrows because the blacksmith was a dick who kept them locked up during the battle, so we brush off our thieving skills and swipe them from the armory and return them to her. Another defender was really concerned about his beloved doll, so we swipe it and burn it in one of the braziers lying around and makes him focus on the battle. I don't really know how doing that's supposed to help the guy, but okay then. Then we have the mage who runs out of magicka and needs a source of more if he's going to remain on the field. We could either give him a welkin stone, which he can use to pump up his mana, or we can give him a dagger that sucks all the magicka from whoever he slashes. Ten bucks to whoever guesses correctly which one I accidentally gave him. With the three now committed to the replaying battle, the Count finally gives us a scoop on what's going on. He admits that the falling of the keep was partially his fault as he fled the field, and the whole reason of the curse was because they were plotting against Shea Gorath a long time ago. In helping them finally defeat the attackers, the Count is convinced that we can break this curse. Thanks for the tip, finally. I mean, he would have given this to us if we hadn't insulted him at the gates, but eh, whatever. To make up for his cowardice, he gives us his helmet to go into battle wearing, and in doing so we'll clear him of his crime of cowardice. So we put it on and head out to the courtyard where we slay a ghost and free everyone from the curse. The Count thanks us, letting us keep the helmet as our reward, and that's the end of the quest. The helmet is pretty decent for heavy armor users, but the real treat is the quest itself. I did not expect to get roped into a quest that sets up some puzzles and gives us few hints and no quest markers. It's not crazy challenging or anything, but damn if it's not a fresh of breath air in a game that really holds our hand way too firm most of the time. Oddly enough, I find the keep much creepier once the ghosts are all gone. Even though I now know the true story of it and just help lift the curse on it, making it a safer place, the lack of NPCs in the rainy foggy swamp really makes the keep feel even more haunted without all the transparent NPCs around. It's probably time to put dementia aside for a while and get a little manic. Over on the other side of New Shaoth, we are meant to get a taste of Mania, and Thaden, the Duke of Mania, means to take that quite literally. He wants us to find the Chalice of Reversal, which he says helps make eating Feldu good, because consuming Feldu without the Chalice is bad. Like, really bad. Feldu helps open the mind for creative thoughts, and so he wants the Chalice so he can go back to using it. Unfortunately, he and Syl had a falling out after they had a passionate and potentially quite scandalous fling and that resulted in the chalice being hidden away. Before he gets to tell us the rest of the details, he says he's got a headache and he needs to go lie down. Don't worry, I know what that's like all too well. The appropriately named Wide Eye in Thaden's court is able to give us just a few more details, but doesn't want to tell us too much because as she puts it, Thaden wants us to experience something and she doesn't want to spoil that surprise. Whatever it is, it's going to be unpleasant to some extent, and this just delights Wide Eye. These people are starting to sound like Dementids right about now. She does tell us the chalice is in Dunroot Burrow, and the Elytra's Feldu, which we must consume in order to get in, is all part of that learning experience. So, it's off to go eat some green shit dropped by giant bugs in the middle of the woods, and wouldn't you know it, Feldu is incredibly addictive. We are hooked after just the first bite, and the only way to reverse the effects is with the chalice, which now makes sense why Thaden wants it so badly. So, being hooked on the Feldu, we got no choice now but to continue on through the root system, slaying Elytra for our Feldu fix. The dungeon experience itself would be a little bland if it wasn't for this little twist, but because the game mechanics now have us acting like desperate addicts, this quest winds up being one of the more memorable ones in the game. Even with our stupid high luck skill, the Feldu only drops just enough to make it to our next dose, leading me to think that this quest is just scripted this way. 
If we can't get enough Felder, we go into a draw and start suffering some unpleasant stat debuffs. And considering these Elytra are pretty aggressive enemies, those stat debuffs can become quite deadly. After carving a path through the cave systems, we eventually come to the Sanctum of Decadence, where a cult of Feldu addicts live in perpetual bliss, consuming tons of Feldu and using the Chalice of Reversal to stem off the negative effects. Naturally, they don't approve of us crashing their party and wanting to be off with their Chalice, so they attack us, but they're not really much of a match for us, and really nothing compared to the Elytra we've been fighting up until this point. We grab the Chalice and it's off back to Thaden. Thaden is a great contrast to the Demented Sill. While Syl ruled with fear and subterfuge, Thaden rules from people loving and needing him, though not in a good way, more like the uh, obsessive and creepy sort of way. While Syl was very, very concerned about what everyone else was doing and thinking, or not doing and not thinking, Thaden is completely aloof to everyone and everything else. He seems to just like his drugs and his art, and even we seem to hold his interest for a little more than a few fleeting moments. These two have more going on for them than even the biggest names we met back in Cyrodiil, and our time spent interacting with them was probably only about five minutes collectively. Unfortunately, there just aren't many quests related to the manic side of the realm. Most of them are just quick five-minute conversations with crazy NPCs that yield little reward aside from the dialogue. One is noteworthy not because the NPCs are crazy, but because they are all sane. In the settlement of Hale lives a former knight from Cyrodo who came to the Shivering Isles believing a serious threat lay inside when the portal opened in the Nibbin Bay. After exploring a while and being ambushed by some Grumites, he came across Hale and met his now fiancée Zoe. He explains how he no longer has any desire to return to the chaos of Cyrodiil as he's found some inner peace in the Isles, and of course, met his love. It's strange that a realm of madness would offer a former knight a place to find himself and live in peace, but that's what he tells us. His fiancée Zoe is just as clear-minded as he is and enjoys passing their time painting. I really can't blame either of them for not wanting to leave this place, they got a really nice life together here. You know, assuming the Grey March doesn't exterminate them, but no place is perfect, I suppose. I'm not really sure what to make of this settlement of sane people in the Isles. Perhaps it's meant to just show that not everyone living in the realm has to be crazy. But also, how did the knight manage to get past the gatekeeper? Certain things are just left unanswered here, and it does the world no favors by introducing plot holes. It's a tiny side quest though, and a rather dull dungeon dive to retrieve his medallion from the Grumites that ambushed him. Definitely the sort of quest that I'd grown used to in Cyrodiil, and proving that Bethesda didn't quite make this expansion flawless. Oh well, moving on. A lot of the side quests in the Shivering Isles are more like scavenger hunts more than anything else. One resident in Bliss wants us to collect tongs and calipers, both are abundant junk items, and will pay us some gold for each pair we bring. Another quest has us looking for odd and unique items to fill a museum in Crucible. These items are things like pieces of amber ore shaped like Sheogorath, a ring that will strip the wearer of everything they have equipped, and the pelvis bone of the Emperor Pelagius the Mad. Another just has us collecting two types of ores unique to the Isles and weapon and armor molds, then bringing them to a couple of smiths to get unique weapons and armor made with the materials. There's really not a whole lot to be said about any of these quests, but I do appreciate how they encouraged me to do some exploration and pay extra attention to the dungeons I was hitting for certain quests, because you never really knew where these things might turn up. The base game probably would have benefited more from a few quests like this, aside from collecting relatively useless Nern roots, but, but let's get back to Shagorth and report our progress. We've been off track long enough. We are finally ready to hear what Shagorth has planned for us. We are simply meant to replace him on the throne when Jigalag comes to destroy the realm, because every time he comes, Shagorth has to disappear, leaving the realm completely undefended. Will we become a Daedric Prince? Not exactly, but we will wield a considerable amount of power, enough to stop Jigalag, hopefully. It's simple, really, so long as we don't ask too many questions just yet. But first, we gotta put the people of New Shaelth's minds at ease. The Flame of Agnon burns above the temple in the city as a beacon of hope and a sign of Shagorth's divine power. Every time the Grey March begins, the torch goes out. This tends to make the people nervous and they begin defecting to the side of order. Shogoroth wants to prevent that as much as possible and the easiest first step is to keep that torch lit. In order to do that, we need to travel to the source of the flame, Silarn, the oldest site of ruins in the Isles and rumored to be the original capital of the realm. It also happens to be the site where the Dark Seducers and Saints are locked in perpetual combat always competing for control of the place in an attempt to become Shogoroth's favorite creations. Shogoroth doesn't really give a damn about their struggle for his attention, but he does care about that flame, so it's off to Silarn so we can keep him from getting upset and swallowing our soul. Upon arrival, we find two forces locked in a stalemate, with both sides occupying a key part of the ruins. 
In order to get the flame in the courtyard lit, we need to choose to help one side in order to tip the scales in that side's favor and uproot the other. I opted for the Dark Seducers because I'm all about Team Dementia. And then it's just a matter of standing our ground as the Saints come to us and we hold tight. Once the main commander of the opposition is slain, it's just a matter of strolling to their side and claiming the altar, sacrificing the victorious commander upon that altar, lighting ourselves with the cold flame of Agnon in the courtyard above, and making it back to the Sasalum of Arden Sul and Nushayoth. Our picking sides doesn't end at Cylarn, as there are two torches we can light in the temple, each one representing one of the sides of the city, naturally. The respective preachers wish for us to light it in their sides as honor, but considering we just purged Cylon of the Golden Sates, it's only fitting to make that a total conquest for Dementia by lighting the green fire. We get awarded a set of enchanted clothes befitting a friend of the Demented, and it's quest complete. It's a relatively short quest, but it's pretty cool getting some more insight into the two sides of the realm, and the Daedric forces that defend it. All the while, getting to make some actual decisions that, while not affecting the world a whole lot, still makes more of an impact and is more interaction than we got with anything during the main quest in the base game. But onto the next task. Sheogorth insists we need to hold some legitimate power in the realm if we are going to be accepted as the new Sheogorth. To that end, we need to replace either the Duke of Mania or the Duchess of Dementia, which kinda sucks for them, but whatever, it is what it is. This isn't going to be as simple as it might seem, as there's rules and rituals that dictate these things, and our first order of business is learning them. Upon inquiring with the priests at the temple, we learn that in order to become the next Duke of Mania, we must have the current Duke consume large amounts of a drug known as Green Moat until his heart explodes. And then, we take his drug-tainted blood to the altar in the temple. In order to replace the current Duchess of Dementia, we must carve out Sil's heart and bring it to the altar in the temple. Either way, it's a real rough deal for the current ruler. In keeping with the spirit of things thus far, I'm opting to replace the Duchess of Dementia. Also because I've never actually done this one before. We head on over to the Court of Dementia where the throne is empty. Upon asking her aides, we learn Scylla is now in hiding as she fears she has lost the favor of the Mad God, whom she now thinks wishes her replaced. Once again, Broken Clock Scylla is right, but this time there will be no way for her to torture her way out of this conspiracy. Her aides agree to flip to our side and we press deeper into the palace only to find her body on the bed already. Her aide insists though that this is just a body double she likes to deploy in order to throw off would-be assassins, and that she must have slipped down the secret escape tunnels in the courtyard to her underground fortress designed to ambush the ambusher. The next dungeon crawling segment is ceaseless ambushes mixed with dodging traps like these damage dealing statues, an appropriate place for the rule of the demented to have access to. Her guards are understandably on high alert, and it takes quite a bit of time and battling to finally make it to Syl, who is now armed and armored and ready for a fight to the death. Unfortunately for her, she's up against someone who has more titles than any king or emperor back in Mundus, and her seat of power is merely another title we the player will possess on our road to having the grandest title yet. It really sucks to be Syl, but I was surprised she even had a heart to take. Doubt she will really be missed all that much. Back at the temple, we burn her heart to be awarded the Duke of Dementia, only to learn that there is in fact a single person in this realm who would actually miss that crazy sadistic lady. Her former lover and Duke of Mania, Thaden, confronts Sheogorath over the sanctioned assassination and replacement of his beloved Syl, all performed by a mortal outsider no less. Thaden, possessing more backbone than I thought possible from the little wood elf junkie, defies the mad god and abandons his post. Outright stating he's gonna go work for Jigalag because what Shergorath is doing is too crazy even for him. Shergorath lets the former Duke go and tells us not to pay the falling out too much mind. This is just to be expected in times such as this, and seeing as this has never actually happened before, this might mean his plan is actually working. Thaden informed us that the Order had taken the fringe, and this is the thing Shergorath wants us to worry about next. We need to head off their advance there if we want to stop them from breaking into the rest of the aisles and sweeping through it. So, it's back to the fringe where we came through a little while earlier as the naive, wide-eyed adventurer. And well, you should know at this point how much I enjoy these return to where you started tropes. The fringe is looking a lot worse for wear these days though, as Order has stripped almost all signs of life in the region, aside from the few seducers left fighting for their lives in the abandoned site of Passwall. After fighting off a few waves of knights, we learned that the tower that had been just another enigmatic fixture of the town for years is actually acting as some sort of portal for these invaders. We need to gain access to it through the ancient ruins of Zedaphin, which are now accessible thanks to the deforestation efforts of the side of Order, whom apparently just hate anything colorful and lively. So that's where we head to next, fighting more knights along the way. In the ruins, it's another bog-standard dungeon run that have just become too commonplace in this game to really present anything worth discussing. 
At the end though, we have a boss fight around a giant obelisk, and upon deactivating it, the dungeon experience gets flipped on its head when the ruins begin to collapse and it turns into a mad dash to escape being crushed from all the falling rocks and pillars. It's very easy to get hit in rapid succession by these rolling boulders that can eat a ton of health even if they just tap your toe at half a mile an hour. So spamming health spells as we try to find our way out of an ever-shifting maze of corridors becomes the new name of the game. Despite it feeling a little cheesy, it's a fun segment that has the designers using things we've seen a few times in the game to make a unique experience. We skip to the surface of a now devastated fringe, but at least all the knights are dead, and the forces of order have been foiled for the time being anyway. It's time to head back to Shagorth and report yet another victory. His investment in us is clearly starting to pay off. With the fringe cleared for now, it's time to secure it permanently by bringing in a new gatekeeper. I really do love this quest, even if it involves the longest and most arduous dungeon crawl we've seen yet. It's just full of neat little segments, particularly the Fortress of Zeselum, where Ralmina works tirelessly to perfect her understanding of her proposed fifth element, flesh. Shergoroth also seems to have a bit of a thing for the crazy powerful mage, possibly because of her power, or possibly because of her sadistic insanity. She may be a big fan of the Mad God, but we probably top her shit list for having killed what she quite seriously thinks of as her child. She's delighted to make a new gatekeeper, but it's a very involved process to make such an indestructible beast. She spent years cultivating the materials necessary to construct them in the Gardens of Flesh and Bones, and that's going to be our next destination. Before that though, it's worth taking a look around her lab, which can best be described as a torture prison befitting some sort of Second World War crime against humanity. She insists everyone sent in here as a volunteer, but uh, I doubt that. All over the place we get to see many of her live experiments and get access to some of her research notes, and they help paint her as a sadistic, if not brilliant, magician. And I gotta give credit to Bethesda here for taking the time to design this place with all these scripted little experiments. It really does wonders to elevate Romina's character and addresses that point I made back during my Mages Guild video where I complained how we never really saw any reason to believe anyone in the Mages Guild actually possessed an ounce of magical talent and were only meant to buy into the whole thing through the name of the guild and the titles those empty NPCs possess. And of course, that didn't work, and led to some of the greatest dissonance I had experienced in the entire game. It wouldn't have taken much for me to buy into Ralmina's expertise, especially with what comes later, but this lab just makes this whole segment feel so convincing and end up being just so damn memorable. So it's off to the Gardens of Flesh and Bone, only this time we aren't getting something to kill a gatekeeper, but collecting the four essences needed to construct a new beast. Most of it is just following quest markers through lengthy dungeon quarters. Although the segment for retrieving the Essence of Breath has us following a green mist through a maze of roots to its source, which is a little neat. Back at the lab, Romina, who doesn't seem to be warming up to us in the slightest, instructs us to go pick the parts she has in one of her chambers to construct the new gatekeeper. She made multiples of each appendage, giving us a selection to choose from, and allowing us to basically design the new gatekeeper. Some of these parts will imbue the gatekeeper with certain stat bonuses or resistances, and of course make him look different. It doesn't really matter, truth be told, once he's set loose we really won't see him again, and his combat effectiveness is completely irrelevant. So feel free to pick what will make him look cool and start making your way to the fringe. Before the Gates of Madness, on the site of where we slew the previous gatekeeper, Ralmina has prepared a witch's cistern of sorts for her new creation. In probably the most visually striking sequence in the entire game, we get to help her bring this beast to life. First, place the gatekeeper's body into the cistern of substantiation. Place the gatekeeper's body into the cistern of substantiation. At the beginning of the worlds were five. Fire, water, earth, air, and light. Darkness turned into day. The void took form. Hidden away by virtue of its own self-awareness was the sixth, containing within it the five which birthed it. Flesh! Meat! With the desire to consume like fire, place the dermis membrane into the sister. Blood, liquid nutrition, that ocean which casts pearls of light upon the shores of existence. Place the blood liquor into the cistern of substantiation. Bones, branch, stone of the body, giving shape and structure. Place the osseous marrow into the cistern. Breath, child of air, bestowing movement, the stirring of spirit. Place the essence of breath into the cistern of substantiation. And last, the light of flesh, the illumination. 
Imagination of soul, perception, thought, memory, imagination. I summon thee, walker in flesh, flesh of true flesh, from those waters of oblivion which sire thy kind. Come to this altar, join with this body, quintessence of flesh, join with the essence of flesh, absolute, immortal, immortal, bound, contingent. Stand clear of the cistern, over here by me. Honored Daedra, fear not thy abasement. Thou shalt be the holy in this temple. I bind thee, Atronach, to this body. Henceforth, gatekeeper of the Shivering Isles. My child, it is time to fulfill your destiny. Stand guard in this land against all those who seek entry, not bearing the mark of Sheagorath's favor. You shall know them by the coldness of your minds. The darkness of spirit. And just like that, we got ourselves a new gatekeeper. As an added treat, we get to watch the new gatekeeper wreck shop as a group of knights come foolishly to attack him. Back at the palace, we learn Jigalag is getting more desperate and is attempting to use Sutterfuge to sabotage the forces of the realm. And it's here Shergoroth drops the biggest surprise on us yet. Well, aren't you precious? Do you really not know? Haven't you noodled it all through yet? Because he is me! I'm him! We're a bit of each other, really. I, I won't be here when he arrives because I'll be him! Happens every time. The Grey March starts, order appears, and I become Jigalag and wipe out my whole realm! So this explains quite a bit, but also ends up spawning even more nagging questions that we will have to start hunting for the answers to. And I just love plots that do this. Plots that have the player asking questions and hunting down answers are really the best plots. It gets the player truly engaged in the story and the world and the characters. And at this point, I should just keep replaying a soundbite of me saying how this wasn't something we saw in the main game, because I've just run out of unique ways of saying that. Now, it's off to Belrock, the home of the saints, to take care of this surprise attack by the forces of order. It's pretty much a linear dungeon crawl, except we get some allies and environmental puzzles to make it feel a little bit different. But like with all the other dungeon crawls, there just isn't much to say. We learn how the saints and seducers are reborn, and that's really what Belrock is intended function is. It's the place where the saints are reborn at when they are slain after their spirits float through oblivion for a while. The Abyss of Oblivion is apparently a very scary place even for the saints, and so Shergoroth created Belrock and the seducer counterpart Pinnacle Rock to act as a beacon for his creations as souls to find their ways back to the realm. Order attempts to stop up the wellspring where the saints are reborn, temporarily incapacitating our allies by severing their links to this realm. But with a little persistence and a lot of arrows and spells, the threat is squashed and the day is saved once more. It would seem that Thaden played a hand in this, which is no surprise since Jigalag is not known for coming up with original plans on his own. Back at the palace, things have taken a uh, very unfortunate turn. Immediately we know something is off because Shergoroth isn't sitting in his throne and is without his cane. He's left standing off to the side looking like some lost pedestrian, looking around his throne room as long as he doesn't even recognize it anymore. This is something that I noticed with the expansion. Bethesda tried to use more animations outside of conversations to better detail the mental states of their NPCs. It's usually pretty silly and uncanny thanks to the terrible animations their 2006 engine restricted them to. But here with Shergoroth, the subtle change in his idling animations does nail the trick quite well, I gotta admit. I felt more in the 10 seconds walking up to the throne and sensing something was seriously off than I did during the entire main quest of the base game. That's just effective use of proper storytelling build-up and less is more presentation. I thought we had more time. I thought we had a chance. My plan has failed and we were so close! Optimism! Ha! Oh, 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 oh. How adorable! I love it! Even at the end, you make me laugh. <laughs> I'm lying. That wasn't funny at all. No matter. Soon you and everyone else will be dead. And I will be left a mad god. Ruler of a dead realm. Again. What happens is what always has happened. What always will happen. I crumble, I fade, the realm dies, and you with it. Flee while you can, mortal. 
When we next meet, I will not know you, and I will slay you like the others. I had intended to give you my staff, the symbol of my office, but life is gone from it as it goes from me. It is now dead wood, a useless twig. With the staff, there was hope, but now hope is dead. I am dead. The realm. <laughs> Sheyogorov is dead! All shall crumble before Sheyogorov! Man, I really do love this last conversation with Sheyogorov. It's a great send-off for the best character this game ever had. It really leaves me wondering if Shergorth is just an identity like the Grey Fox, or if Shergorth is a real person. Do different beings that earn the title of Mad God eventually transform into Shergorth? If so, do they have continuity and memory? Maybe that's the source of the madness, all those personalities of different people who became Shergorth. Because we aren't the first to become Shergorth, according to the lore. I wonder these things because, damn, I feel kinda bad if the last thing he will ever experience was the dread that he had failed to save his realm again. Fortunately, we still got our boy Haskell, and while things look grim, he still has a plan and sees this more as a temporary setback and not total defeat. He believes that while we can't become a Daedric Prince, we only merely need to sit on the Throne of Madness and wield the Staff to possess enough power to stop the Grey March. And while the Staff of Shergorath is dead like the Mad God himself, we can make a new one. The only problem is that this will require us to seek out the only source of knowledge left in the realm that would be able to provide that information to us. We need to go out and seek the Great Library of Jigalag, which had been sealed off by Sheogorath long ago. There's no telling what the Library of the Enemy might have in store for us, but it really is the only way. So it's off to Knife Point Hollow, which sits at the center of the realm, a short distance inside the ancient ruin. We use a key Haskell gave us to get through a locked door, only to find a man sitting in an empty chamber. It turns out there is no library. Shergorth had the library burned eons ago following the Grey March, considering the library to be an abomination. The library contained the great formula deduced by Jigalag, who is really the Daedric Prince of not only order, but also logic. That logic and that formula allowed him to predict any and all events carried out by all beings, mortal and immortal, for all of time, and that knowledge was recorded in his great library. So we can see why that would irk his chaotic counterpart, and why he would have it destroyed. But Sheogorath couldn't bring himself to destroy all that knowledge forever. So he had Dias, who was the immortal keeper of the library, who also lacks no real sense of individuality, locked away for all eternity instead. We are the first living thing he has seen in a very long time, though that doesn't seem to interest him one way or another. He knows why we've come, as this has already been deduced a long time ago. He knows how to make the staff, and he tells us exactly what we must collect so we can construct a staff. He expects us to fail, but once again, that doesn't really interest him one way or another. He does admit it would be interesting if we did succeed, because we'd be the first mortal ever to have our own dedicated Daedric artifact. So maybe that's why he ends up helping us. Though, he doesn't believe in free will, so I guess he doesn't really have a choice in this matter anyhow. Regardless, it's time to do some more dungeon diving. The dungeon crawls are beginning to wear a little thin. As interesting and unique as each dungeon is, at least in comparison to what we've normally seen in Oblivion, they are still just stints of combat meant to pad out the experience and pace out the story some, and this quest begins to show that a little bit too much. It's still much more enjoyable than any of the other dungeon experiences in Cyrodiil, but it does start to feel like it's being dragged out. Our first item to fetch is the Eye of a Zealot Leader Mage in some ruins. This involves fighting past her minions and slaying her, which, simple enough. The second item we need is the branch from one of the main trees in the grove deep in the heart of the Isles. The grove is said to show men who they really are, and only after we see the truth will it give us its branch. 
The truth just means fighting a shadow version of ourselves, which is an identical copy of ourselves but turned dark and shadowy. Of all the boss fights I've had to fight in this game, this was the most difficult, and uh, what an ego boost that turns out to be. It's great fun fighting something that has every tool and every power you possess, but too bad the limited AI still makes it a very uneven fight. With the items collected, it's back to Diaz to get our staff. He's quite surprised by our success and very casually mentions that there must be an error in his calculation. You know, the calculation that had successfully predicted every action and every outcome of every action for all of recorded history thus far. You know, no big deal. He gives us our unpowered staff and tells us to soak it in the font of madness back at the palace. So we return with our big stick looking to soak it in the fountain behind the throne, but when we get there we see it isn't working, and white shards of order are surrounding the fountain. Haskell admits we have a new problem on our hands. The forces of order must have found a way to taint the waters of madness themselves, which is fed by the great tree deep beneath the surface of the isles where the madness of the residents of the realm resides. This is the true source of madness for the realm, and if the forces of order manage to find a way to clog that up, then Jigalag has pretty much already won. He suspects Thaden once again, because this is just far too imaginative for the Daedric Prince himself. If that's the case, then the only solution is to head down into the Fountainhead and find the source of the taint and eliminate it. Ordinarily, it's a peaceful place down there where the tame gnarls tend to the roots of the great trees, but with order down there, who knows what might be going on. The gnarls themselves might be helping to spread that taint. So, it's time for our final dungeon dive, and unfortunately, it's the most uninspired of them all. We get to conjure up some friendly gnarls to open some doors for us, but other than that, there's little going on down here except fighting the same monsters we've been fighting since the beginning, and the occasional mini-boss fight between a few knights and a priest. Killing the priest slowly lets us cleanse the place of the taint as we move through the dungeon. The way too long dungeon crawl comes to an end with a boss fight with some priests and Thaden around a large obelisk in the Waters of Madness. Or at least, it's meant to be a boss fight, but High Sneak and High Marksman kinda ends the fight before they ever even had a chance to defend themselves. We head back up with some fat dungeon loot and finally get to soak our staff, gaining the power of Sheogorath. And not a moment too soon as one of our guard commanders comes running up alerting us to the latest development. Order is finally assaulting the palace, as obelisks around the palace grounds are beginning to activate and the forces of Jigalag are now spawning in. It's time for the final battle and to put a stop to the Grey March and break this cycle forever. It's here the power of the Staff of Sheogorath comes in super fucking handy as it allows us to freeze everyone, friend and foe alike, for 15 seconds in an area. This gives us all the time in the world to overload the obelisks with Hearts of Order to stop the knights from spawning. Eventually, Jigalag gets sick of our shit and comes down to the battle himself. And well, let's just say our shadow put up a bigger fight. With us breaking the cycle, the curse has finally been lifted, and with it we are now Sheo Gorath, and Jigalag is free to roam Oblivion in his true form once more. He ponders what we truly are now, thanking us regardless, and that's pretty much it. Back inside the palace, we see Haskell has already assembled our new court and welcomes us officially as Sheo Gorath, Prince of the Shivering Isles. We learn what all this means and what benefits and responsibility we now possess. And, well, this is the greatest failing of this questline. There just isn't much we get. 
We can go to the court and use some of the services there. We can ask one of the guards to accompany us as if combat in this game wasn't easy enough already. And that's pretty much it. We get to keep the staff and we can change the weather of the realm, which nets us different buffs, but really that's it. As for our responsibilities, it's just unending quests that presumably send us to go kill some monsters that can just as easily be ignored, not really making them obligations at all. This is absolutely one of those cases of it's the journey and not the destination, as the rewards for becoming what's basically the closest thing a mortal can get to becoming a god in this universe are really just underwhelming. That's another reason I like to make this one of the last things I do with any character. It seems fitting for any of my characters standing in the court just crowned as the god of madness. Rewards don't really matter if I'm done playing, and I get the feeling Bethesda understood that this was going to be the way a lot of players went through this expansion, especially since it came out way past the original game's launch. But this is all starting to sound like a conclusion, which calls for another chapter transition first. Ah, oh, that's better. There's something truly poetic about the player becoming the Lord of Madness. We seem to act like agents of madness already, so to have that officially recognized is pretty nice. By this point, we've basically been elevated to something close to an emperor as the champions of Cyrodiil. We've become the Grand Champion of the Arena, the Archmage of the Mages Guild, the Guildmaster of the Fighters Guild, the Great Fox, the Listener of the Dark Brotherhood, and the Favored Champion of every Daedric Prince. So why not ascend to Godhood? The Shivering Isles experience is very enjoyable from start to finish. It's perhaps the most consistent questline in the whole game. It starts to drag just a bit near the end, but by then the momentum of the story carries us to the end and it left me wanting more. No other quest chain had me wanting it to continue. They all either dragged out way too long, or ended at the perfect point for me to have my fill. The Shivering Isles all in all adds about another 20 hours of content, and very little feels like uninspired filler like a lot of the content of the base game. The dungeons all feel like there was a great deal more thought put into them, the quests usually have interesting and engaging characters, most activities yield appropriate rewards, exploring the Isles is just as enjoyable as Cyrodiil, it's a worthy expansion that improves upon almost every aspect of the base game. And that's not to say my time in Cyrodiil is bad, I still love the base game, but the Shivering Isles definitely upstages it in some regards. It's much narrower in scope, sure, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Really though, the areas of improvement that shine the most are in regards to setting and story. The Isles are a brilliant and imaginative location, much more so than most of Cyrodiil, filled with thought out NPCs and enemies that are full of charm and character. They use pre-established lore and a ton of new lore to explain the world and provide ample context. This lore sets us up with some of the biggest mysteries in a whole expansion that is about mystery and discovery. The story itself centralizes all of this to create an actually engaging story that has us actually interacting with the world, learning why it is the way it is and making us care about the fate of it. It gives us an actual stake in this realm and a meaningful role to play within it. Maybe ending up becoming something of a god is a bit over the top, but seeing as we can become the head of every single major faction in the base game, what difference does it really make? At least we knew this was coming early on in the story. Our journey through the story is just as much about us saving the realm as it is growing into the role of Sheogorath. No questline had us essentially training to assume the top leadership position. It was always just handed to us like some meaningless trinket, and it pretty much always felt like that was the case too following the completion of those questlines. In terms of gameplay design, the Shivering Isles didn't go about reinventing the systems, but instead just found new ways of recontextualizing those systems to create a more engaging experience. We got to fight alongside allies more frequently to make us feel like we were, in fact, in charge and wielding some legitimate power. Enemies were given more diverse means of offense and defense, necessitating more creative approaches towards combat. Dungeons frequently had different objectives or played with enemy placement and behaviors so that we were at least going through each dungeon slightly differently. They still used dungeons to make up for the ever-problematic question of how do we make something any player can enjoy, but they at least tried to make those dungeon experiences not so monotonous. All in all, this expansion was something that, while I didn't think Oblivion absolutely needed to correct all the faults of the base game, definitely benefits from having anyway. It's a wonderful and truly enjoyable experience and I just cannot recommend it enough. I really wish developers put this much effort into DLC these days, because of all the ones I've played over the years, nothing even comes close to what Bethesda did with this one.
It truly is something special, but before we go, I think it's appropriate to at least briefly mention some of the other DLCs they had made for this game, at least for the sake of brevity. So let's do one of those title changes again and very briefly cover some of that. There are 10 official plugins Bethesda made for Oblivion. Because this was back when DLC was still a very new concept, the range in scope and quality is just staggering. Most of these plugins are just player-owned houses, while some of them, like Horse Armor and Spell Tome, should have just been added in a patch or bundled in with one of the other DLCs. I'm going to ignore those though, because this isn't a video about touring the Houses of Oblivion. So that leaves four plugins that add quest content. The Shivering Isles, the Knights of the Nine, the Hunt for Magrin's Racer, and Repairing the Orrery. The Shivering Isles we covered, so let's knock out the remaining three and call it quits. To eliminate the low-hanging fruit first, the Orrery is the most bog-standard fetch and delivery quest imaginable. We learn of the quest the moment we step into the sewers after the Emperor is assassinated all the way in the beginning of the game. Then it's just a matter of making the Repairing the Orrery quest our active quest, following the quest markers to the remote bandit camps in the wilderness, killing the two bandits at each, looting the quest items off their bodies, and returning them to Bothiel at the Imperial City Arcane University. We give her a couple of days to do the repairs, and then we got a functioning orrery that lets us receive certain greater powers based on the celestial objects in the sky. That's entirely it. Mayrun's Razor adds a single dungeon in the Volus Mountains on the border of Morrowind and Cyrodiil. The story of the thing goes like this. Some crazy Dunmore warlord is building an army to try and invade Cyrodiil, and is also hunting for the dagger. The dungeon is quite unique and fun to explore, and the mercenaries inside are loaded up on some of the finest gear level scaling loot tables can provide. And honestly, that alone makes it worth doing the DLC. Forget the dagger at the end, look at all these fucking arrows I walked out with. Which did help make the Shivering Isles a little easier. Eventually we hit a vampire segment, then we kill the warlord and Mayrun Dagon's his champion, and somehow earn Dagon's favor despite being the only reason he got his ass kicked off of Tamriel. It's mercifully brief and simple though, so who really cares? Knights of the Nine though. Oh boy, Knights of the Nine. What can I really say about this expansion? because that's what Bethesda said it was, an expansion. I don't really know what it expanded, as all it really seemed to add was a couple of broken dungeons and a set of divine armor whose stats are anything but divine. And I say the dungeons are broken because the chests inside them aren't level scaled, at least in my game. So looting chests was pointless because I was using a level one loot table when I was almost level 30 by the time I was doing this. The enemies are scaled, but not the rewards, so have fun grinding through long, maze-like dungeons that we've seen a trillion times and getting no worthwhile rewards. Your best bet is running through them or sneaking through them. Forget fighting, it just doesn't enhance the experience any. Our quest starts in Anvil, where the chapel has been desecrated by some unknown forces. The prophet raving outside the chapel seems to think this is the work of Umarel the Unfettered and is very put off by us not knowing who that even is. He's almost unimpressed by our collection of titles when he asks us why we believe we are worthy to follow the path to seek the blessings of the Eight. Eventually, he capitulates after we tell him we are the listener of the Black Hand and shits out a whole long-winded story full of really uninspired theological buzzwords and vaguely familiar proper nouns. We are then sent on a pilgrimage to redeem ourselves of our sins, because at this point we got quite a few in needing of repenting. And then we will be allowed to rebuild the old wayward order of the religious knights. There's a whole drawn out segment that has us sparring with nine ghosts and listening to them whisper even more meaningless proper nouns before we get sent on some lame fetch quests. A couple of them involve us solving some mini game like puzzles in the middle of undead infested ruins because, you know, we just needed more of them. Each fetch quest is meant to embody the principles of the respective deity. Kinnereth has us respecting nature by not killing a bear in a grove. Stendar has us redeeming the descendant of a man who killed a beggar in the God of Mercy's chapel, and you get the picture. It's cool getting introduced to the gods in a more tangible way than anything else in the base game, especially since we got to know the Daedric Princes pretty well from their shrines. But even the best of these quests are only good because they are short and simple. Most of them are just shitty dungeon crawls to get a reward that isn't even worth equipping for most players. All of this is to assemble every Crusader relic so we can go and kill Umaril. Except I forgot to bring most of these items with us to Umaril's hideout, so we had to fight him the conventional way. And it was just a fucking cakewalk. 
Then we just use the Blessing of Talos, which is just a spell we can cast on ourselves, to then be teleported to the Sky Realm where Umaril's spirit needs to be killed to vanquish him forever. Once again, he falls even faster without any of the divine weapons or armor. So, uh, the entire quest chain involved fetching items we didn't even need. Awesome. In the end, we redeemed the corrupted Knights of the Nine, rebuilding it and restocking it with generic NPCs who just got their positions because they approached and asked to join, and we said yes because, well, why wouldn't we? They are surprised and delighted to see us alive because we were dead when they found us. One of them delivers a stirring speech, and I'll just let the events of this epilogue do the talking. Today we have witnessed undeniable proof of the strength and the might of the gods we serve. Slain in battle with the dread Umaro, by the grace and mercy of the Nine, the Crusader lives again. How can this be, you ask? What of our foe? What has become of Umaro the Unfeathered? Umaro has been slain by the Crusader. His very spirit cast into the void and destroyed for all eternity. He will never rise again. Let us give thanks to the, the nine. By their Knights power. The nine. And the nine. And the nine. And the nine. You die. Knights of the Nine is just everything wrong and bad in Oblivion bundled into a concentrated dose of boring, pointless tedium. It's really no wonder I had no desire whatsoever to return to it after I played it the first time back in the day. Just do yourself a favor and skip it unless the items are good for your build or something. And that's it. That's every DLC in Oblivion now covered. And with that, I think we've pretty much covered all of the game content worth discussing, really. It's hard to believe it, but this is pretty much the end of the road for Oblivion. I got just one last video in the hopper to wrap this absurdly long series up, so stick around for that. Do the things, or don't, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one where we will finally put Oblivion to bed. What makes a game fun? What attributes of a game lead to us enjoying it? What makes certain games stand out so much from the others we play that our memories of them endure years and decades after we first played them? What is it about them that brings us back? What exactly is nostalgia and why is it so often attributed with everything I just asked? These are questions I went into this video series wanting to explore, because they and many others are the ones I ask myself a lot when I'm playing Oblivion. I've played a decent number of games over the years, not as many as other people have in the same period of time, but a decent number nonetheless. But there's no mistaking it. Oblivion is really special to me. It holds a sacred place in my heart, a place where no other game has ever been able to find its way into. It's not the only game I think so fondly of, but I dare say that it is the most flawed of any of the other games that sit on my shelf of legendary greatness. If I'm honest with myself, I'd have to say it is my favorite game of all time. But then I just tore it apart and ragged on it for six hours. The only time I stopped complaining really was during a couple of quest chains in one of the expansions. How can I come out of this still saying, yeah, it's my favorite game, totally holds up still? It's because Oblivion is a game of contradictions. I kept repeating phrases like, this didn't mesh with the rest of the game, or this is counter to what we've come to expect, and just other worded differently phrases expressing the same idea. It's the idea that Oblivion just isn't a perfect creation. 
Just as how Oblivion's dungeons are screwed together like IKEA furniture, so too is the rest of the game. The thing to remember is that this was a massive game made by a very small, tight-knit team. When you have a project of such massive scope being worked on by such a small team, a large degree of autonomy must be entrusted to each person working on it. This means I doubt that there was a particularly thorough vetting process for what was going in and what was going to be left out, especially when it came to content as opposed to systems and mechanics. I doubt a whole lot got left out for the sake of quality or continuity. They needed as much as they could to fill in such a vast world, and I wouldn't be surprised if the leading philosophy was, eh, if the player doesn't like the quest, I can ignore it. I mean, I can't say with any degree of certainty that this truly was the case, but it seems like it's at least a possibility with what we see from the perspective of the final product. Now, why is any of this important? How is that relevant? Well, it just goes to explaining why there is such a range of quality in the content of the game. It explains why we got a guild like the Mage's Guild while also getting the Dark Brotherhood in the same game. It would then go on to explain how we get a game that sort of suffers from an identity crisis in many ways. So, if I'm going to understand what parts of Oblivion I like and why I like them, I gotta first identify just a few of these identities Oblivion tries to wear. Starting with the mechanics, we can see the contradictions of this game already beginning to show, albeit more subtly. The first interactive screen we see in the game is a page full of sliders and selection menus used to create just the appearance of our character. Further down the tutorial segment at the end of the sewers, we get pages upon pages of poorly detailed skills and attributes that, unless we are familiar with the game already, are almost worthless to be presented to us as a choice. As a new player, we'd have no way of really knowing what's good and what's not. This is what resulted in me choosing to play an Imperial with a terrible mix of speechcraft, mercantile, and lockpicking along with a smattering of magic and combat skills that ensured he would never be effective in combat my first go with this game. I still clocked over 100 hours on that character though. It's here we see the game presenting us with multitudes of options to tinker with our characters and skills, leading us to think that these choices are critical, seeing as they pop up several times during our first hour in the game, only for the game to then sort of ignore it all until it's time to level up, in which we just pick a few attributes to level up and we go back to doing fetch quests. I've made some terrible characters and they played pretty okay compared to some of my most intricate ones. I've made characters that were intended to just break the mechanics of the game, but then I've also accidentally done the same by just doing what came natural to me. Just by sheer ignorance of the totally opaque systems, I was able to break the game, and that could have ruined a lot of the experience, had I been a different sort of player. But we'll get back to that. Leveling mechanics and combat are some of Oblivion's weakest parts, but there's also some hint of greatness in there. I actually thoroughly enjoy its leveling and skill system, especially with how we get to create custom classes that really can have an impact on playstyle, if we the player have the discipline not to resort to broken cheese tactics. This is a game where we have a difficulty slider we can adjust on the fly at any time during gameplay, and that speaks volumes to how much this game requires us to commit to really anything. In the end, it's really up to the player to determine just how much or how little they want to challenge themselves here. That challenge can go all the way to the extreme by either cranking the slider and using our fists, or dropping the slider to the other end and using powerful enchanted swords while chugging stat buffing potions. So we head into the great unknown of Cyrodiil, fighting bandits on the roads and wandering into whatever dungeons catches our eye. There's a tantalizing feeling from this gameplay loop of exploration, what I consider the secret ingredient to Bethesda games. The world feels so open to any sorts of possibilities, even if that feeling is little more than an illusion. Because while exploring the open world with Jeremy Soule's mystical score playing in the background is the absolute height of ecstasy in this game, diving into one of the dungeons that dots the world will have us experience some of the worst parts of Oblivion. In the dungeons, we get subjected to terribly stiff and unengaging combat systems that even the most meticulous of metagaming and self-imposed challenges cannot redeem into something rewarding. It's merely there to fill the time spent wandering the world. Because Bethesda felt the need to create mechanics and systems to encourage exploration, oblivious to the fact that exploration in the game was what made it so good in the first place. They set about creating things like loot systems and gameplay feedback loops that felt more like cheap gimmicks and slot machines designed to artificially instill tangible value for an experience that otherwise has intrinsic value. 
that is, exploration is fun for the sake of exploration, and you don't need systems to encourage players to do it. This symbiotic fusion of the best part of Oblivion and the worst part of Oblivion is just so perfect of an exemplar of the game as a whole. A game that just doesn't understand itself. A game that won't ask players to commit to any style of play, because it itself cannot commit to a certain design. When you have so many hands in the designer pot, you're going to have a game with many design philosophies in competition with each other. This can end well, which is what I think happened in Oblivion's case, or it can simply be an utter disaster. Looking at the world of Oblivion, we see that contradictions do not end, but in many ways become even more obvious and numerous. We are presented a world full of unique races and locales and libraries of books detailing a rich universe of events. But then, when it comes time for any of that to be used, a lot of it just goes right out the window and it's substituted for throwaway NPCs, forgettable events, and showy, unimaginative set pieces. Rarely do we come across anyone or anything that introduces a player to the backstory and lore the game is supposed to be built upon. If I was to play the main story, by the end of it, I don't have a clear picture of what Cyrodiil really is. What are its politics? Uh, they got an emperor, oh wait, not anymore. They got an Elder Council, whom we never meet until they are getting replaced by the new Emperor. Oh wait, he's dead now too. Who are the people of Cyrodiil? We got human folk, elven folk, and beast folk. They all kinda seem the same though. Nords like snow, I know that much. Khajiit talk in the third person, that's pretty neat. Read the books and pay really close attention when doing side content and you might pick up on some of the lore, but good luck. So. We have a world that is wonderfully fascinating, on the wiki. In game, we get a washed out world that more often than not substitutes thought provoking dialogue and quests for bland utilitarian info dumps and showy set pieces. Those set pieces are interesting too because they not only contradict the fun of exploring the lore, they also contradict the presentation of the game in general. Oblivion's art style is very neutral. Colorful, but neutral nonetheless. Everything about its presentation, down to the soundtrack itself, is neutral. That's not a bad thing, or a good thing, it's just a fact. But what is also a fact is that the set pieces try to elicit in us emotions. They are designed to make us think and feel a certain way, and that just smacks right up against what most of the rest of the experience tries to do. This is one of my favorite contradictions because it's obviously spent a huge amount of time and resources trying to build those set pieces only for them to fall flat for players like me coming into this world to explore it on our own terms. Exploring on our own terms is something worth discussing too, because when we are free to wander the world we are guided by little more than level design cues and compass markers. The rest is up to us to decide and ponder over, but once we got quests? Well, then we get quest markers that hold our hands to the point of railroading us, few dialogue choices, and NPC dialogue that all but spells out exactly what needs to be done, as though the objective of going to a dungeon and killing all the enemies inside needs much explaining. We get some of the most freedom the game can possibly deliver, and then some of the most restrictive designs that turn this open world RPG, that might even set a toe into the simulation side of world design, into a straight jacketed low budget amusement park ride. It's funny and sad because Oblivion has got to be one of the most immersive games I've ever played. But like with every other aspect of this game, it's also one of the least immersive games I've ever played. When I'm left to wander the world once again, getting to pick my destination and allowing the ambience to wash over me, I'm transfixed in a way so few games even today manage to achieve. No map markers, no to-do lists cluttering my HUD, just the natural world, my character, and my agency to direct him. Weather changes, birds sing in the forest, insects chirp at night, monsters ambush, and NPCs go about their lives. It's great. But then we come across things that break that immersion quicker than duplicating watermelons breaks the game engine. Enemies ragdoll in weird ways as they fail to react my weapon swings. My character can moonwalk strafe when running at certain angles. NPCs start having repeating conversations. NPCs stand in their empty shops, surfacing no one, but somehow still remaining in business, and on and on I can go. A lot of this actually ends up emerging when we enter cities and try to interact with NPCs in general. A big culprit ends up being Radiant AI, a system that was explicitly designed to enhance player immersion. 
A system designed to make the player feel like they are just an independent part of an independent world reveals that NPCs are just window dressing for a player-centric experience. You can't find a more poetic contradiction than that. Moving into story and content, we will constantly find player centrism at war with a player agnostic world. Take the story for example. In the beginning, we are told by the Emperor himself that we are the chosen ones from his dream destined to stop the Oblivion invasion. He cannot stop talking about how everything we have experienced, are experiencing, and will experience has been preordained by the gods. But then we meet Martin and that sort of goes out the window. We, while still being an unstoppable will of destiny by foiling the antagonist's plans time and again, end up being sidelined for a more grounded story where we are only helping Martin achieve his destiny. We start to act as an agent in the world as opposed to the world acting as our playground, at least in terms of story. This ends up creating some serious dissonance between what we are experiencing and what we are being told by the story. We are meant to believe we are now just the hero meant to help save the world, but aside from a couple of instances where we are fighting alongside NPCs, everything that has happened in the story has been as a direct result of our actions exclusively. To have it change that story tone but not so much reflected in gameplay leads to not only story collapse but dissonance at the same time, resulting in a really unsatisfying conclusion. And then we move into some of the guilds where we are treated throughout the entire experience as some dumb lackey or intern who can only be trusted with tasks our superiors insist are beneath them. Slowly those stories progress to ratchet up the stakes and while we are still given the tasks of sorting out those messes, gameplay wise we are barely rewarded and the experience of solving these bigger issues feels almost identical to solving the trivial shit. Once again, creating dissonance that culminates with the conclusion of each guild where we are suddenly handed the keys to the highest office as some token reward for having stuck with the quest chain to the end. We don't grow into those positions, we are just given them like we are given the robes that represent said office. Leading to the immediate cheapening of the entire experience when the highest office and the lowest rank both net the player the same flat feeling. The better guilds avoid this trap by having us work towards those higher offices in some capacity. We earn our ways to those offices, as opposed to enduring our ways there. They still fall short of making those final positions feel meaningful in gameplay, but at least in terms of story, they give some sense of satisfaction. What is the point of all this? Are we meant to feel empowered? Are we meant to feel wiser? Are we meant to feel satisfied? Or are we meant to just feel nothing at all? If it's to feel empowered, then the lack of rewards in a lot of those experiences fails that. If it's meant to feel wiser, then the lack of lore and meaningful exposition fails that. If we are meant to feel satisfied, then, well, all of the above has failed that. The neutral option seems to be the only valid explanation, but then we are given ham-fisted stories with NPCs that sacrifice themselves for some reason or another, or we see a city get destroyed, or we are forced to kill innocent villagers while high on drugs. If we aren't meant to feel anything at all, or are meant to feel our own feelings, why do we have all these set pieces where the designers grab the camera and go, look and feel? It's because Bethesda probably didn't consider what sort of overall experience these pieces created. Even within the confines of those pieces, we see conflict and lack of commitment. What this ends up doing is allowing us to collect titles like we collect weapons and armor. We can wander the world as something close to an emperor and still get accosted by guards because we grabbed a bottle of ale. We could be the Grey Fox and the Listener of the Dark Brotherhood and still get ambushed by independent highwaymen and assassins on the roads of Cyrodiil. What's the purpose of these titles if they don't impact how the world reacts to us? Why is the game trying to tell us to live like an ordinary person, but then have us do extraordinary things, only to have NPCs downplay those extraordinary things until they have to recognize us as their superiors? Why are we led to think we are growing from just a humble prisoner to a literal demigod when the game is also trying to beat down our growing ego with goblins who can still tear us to pieces just as badly as they could in the beginning sewers? This all leads to the greatest contradiction of all in this game. Player empowerment versus player freedom. This is the real head scratcher. How the hell did this get so fucked? Quite simple really, level scaling. We level up, get more powerful, so does the rest of the world. At no point are we ever allowed to experience steamrolling enemies in this game, or even laughing off environmental roadblocks that had at one point tormented us. If we want that experience, we have to turn the difficulty slider down. This was all done to surface accessibility and player freedom. 
they didn't want to tell the players that they couldn't travel to that mountain in the distance and go into the cave over there. They wanted as much freedom as possible, but what ends up getting sacrificed is the satisfaction of the entire experience. They tried to save the experience by sacrificing the experience. This is the problem with not addressing key game design questions, and not following through with a clear vision. Why does a game about growing and progressing have no growth or progression? Why does a game about living an ordinary life have the player becoming the literal center of its world? Why does a game about immersion have so much that shatters that immersion? Why does a game with a story about the player being the destined savior have someone else becoming the savior? Why does a game that tries to be as neutral as possible try to dictate what we should be feeling during every story beat? Why does a game taking place in a lore-rich world rarely make use of that lore? Why does a game about exploration make exploring half of its content such a tedious and dull chore? Why do I love Oblivion so much when so much of it is broken and poorly designed? Because despite all those faults, it's still a fun game. Oblivion is a game that cannot hide its imperfections. Many of them are just plainly visible when looking at pictures. Then more show when things are moving, and more still emerge when the game is actually being played. It's not a game that wears those faults proudly. It can best be described as a garage band composed of a bunch of young music enthusiasts. It's a cobbled together amalgamation of all different ideas of all different people who have slightly different thoughts on what an RPG and an Elder Scrolls game is. Sometimes unions like that can make truly unique and wonderful things. It's almost always by accident and it's basically impossible for it to be a well-polished product, but this is what produces a diamond in the rough. And that's what Oblivion is, a gem embedded in quite a bit of rock. If a player is willing to do some digging, they are going to find a lot to love. An immersive exploration experience unlike much else, a character progression system that can still be fun and rewarding when it's not obtuse and being muted by aggressive level scaling, some good quests if the bad are avoided, and one hell of a fun sandbox to mess with. Thanks to the layered systems that make up Oblivion, you can find all sorts of weird and interesting interactions between them that never gets old experimenting with. This can lead to the game breaking at times, but that's what saving and reloading is for. The complexity of this game's sandbox is really quite something, even by today's standards. The spellmaking and enchanting systems alone can make for some very interesting times. Couple them with some unique day trick artifacts and you got how many afternoons were spent for me. People bring up bugs a lot and always seem to lump all of them together, but not all bugs are created equal. It's game dependent, but in games like Oblivion where even if the bugs were all gone, just the fundamental design philosophies would be enough to prevent me from ever being fully immersed in this world 100% all of the time. What difference does it make if I can stop mid-air by just blocking with my dagger? Is that really so game breaking that it would need to be patched out? I don't think so and because of that it just adds another layer to this already complex meshwork of mechanics and content. This is a game that has a difficulty slider that can be adjusted in the middle of a boss fight. Do you really need to patch out all the item duplication methods? I already need to possess some degree of discipline to keep my hands away from that slider, so it stands to reason I can keep myself from duplicating all the lockpicks, repair hammers, and soul gems if I want to. Maybe that's exactly what I do want to do, in which case, hey, the option is still there. It's great to play extremely well-polished games with a cohesive vision applied to every aspect of its design. And sometimes it's fun to just play something that can't help but wear its jankiness on its sleeve. What's charming about Oblivion is that it's clearly a work of passion. You can see so many examples of where the personality of each developer came through. When you start to see the seams, you start to see that this is something made by people, flaws and all. Sometimes that can create a personal connection between the player and the game. The game was a canvas for the designers to express themselves, and this game is a sandbox for me as a player to express myself. There's a certain understated beauty in that dual purpose. I'm not trying to make an argument for developers to release buggy unfinished games, and maybe this is a game that just couldn't be released in today's market. But the thing to remember is just how ambitious this game really was at the time. It was groundbreaking in so many ways, technology being a big one, even if that aspect has aged like milk. They were trying a lot of new things with this game though, and it certainly was unlike anything I had played up until that point back in 2006. And maybe that's one of the reasons I cut it some slack. I know I'm much less forgiving with Skyrim and the Fallout games because what we were left with was just as many bugs but substantially less innovation. Another component is of course nostalgia. 
there's no denying the good old rose tinted glasses aren't at work here. But I did sink another 70 hours into this game over the past few months and enjoyed almost all of it. Nostalgia isn't that powerful. Nostalgia is strong enough to get us to buy the game again and play for a few hours, but sooner or later the game must stand on its own merits and not the benefit of flawed human memory. I don't know if I'll ever fully understand my continued fascination with this game. Uh, believe me, I've tried. For years, I've tried to break this game down and figure it all out, and this series has been as meticulous of an attempt as I've ever attempted before, but it still seems like there is some aspect I'm overlooking. It's a combination of all these things I've mentioned, but something else too. Something emotional. Something that makes this weird, quirky game world feel so familiar and so comforting to me. Maybe that ends up being a part of myself and not really the game at all. Maybe that's just me looking for something in my life and it just happened to get attributed to this game years ago when I was young and naive. And maybe this game just reminds me who I once was and reminds me what I still enjoy today, as it certainly did play an instrumental part in laying the groundwork for many of my tastes in games today. It wound up spawning a dragon that I've been chasing for over a decade now and I haven't been able to find. It's unlikely I'll ever be able to find it too because so much of what made this game great appears to have just been a total accident. The developers clearly didn't have a coherent vision in Oblivion's design, it just happened to turn out the way it did thanks to the individual contributions of the people working on it and circumstantial chance. How is something like that replicated? It's not. So what's the takeaway from all this? I guess just accept that some games are the way they are. You either love them or you don't. You either get them or you don't. The developers either reached you or they didn't. It's hard to know when to appreciate something for what it is, and when to criticize it for what it could have been. We want to criticize and critique to know how to improve, but sometimes it's important to just sit back and appreciate what we've already got. Just take some time, go back to an old game, and try to relive and try to remember. If you enjoyed this series, please consider subscribing and sharing it with others who might get a kick out of it. I can't begin to calculate how many hours I really spent on this thing. It's just been months of on and off work. Some of it fun, some of it frustrating, and all of it rewarding. I got plans for the future, but another super long series isn't on the agenda just yet. If this project has taught me anything, brevity is a virtue, not a sin. So I hope you'll stick around and join me for whatever comes next. Thank you, and have a good one.